Hey guys, welcome to a very long video. So what you're about to see right now is a re-release of the course that I've made back in 2017 about making a top-down RPG game. That course is actually, um, it's three years old, but I believe that the content in it is kind of still relevant because back then I was using Tilemap and Tilemap was recently new, so that's the most uh, prominent thing that we're using. Um, the reason I'm re-uploading this is for the sole purpose that it's been, I think, four years now new to me and um, I don't have access to the account, unfortunately, so it's not really being maintained and um, there's better chances that people are going to be uh, replying to the comments here than on my non-existent Udemy account. And that's it. So if you have any questions, of course, post them in the comment section down below. As I mentioned, it's quite a long video, so try to put a timestamp as well for the questions. So at least if you ask something away um, and I have the timestamp, I can go back to that part of the video and, and remember a little bit what was going on back then. Uh, so you can either do that here in the comment section down below, which I would appreciate, or you could also go to the Discord and ask us question there, which is also something I would appreciate. So um, if you guys enjoy this, or it's a one-time off by the way, but if you guys enjoy this, please subscribe to the channel. It helps us quite a lot. And by us, I need me. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm rebuilding the channel, so I'm really, um, I'm really digging those numbers. Anything that you can give me is really appreciated. A like, a subscribe, and a share. Sharing would be good. All right, I think I'm done promoting myself. Um, enjoy the course. Cheers. Hello and welcome to the very first lesson in which we will download Unity 2017. If you already have the engine installed, make sure that you are at least on version 2017.2 or beyond. That is because we are going to be using Tilemap, a new feature in this latest version. So in order to download this, you will head over to unity3d.com and click on Get Unity. Now, if you want to make sure that you are on the same exact point as this course is, right now the latest version is 2017.2. If in the future you're on 2018, you can head over to this link over here, unity3d.com slash getunity download archive, and then you can choose manually um, the version we're going to be using for this course. However, I don't think there's going to be any problem using a version in the future. Alright, so once you are on the Unity store, they're going to ask you which kind of download. Now, we don't need anything else but the personal version. The personal version is going to allow you to release game on mobile to monetize from it. The only uh, little thing though is if you have revenue over 100,000 USD a year, then you're going to have to upgrade to say um, this plan over here, which is their best sellers, $35 per month. But in our case, since we're not making any money at the moment, we're going to try the Unity personal version. If you scroll down and you accept the terms, you'll be able to start downloading the installer. The installer is not Unity itself, it's really just a small file that is going to connect to the internet. I am going to run it right now and this will download the version you want to have. So I'm going to click on next, accept the terms. Now when you get here, this is where you choose what component you want to add on top of Unity. Of course, you're going to want to have the engine itself, so Unity 2017.2. Mono Develop and Unity Debugger is really, really useful in case you don't have one already. In my case, I do already have one. I'm using Visual Studio, but I'm going to install this anyway. Um, the documentation is, of course, something that you'll want to have. And then Standard Asset is something I don't really take. Those are assets that they give to you, free assets you can use in your game to get started really quickly and do some prototyping. Example project, I don't need that. And now the other component are component you can install anytime later, but since I know that in my daily life I do create game for Android, I'll be checking this, also iOS, and also uh, WebGL, because I build for those three platforms on a daily routine, so that's just something on my end, but in case you plan on making game for different platform, you're better off just installing them now. Once that's done, you're going to Click next few times and wait until the install is completed. Once this is completed, you're going to have Unity 2017.2 installed on your desktop computer. Quick note, the reason why we're using Unity 2017.2 is only so we can use the new tile map system, which is a really really fun to use system in which you can just paint the ground with your tiles and it creates a level. So it's something really really fun to do and it's going to save us a bunch of time. After about 5 or 10 minutes of download and install, you'll be able to launch Unity by clicking on the finish button. Okay, so now we have the engine installed. 
Every time you open up Unity, you're going to be seeing this screen over here. This is a list of all your projects on your hard drive, and if you're logged in, you're even going to have project in the cloud. But in your case, if it's your first time, you're not going to be seeing this. Now, what we're going to do is make sure we hit the new button over here and create a project. Now, we're going to have to give our project a name. I'll give it top dungeon name for top down and dungeon for whatever it is we're going to be doing. I'll make sure to put it on 2D as well. Now my location is going to be on the desktop and everything I'll be doing in this course is going to be put on my desktop for the length of this project. Let's go ahead and create the project and launch the engine. If it is your very first time using Unity, I really suggest that you take the same exact layout as I do so you know where I click and you know where everything is based on what you'll see on the screen. Now to do that, to achieve the same layout as I usually have, I'm going to go on the top right over here and click on the default button. And I like to use a tall layout. Something like this. I just pull all the window like this so I have as much scene space as I can. And here you have the hierarchy, inspector and project. I'm going to right click on project and make sure this is a one column layout. This is how I'll be working for the rest of this course. If, of course, you have a different layout and you've been using Unity in the past, use that, use your own layout. It is going to be way more efficient for you. But if you never actually used the engine before, go ahead and copy this exact layout. This is going to help you see where I click. This is of course going to help you follow the course at a faster pace. Okay, so now let's do a quick recap of what these screens do. Scene view is your scene view. So everything you do, everything you put in your level is going to be seen here. And uh, this is actually where you make your whole level. Now. The hierarchy is a replica of scene view, but this one is really just focused on data. So inside of your scene at the moment, there is only one camera and you can see that camera is here as well. If you decide to move it, you can see the value at the top here, but the position value, you can see it change. So these two are linked together, the scene view and the hierarchy. Now, whenever you select something, just like I've selected this camera right now, you're going to have some extra information on it in the inspector window. So when I select my camera, as you can see, we can tell that it has a transform, a camera, a flare layer, and also an audio listener. And this is all on a single object, which is the main camera. If we are to create a empty game object, you're going to see that it has nothing but a position in the world. And we can move it the same way we move the camera inside of the scene view. Now, to actually mess around with the transform a little bit, to mess around with the position, I am going to create a cube displayed right here in the scene view, and I'm going to press W. By pressing W, you're going to have the move gizmo, and you'll be able to move it the same exact way we have been moving it for a while. If you press on E, you'll be able to rotate it, either on a single axis, like this, by clicking on the lines, or on multiple axes by clicking in the empty here. You can then press R to play around with the scale. Those are really basic controls and we are going to be using them as we make our level later. Now the final one, the final window I'd like you to have a look is the project window. Now the project window is the exact same replica as the asset folder in your explorer. Let me actually get a little bit deeper on that. If you right click inside of the project window, you can see there is a button called Show in Explorer. Let's open that up. You can see that this is in my desktop and it is in the top dungeon, which is our project folder. Inside of it, there is a couple of things that you need to have Unity working. While the engine is running, you need to have the temp folder. There is also some project settings saving, you know, different things such as the project version, um, the input manager, all that kind of stuff that we need to have the game working, some library, of course, to work with the code, and finally, the asset folder. And this is the one that is going to be the most important to us. Let's open up the asset folder. As you can see, it is empty right now. I'm going to create a random file. So just a random text document. As you can see, a just a txt document, nothing in it. Let's head back into the engine. You're going to see that it is now in our project as well. Kind of useless at the moment, but I just wanted you to know that the asset folder is the same as the project window, as seen over here. 
So we're going to delete this thing and start creating a folder structure that we'll be using for the rest of the project. The first folder we'll be creating is one called Artwork. And inside of Artwork, I'll be creating a folder called Animations and another folder called Levels. That's it for Artwork. Let's go down and create another one for Prefabs another one for scenes and another one for scripts. Those are all the folder we'll be using during this course. Now like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to try and keep this as small as possible, as simple as possible so you guys can go back, uh, reread the files, figure out where they're connected and also reuse them in the future if you'd like to create more content for the games. Having that said, we're going to be ending this up by creating a new scene. That scene is going to be the main scene in which we're going to be doing a lot of testing at first and eventually turning that into some kind of hub. So what we're going to do is make sure you have a clean scene. At the moment, I only have a main camera. So this could be considered as a clean scene. Now, if you put more stuff in it, I encourage you to just hit Ctrl and N on the keyboard, which is going to create a new scene. Make sure you don't save this one. Start again from scratch. This is a fresh new scene. And now you can click Ctrl and S to save. I'll be calling this one main and I'll be drag and dropping it inside of the scene folder. What we've done here is we created a new scene and we saved that new scene. You could have also done that through the file menu by clicking on new scene and then save scene. Okay, so we have our UI set up. We're going to be messing around with the UI a little bit later on as well because we're going to need more window in the future, such as the console that we'll see eventually, which is here, and also the dial palette, and probably more that I don't really have in mind at the moment, but we'll be playing with the layout a little bit in the future. Make sure that you find one that you're comfortable with, and also make sure that your layout has at least the hierarchy, the inspector, the project, the scene view, and also the game view hidden somewhere. Alright, so that's it for this lesson. I'll catch you in the next one where we'll find a texture atlas so we can build our whole game around that texture atlas. See you there! Welcome back everybody! Before we start and dive right into the engine and just get everything started, starting to create code, starting to design levels, we're gonna need some kind of art. Now, I encourage you to go ahead and make your own art. But if you don't have any, if you don't know how to make art, if you don't um, have any knowledge in Photoshop or how to make sprites, I encourage you to go get this one right here. That's the one I will be using during this course. It is free and also royalty free, which means uh, you can download it for free. Of course, there is no cost. And then royalty free means you can use it inside of your commercial project if you wish. This is something um, I really appreciate is someone from itch.io and he uploaded his own um, the he called is 16 by 16 dungeon tile set. So this is what we'll be using, and um, in the end, this is what you see right here. It's only one texture. It is called a uh, texture atlas. So that's a 256 by 256 pixel picture, and in that you're going to crop what you need. So that's exactly what we'll be doing inside of the game engine in a little bit. Now, if you'd like to use the same exact tile set as I'll be using for this course, then go check out the resources tab in your lesson and you'll be seeing a link to this tile set. Make sure you download it, import it in your project. This is a simple PNG image. All right, so once you have the texture downloaded, I have it right here on my desktop, you're going to either drag and drop this right in your project or you're going to put it inside of the asset folder because you know that this project over here is the same exact thing as the asset folder. So I'll be opening up the top dungeon, that's my project folder, and I'll be heading into assets and I'll just drag and drop this in here. If we go back in the engine, you'll see that it just appeared. Okay, so once inside of here, let's actually rename that to Atlas. That's gonna be our texture Atlas. This is how we call these Atlas, because it contains more than just one object in here that we'll be using. So I'll be taking this and drag and dropping it into the artwork folder. Okay, now let's have a look at what happens if we double click on it. Since it recognizes it's a PNG image, it is going to open it up in your favorite photo viewer. So throughout this course, we're going to be using most of the left side over here to create level. So imagine we're going to be splitting those quests 
one by one and we'll be painting our levels using those. We're also going to be using the little red goo over here. Um, that's going to be some kind of healing fountain. The enemies are going to be at the bottom left. Your player sprites are going to be at the bottom over here. And also the weapons. We'll need the weapons. We'll also be using one of these boss here, one of the three boss, and also doing a sprite animation with these torches. And the chest. So basically we're going to be using a lot of that when we create our level. We won't be using all of it, so in the end if you want to make that texture even smaller, you'll be able to crop what you want and just put it in a smaller texture. But 256 by 256 is very very small in the first place, so this is a really good, really optimized texture. And that is going to conclude it for the very first section. This one was super simple. We just installed Unity. We set up our UI so it looks the way we want. We're basically ready to work. And that's exactly what we'll be doing in the second section, guys. So join me there. We'll be talking about moving an object around, moving a sprite around, and doing manual collision detection. See you there. Welcome to the second section of this course. By the end of this section, you're going to have a moving character that manually detects collision uh, with either the wall or the other enemies and also you're going to have a camera that follows them around. So let's get started right away by opening up the artwork folder. The first thing we'll need to have a character moving is to actually have the character on the scene somewhere. So this is our texture right here. We're going to click on it, make sure it is under sprite 2D and UI. Now I'm looking at this in the inspector. So this texture we import, the PNG image, make sure it is under Sprite 2D and UI and then hit apply if it wasn't already. Once it is completed, we are going to go under Sprite mode and make sure this is on multiple. The only reason we are doing this is because this specific atlas right here, this specific image has multiple sprites on it. So we need it to be on multiple. If you cropped out your player, if you have a different texture and your player is cropped out into a single image, don't worry about putting it on multiple, you just need to have it in your project somewhere. In our case, our player is somewhere at the bottom here, so we still don't know which one we're going to be using, but this is a multiple spreadsheet. So go ahead and hit apply once more, and we're going to then click on the sprite editor. This is going to open up this nice window, and in that window, we're going to manually crop out our player. So I'm going to pan around using the middle mouse button and then zoom in again using the middle mouse and I'm going to choose which player I like the most in that. So we could start with that little boy over here, that little disturbed boy and I'm going to make sure that I zoom in very very close and I click and hold to drag around. So as you can see it's going to create that green that green square and make sure you wrap the whole player around it including the little outline over here. So once you have your first drag make sure you resize it properly. In this case I have something that is 15 by 16 and that would be our player right here. If you'd like to have something that is a little bit more clean and um, have a standardized size for every single sprites we're going to have I really suggest you put that on 16 by 16 by extending this thing by one pixel. So when you look at the bottom over here, you're going to see the width is 16 pixel and the height is 16. Now you could of course have something else that is 256 by 256 if you have um, more definition in your sprite. But in this case, all the characters, all the little players you see here can be fit in a 16 by 16. Maybe at the exception of this one, um, the knights, they're a little bit bigger. But if we want to use all the same size of the player, we can go here. And as you can tell, they all fit in a 16 by 16. Okay, so I'm going to go back, make sure that this one is the one that I selected. And I'm going to go down here. Really important you go down here and you rename this sprite. This is going to be player underscore zero. Once we have more sprites for the player, I'll call this one player underscore one, player underscore two, and so on. Actually, let's do that right now. So we're going to, once this one is completed, one, once this one is clean, so 16 by 16, we're going to do another drag just by clicking anywhere else, and I'm going to select this little guy as well. This one is 16 by 15, so I'm missing one in height, so let's get that. 
and here we go. That would be player 0 and that would be player 1. So I'm going to make sure I rename this one as well. Okay, so at the moment we have our two player sprites. They are not registered just yet. We have to click apply at the very top. And that will conclude all we need to do today with the sprite editor. If you close that up, you're going to see that your atlas now has this little arrow. If you click on it, you'll see player 0 and player 1. You can also have a preview of those sprites by clicking on this at the very bottom of the inspector. As you can tell, you see this is our 16 by 16 pixel, player 1 and player 0. Okay, so last episode, what we've done is we created some player sprites using the Atlas. They are right here, that's player 0 and player 1. I am going to go ahead and drag and drop player 0 anywhere in the scene. As you can tell, it's fairly, fairly small and you can just drop it wherever you want. But if you want it to be centered, what you can do is just drag it inside of the IR key. Remember that the IR key is just a text and data representation of what's inside of the scene. So as you can tell here, we have our sprite, it is a little bit small. So while the atlas is selected, we are going to go up here in the inspector and change the filter mode to point, so no filter. And you'll end up with something like this. All right, so we fixed one problem. Now, another problem is the fact that this is very, very small. To show you exactly how this looks in the game, I am going to pull this game window and just make sure I anchor it on the left like this. So I just click and hold and I put it here. You can also give yourself a proper size. Now what I like to do before I start developing any game is to choose for which type of resolution am I going to be building this. In this case we're making a standalone game. Now for standalone games modern game would go for something like 16 per 9 so 1920 by 1080 that is way too big for us since we're using pixel art that is only 16 by 16. If we put that on a very very large screen in HD this is not going to look good. So what we'll do instead is we'll make a game that feels like the old one so something more retro. I will go under the game section over here and instead of having the free aspect like we have right now, free aspects mean as long as you resize the window it is going to match, we are going to choose our very own aspect. So here I have 800 by 600 which is a really common resolution for old games. In case you don't have it there, you can click on the plus sign and manually add it by typing in 800 by 600. Alright, so now we have a fixed resolution. It looks somewhat like this, but it is still way too small. What we need to fix next is the camera. We're going to click on the camera and then open up the camera component and then we have to make sure that our projection is orthographic. This should be set by default if you decided to create a 2D project. If you made a 3D project it should be on perspective and it is going to be um, not really good for us. This is not going to be something we want. We don't want to have any perspective in our game since we are 2D, since we are flat. So let's put that back on orthographic. And then I'll put the size on 1. Having a size of 1 is going to make it so every 100 pixels you have is going to be equal to a meter. So technically if you'd like to stack those player one on top of the other, you can duplicate this by clicking on Control c Control v and then changing the y axis to 0 0.16 and it is going to stack perfectly on top of the other one. Alright, so we pretty much fixed what we had to do. The next step is going to be to start coding the movement of this player. Okay, so in this lesson we are going to start coding. And if you've never coded before, I made sure that the class is really really small in terms of scripting. But in case you've never coded before, make sure you actually follow, copy every line one by one and leave some comments next to it. I will be explaining what every single line does. What you'll have to pick up if you've never coded before is just how to read the code and in which order. Which we'll go over really quickly once we start coding. Okay, so let's click on our play over here and let's add a component. Now this is where you would choose what kind of component you want to add. Unity has a bunch such as the Box Collider 2D which we'll need in the future but we'll want to create our own. 
So I'll type in player and there is a couple over here. I don't want any of those. Player is going to be my own custom script. So let's go under new script, press enter once more. We're going to be coding in C sharp, of course. And then you should see that a new script has appeared. It is right here in your project folder and it is also on top of the player. If for some odd reason it is not on top of your player, make sure you drag and drop this right here. And if you have two of those, you don't want that to happen either. So right click on one and remove component. All right, so if we're ready, we're going to double click on player either here or down there. This is going to open up your default script editor. If you've never coded before and you just started using Unity, this is going to be model developed for you. In my case, I'm using Visual Studio 2017. And either one you're using is going to look something like that with maybe different color in the background um, and you know just different interface. But what we're really looking for is the code. So I've mentioned earlier that I'm going to show you how to read the code and in which order to read it. So if you've never seen a script before, you might have a little bit more ease doing so once we're done with that explanation. But I also don't want to bore the more advanced user. So what I'll do is I'll create the script, I'll make the player move, and then at the end of this lesson, I'm going to go over how to read the code. So if you already know how to do that, you can skip then. Until then, we are going to be creating that script. So for this player to have manual collision detection, we're going to need some more information from the outside. And that outside is going to be the box collider. So we're going to need a box collider. I'll start by declaring a private box collider 2D that I'll just call box collider. Now notice that this one is private, so I can't drag and drop it in the inspector. I have to manually get it in my code and I'll do that in a private void stop. So inside of the start statement, I'll say box collider is going to be equal to get component box collider 2D. Which means if we are going to have this statement run, we're going to need a box collider 2D on our player, like 100% sure. If we don't have that, our script is eventually going to crash because we'll be using the box collider. What we can do is head at the top here and do a require component type of box collider 2d this is something that could work for you i really don't like it so much i'd rather have the error um, because this what happens when you put this is that you're going to manually create one on your player as you can tell right now it hasn't compiled just yet let me just delete that drag and drop here as you can see it put a box collider 2d manually there but i also like to resize my thing uh, most of the time so i don't really like having the require statement I'll go ahead and I'll remove it. And if we do end up forgetting to put our box letter 2D, well, we'll have a no reference on that and we'll know exactly what's wrong. That being said, if you do not have a box letter 2D on your object just yet, now is the perfect time to get one by clicking on add component, box letter 2D, and make sure it is the size you want it to be. So in our case, we might want to click on the edit collider and just make this a little bit smaller on this end really depends you could also go for something even smaller than that say the error is not going to count in the collision so something like this could also work and let's get rid of the video as well so this hitbox is really going to be for the player to move around and also when he receives hits all right so once that is completed i'm going to lay down a private void I would do an update, but since we're using physics and we're using the manual collision detection, we're going to have to do fix update. And this is going to update every time. Actually, fix update is going to follow the same frame um, as the physics. So this is really important. We are on fix update in this very specific case. If you're looking for inputs, I usually don't like doing fix update because sometimes it might skip one. It's really, really rare, but sometimes it might skip some inputs. But in that case, we really don't have a choice since we're using uh, manual collision detection. We'll also have our own formula that use physics. Okay. All right. So what I like to do in a movement update loop like this is to make sure I have one vector that is going to keep track of the delta movement every single frame. So I'll go at the top here. I'll declare a private vector three, and that's going to be a move delta. Move delta means 
in between this frame that I'm rendering right now and the next one, what is going to be the difference in between my position and where I'm going to be? So by the end of this frame, we're going to be adding our player's position, our player's current position, with the move delta and we'll end up where we want to be. This sounds a little bit weird like that, this sounds maybe a little bit complicated, but we're going to make sure it is not so much. At the very beginning of our movement loop, I'm going to make sure I reset the move delta. This is in case, well actually, this is so um, on the new frame, so the frame after the one I just explained, we are going to just go back to zero. We might not have any input anymore. So we can say move delta is equal to vector dot zero. So we start off fresh at the beginning. Then we're going to look for the inputs on the keyboard and add them up to the move delta. To do this, I'll declare a float x. That's going to be my delta in x. And we'll get that from input get raw axis or get axis raw with horizontal. So make sure this is a string. We call that horizontal. Get axis raw is going to return you minus one or one or zero. So it's going to return you minus one if you're holding A or the left arrow key. It's going to return you zero if you're not holding any keys and it's going to return you one if you're holding D or the right arrow keys. The reason I know which key I need to press to receive those results is because they are set in the input manager and we can find it under file or sorry edit project settings and input. If you go in the inspector now, check the axis out and if you click on it, you're going to see that the negative button is left. So that stands for the left arrow key and the alternate negative button is A. Positive is right and alt positive is D. So you have your WASD set up in horizontal and vertical and you also have the arrow key set up as well. So we're using horizontal and vertical for those reasons. Now let's do the exact same thing with Y. So we're looking at get axis raw. This time we're going to be using vertical. And we now have our input left and right. Again, I'm going very slowly this time just so we can actually give some help and give some uh, room for the new people that are trying to understand. But let's do a small debug.log. I'm telling you this is not going to be as slow in the future. But just to make sure we can understand what's going on here, let's do a debug.log with x and just be needed, we'll do a debug.log with y. Back in the game, if we go under window, we pull out the console. I'm going to anchor the console down here since we have plenty of space now that we have a 800 by 600. You're going to see that every frame we have 0, 0 in this case. And if we hold A, you're going to be seeing minus 1. If we hold D, you're going to be seeing 1. If we hold A and W, you're going to be seeing minus 1 and 1. So as you can tell, the inputs we get are really based on our keys. And I'm just changing those by pressing on either the arrow keys or the WASD. All right, so enough easy stuff. We're going to wrap this up. Make sure we put that in a single little vector here. So we're going to move this at the top here. And when we reset the move delta, what I'll do is I'll just put those uh, directly in here. So I'll do a new vector three, X, Y, and then zero. This way we create a new vector three. We also reset it at the same time. So when we say reset the move delta, that is also true because we use those value here that we were going to put instead of the move delta anyway. Now we just collapse a little bit of code. Next thing we're going to do is swap the sprite direction, whether we're going right or left. So let's actually do that right here in comment. Swap sprite direction, whether you're going right or left. To do this, it's going to be fairly simple. So we'll take the input. If move delta dot x is bigger than zero, if it is bigger than zero, let's make sure that the transform dot local scale is going to be equal to. We could do a new vector three, one one one, which is the current scale it is on right now, or we could also do to save some memory vector three dot one, because this one is static and it is already declared. Else, actually, we have to do a else if really important here. So else if move delta dot x is smaller than zero, we'll do a transform 
local scale. And then we can do here a new vector three minus one zero zero so we're only changing the scale from one to minus one uh, depending if we're going left or right now the reason i did a else if statement here and not just a else is if we are on zero because here this is only if we're above zero and that's only if we're below zero if we are on zero it means we're not moving on x and we don't want to be flipping to a default um, orientation so let's see what's going on in here when I'm pressing on D, the player stays the same. If I press on A, you're going to see that E disappear. So why is that exactly? Let's actually find out. We're going to click on player and we know we're modifying the local scale. So let's have a look at these number here at the top. This is when we were pressing right. So that's vector 3.1 because it's 1, 1, 1. And where we're going left, we do get the minus one right, but then there is zero in Y and zero in Z which means we just don't see this anymore. As you can tell, if we just scale this up, you're going to start seeing the player. So what we did in the code is we pretty much just shrink our player to a really, really small state where we, can, we can't see him anymore. All right, so let's go back in the code and correct that mistake. Here we go. Small test again, really quick. That's right, that's left, right, left, and so on. So we've got the position right. Now we have to make this thing move. So let's go down and say, make this thing move. Very simple. We can do a transform dot translate and then translate using the move delta. And we're going to make sure we do a times time the delta time. This is really useful because if your game is running on a really low end device, it's gonna be running super slow. And if you're running this on a very fast device, say that's run that's running that at like 120 FPS, then your player is going to be going faster on the faster device and slower on the slower device, which is unfair for the two person playing the game. So if we do a time dot delta time, we make sure to make that equal on both devices. Okay, let's give this a try. Now our player moves left, right, up and down, as you can tell. We're going to be adding a lot more in the next episode as we do the collision detection, but at the moment, that is all we need to make our player move. And I will now go on and explain how exactly the code is read. So this is going to facilitate the new user. But in case you already know everything that's going on, I do encourage you to step on to the next lesson. All right, so let's talk about code flow a little bit. We won't be able to show you everything you need to know here because Unity hides a lot of it. So a lot of what's going on in the background, a lot of how the code is supposed to run normally is actually hidden behind Unity which makes it really simple to pick up at the same time, but you're not going to understand everything you need uh, if you've never done code before, especially if you've never done C-sharp before. Now, let me explain to you um, two things. Here, everything you see over here, this is a function, and everything you see over here, this is a function. These two are different from the variable you're declaring at the top here, or I like to call them fields. Now, these, in this very specific case, are a special function. What I mean by special is that we really didn't have to do anything to have those run. So at the beginning of your game, this was run. And then every single frame, this was run. So every single frame, it was checking for input. It was assigning the move delta. It was swapping the sprite. And it was making the player move. This was happening every single frame. And we never told anybody to do that. This is what Unity does in the background. If you actually match the function, with the exact same name as what they gave you, the callback they call it, this is going to happen automatically. There is a couple um, that you can call at the beginning, like start. This is only ran once. There is also awake. You can tell that those are special because they turn blue when I finish completing it. So if I do awake like this, if I just make a mistake, this is going to be valid. It's still going to be in the code. I won't have any error, but this won't run at the beginning. Awake is a special call from Unity, and this is something we have to respect. Now, if you type in start like this, this is also not going to work because the one that Unity has has a capital S at the beginning. As you can tell, it now turned blue. Now, why is this important? This is important because later on, we're going to be creating our own function, something like private void on collect coin. So once we collect a coin, we do something. 
but those one we're going to have to call them manually. So say if we want to run on collect coin at the beginning of your code, you could go ahead and just put it down here. Now start is going to make sure to call it once it's done with all it needs to do. I'm going to go ahead and remove these and have a look. So code is read simply from up to down. Once you enter a function, you're going to have a look at the first line, then the second line, then the third line. If we went ahead and we did something like this, you're going to have an error. As you can tell, we have those little red underline that says cannot use local variable x before it is declared. And that is because at this point in the code, when it's running the fix update loop, it says move delta is equal to x, y, and 0. But x does not exist yet. x only exists on the other line of code, this line. And at this point, it's already too late. So you have to make sure that if you're using something, it has to be declared first or has a value. Which is also why we reset the move delta every single frame. It is because we're using it down here. One quick thing before we go ahead and we close this very, very gentle introduction to the code flow is we're going to have a look at the top here for the variables. So variables are, are actually declared this way. So you start with the accessibility of your variable, whether it is a private or public protected. There is a couple. Um, we like private the most because it cannot exit the class player. So right now, nothing nothing outside of player could access move delta or box collider. So this is just the accessibility. Then you go ahead and you declare the type. And the type is a bunch of things. So a type could be um, a lot of different things. At the beginning, when you start coding, you learn about int, you learn about float, you learn about strings. Now, a little bit later on, you learn that everything you create, every single class you create, also becomes a type. So I can say private player, and as you can see, it turns on with the right color. It just gives me the right to declare a variable of my own type. And that is pretty much it. I can't tell you much about that because we're going to get into really complicated explanation, which is why if you have a background in code, this is going to help. And if you don't, just tag along. You're going to pick up some skill as you copy and paste, just like I did in the first place. Alright guys, in the next episode, we're going to be having a look at collision detection. Cheers. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we're going to be going over collision detection and we'll also start creating our walls and also another NPC we'll put in there. Just so we can test our collision against other objects and other um, NPCs or enemies. So we're going to start off by actually creating those walls and also that NPC. For that NPC, we can simply use the other player, drag and drop him in here. Make sure he does not have the player script and we're just going to move him, say, right about there. Make sure we also have a box collider 2 d So this is really something that we need. This one needs to have a collision as well. And here we go. So we have player 1 that has collision. I'm going to rename this to test NPC. This way we don't confuse this with the real player. And then we'll need some walls. In terms of walls, what I was thinking is we can go back inside of the atlas and start cropping just two pieces of wall. Let's go in the sprite editor and let's take whichever one we want. Um, I am thinking about this black block over here. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure I just take this from the top and make sure this is 16 by 16, which it is right now. So I'll call this one wall zero. Hit apply. And let's go ahead and grab another one. Maybe this one. This is basically the color of the floor. So I'll grab this one as well. This one's going to be floor zero. So we have the floor, which is this color, and then the wall that's going to be black. Again, I'll hit apply and let's head back. Okay. All right. So later on during the course, we're going to be dealing with tile map and the new tile editor for Unity 2017.2. That's going to be quite cool. But until then, we're going to have to place them manually. So I'm going to stack these on top of each other perfectly, just like it would be in the uh, tile editor. And I'm also going to make sure that these two walls, at the same time, they have a box collider 2D on it. Now I will go ahead and take the floor, drag and drop it right in here, and I'll just place it somewhere close. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I'll also make sure to stack this one 0.16 above. I'll copy it. 
once and just put it here on the left. And once more like this. As you can tell, we're totally overshadowing our our previous NPC. So now what we need to do is we need to start creating some sorting order and also some collision layers. So let's start by looking at the sorting order of the sprites. I'm going to click on player and have a look at the sprite renderer component. This is what is actually rendering the image you see. As you can tell, this is our sprite. Now on this, you're going to see that there is a sorting layer and this is what we have to play with. So click on it add a sorting player and I'll call this one if we click on the little plus sign we can call this one um, humans or creature or whatever you want so let's go and call this actor later on we'll have more such as items and weapon and uh, hitbox object but right now all we need is humans or actor sorry so under a sorting layer for the player I'll be putting that on actor make sure we do the same exact thing for the test NPC and as you can tell it is now going to pop on top of this. I'll be leaving the wall and the floor on default layer. So that's perfect for what it does right now. Remember that we do have colliders on those walls but we don't have collider on the floor. We don't need any collider on the floor. We'll just be able to run freely on there. Now what we have to do next is we have to split the collision layers and that is really important for a few reasons. Um, the first one being you don't want your player to run into other NPCs or actors and you don't want your player to run into walls but it could technically run on top of a switch which also has a collider and it could technically run on top of say healing fountain that also has a little trigger area where you get healed. So you have to choose what you actually get blocked from and will be blocked from what we call blocking objects and also NPCs or actors. So we're going to go ahead and create those two layers right now. To create a layer, I'll go on the very top right here, click on add layer, and that layer is going to be blocking. And for the user layer 9, we'll also add something called actor. Once you do have those layers, they are not applied automatically. So you have to go back on the walls and make sure you select both walls, put that on blocking and then go on the NPC and on the player at the same time and put that on actor. This is something we won't have to do for every single wall in the future. We'll have everything covered under the tile map, of course. All right, so now that the game is properly set up, we have both players and the TS NPC on the actor layer and the walls on the blocking layer. We're going to go ahead and open up the player script once more and do a lot of modification in here. Our current problem right now is of course that the player goes through anything it wants including the blocking layer. So we're going to go back in our code and inside of the code we're going to declare a field at the top called the raycast hit 2D. I will just call it hit. This one's going to be used for us because we're going to be casting our player's collider box where it should be in the future and we'll check are we allowed to go there and if we're not we're simply not going to move. So let's sneak in between these two calls right here and go right right in the middle and we'll say hit is going to be equal to a physics 2D box cast and we're going to be doing a box cast in our current position so transform the position with the box collider dot size and the angle is zero since we never really rotate our player and then we'll do a direction on here so the direction is where we're supposed to go in the future now we're only going to be doing it one axis at the time in case we need to only move one axis at the time. So we'll do new vector 2, 0, and let's do move delta dot y first. So up and down first. And now the other thing right here is distance. To get the exact same distance as we would in the translate, we have to do the time dot delta time as well. So let's do um, matf dot absolute. We're going to start by casting this. Since this is a distance, you don't want to go in a negative direction. Uh, we're going to do move delta dot y times time dot delta time. This is going to give you the distance. And finally, um, this is either result, but in our case, we're going to be using layer mask instead to know which layers are we testing this against. And we said we're going to be testing this against actor and also blocking. So we have to do something that's going to regroup both of these layer masks together. We can do layer mask, get mask, and now this takes in a param, so you can 
you can put as many layers as you want in here. They are denoted as string. So the first one is going to be actor and the second one is going to be blocking. Wrap this up and we finally have our very, very long um, function called for the box guess. Now, if our box guess did hit something, that means that we can't go there. This is impossible. We hit something that's either on the actor or on the blocking layer and we don't want to overlap. So if hit dot collider is equal equal to null, that means we can actually move. Since we haven't hit anything, collider is null, we did not have any result on our box cast, that means we are allowed to move. And now we're going to take this, bump it up here, but as you can tell, we've only tested against the y axis, so we have to change this a little bit. Instead of doing transform.translate with this, we're going to do transform.translate, and it takes in this right here. So instead of passing him a full vector 3 like we do right now, we can pass him 3 floats instead. So let's go ahead and do that. First one's going to be 0. We're not moving on the x axis simply because we only tested the y axis. y is going to be move delta dot y times time dot delta time. And finally, z is also going to be 0. Great, so we have what we need right here. Let's make sure we add a little bit of comments at the top here. Make sure we can move in this direction by casting a box there first. If the box returns null, we are free to move. This is for the y axis. Let's duplicate this, copy and paste, and do the exact same thing for the x axis. So, same as before, but instead of doing a new vector 0 and move delta y, we're going to be doing move delta x and then 0. Change that for an x. And if we do end up moving, then of course, move delta dot x, 0 for y, and we should now be good to go. So let's have a look at what this gives us during the game. Now you're going to see that the player doesn't really move, it doesn't do anything we want it to do, so it completely stopped moving, which means that every time it tries to cast, doing a box cast, it always hits something, even if we're going in the right direction. There's nothing on my right. Why does it still collide with something? Well, the reason is quite simple. It collides with himself, because himself is on the actor layer as well, and this is needed because the other enemies, we don't want them to go through the player. So if we put our player on something else, such as default, you're going to see that now he moves. So the only reason that he wasn't able to move in the first place is because he hit something on the actor layer, as you can see right here. Now, of course, we don't want that. We want to make sure the enemies actually collide with the player. So what we have to do is turn off the game and head under the edit project settings and change something inside of the physics 2D. So under the physics 2D, there's going to be a bunch of things you can mess around with. You can mess around with the gravity, you can mess around with a lot of different things. But what we're really looking into right here is this. Queries start in Collider. So we want to turn that off to make sure that our player ignores himself. As you can tell right now, our player is right here. He's on the actor layer, so he's on the one we need him to be. And if we press on play, He's now able to walk, so he totally forgot about himself. He's not no longer colliding with himself. But if we go and check this NPC out, as you can tell, it's blocking. And I'm still holding A, so I'm still going left, but I'm not blocked from moving if I decide to go up. And as you could also tell, the wall is blocking me as well. So if we do go ahead and just for testing purpose, we create a box collider on this floor, this floor is currently on the default layer. If we go on it, we actually walk right through. So this is perfect. This is exactly what we needed. And this is why we use different layers. All right, guys. So this will conclude today's lesson. I hope you enjoyed. We did some manual collision detection. And we'll have to work on it a little bit more later on when we create weapons and the combat system. Other than that, I will see you in the next lesson where we'll tackle a really, really simple camera. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another lecture. In this one, we'll be having a look at creating a camera that's going to follow our player around. 
but we'll make sure to give it a little bit of twist, a little bit of interesting factor. What we'll do is we'll draw a square in our screen, just like this, and if the player escapes that square, then we're going to move the camera. So this is not just a normal camera that you could attach to your player and just leave it there. It's going to be a little bit more interesting and also a little bit more customizable. So let's go and create a new script on our camera. We're going to click on it, head over to Inspector, and create a camera motor. I like to call it camera motor because this is what will be driving the uh, camera movement. And since we're here, let's also take these two new scripts we've created in the past episodes and put it inside of the script folder. Now we're going to open this one up and double click on it. In our script this time, we're going to need a couple of things. The first one is going to be a public field, so a public transform that I call look at. This is basically just going to be the player. We could also use this value later on to put focus on some other object in the scene that is not necessarily the player. But in our case today, we're going to be using look at as if it was the player. Quit! <clears throat> We are then going to create two public float, one called bound x and one called bound y. Now these are the square I was talking about. How far away can the player go in x before the camera starts swallowing him? I'm going to go with a very small value such as 0.15. Now let's do bound y and this one is going to be even smaller because if we move on the y axis it should be a little bit um, faster to snap. Alright, so now we have our value. It is time to write our algorithm in the update loop. So let's go ahead and say private void update. Now, update is not going to cut it. Just like we had to do a fix update for everything physics based in our player, we have to do a late update for everything that is camera wise. The reason is really, really simple. Late update is being called after update and also after fix update. Now, if we actually move our player in the fixed update, if he's not standing still, he's going to move, then we have to make sure that we move the camera after he's done that move. Because if we do it the other way, we're going to experience a very, very small desync that is going to be quite annoying to the user's eye. As logic is concerned, just think about it like it's a normal update. Okay, so we're going to start by declaring a vector tree that I'll call desired, actually I call it delta. Just like the player, this is going to be the difference in between this frame and the next frame. So we're going to start by initializing it to vector3.0. We will first start by checking if we're out of the bound on the x-axis by having a float delta x and this one is going to be the look at vector dot position dot x minus the transform dot position dot x. Now when I use transform.position.x, you have to think that this is the center of the camera, so the middle point where our camera is. This is the focused area right now. And what we do is we get the distance in between that focus area and the player. If this is bigger than bounds x, it means we're outside of the bounds. So we're going to go ahead and have a look right here by doing an if statement. If delta x is bigger than bound x, it will mean that we're outside of the bound towards the right, but this can also happen on the left side. So we're going to do a OR statement and say delta x is smaller than minus bound x. This will mean of course that the player is on the left side and it's outside of the bound. Now in here I do a OR statement but then I have to check whether it's left or right so I can add the proper value. And we do that by doing if transform.position.x is smaller than look at position.x so we check which one is on the left and which one is on the right. Here we check is the center, the focus area, the middle of the camera, is that smaller than the look at? Is it smaller than the player? If the focus of the camera on the x-axis is smaller than the look at position.x, player's position in x, it means that the player is on the right and the focus of the camera is on the left. So we're going to add on top of the delta position. So delta dot x is going to equal delta x minus bound x, just like this. Else, it means we're on the other side, so delta x is going to be equal to delta x plus bounds. Now this is to check if we're inside the bounds on the x-axis. 
we're going to duplicate this, copy all of that, paste it, and we'll do the exact same, of course, for the Y axis. So I'll just be swapping those X for Ys, including the bounds. I'll use capital letters here. And just change every X you see for a Y. There we go, let's have a double check. That seems good to me. We can collapse that and collapse this. And finally, we have to move our camera. So we'll do a transform dot position is plus equal. So we're adding on top of our current position. And let's just add delta dot x and delta dot y. And of course, zero for the z axis. We don't want to be moving on the z axis ever. And you always want to be at something like minus 10. We are at right now. Because if you're too close, even though this is orthographic, if you're too close, you're going to hit the near clip plane and you won't even see your thing anymore. As you can tell right now, I'm playing with my Z value. So by default, we are on minus 10 and we're going to keep it that way. Okay, so now we have our main camera that has the camera motor on it and it has every value filled out except the look at. Now I said this is a transform, so we want to be taking the player transform by simply click and hold and dragging it in the look at field. This way you'll see the player zero pop up. Now let's actually start the game and see how this looks. We have our player, we go up and down. There's no room in the X axis, oh, sorry, on the Y axis, but you can tell that there is some room on the X. So we have some playing space right here. And if we get too far away, the camera starts following us. But if we just play in the middle like this, it, it is not going to bother us. And I just realized I've done a typo right here on the last, very last line. This is delta dot y and not delta y. Now back to my game. We now have that little room, very very small amount of room in between the x axis and the y axis. You can also modify those manually right here in the inspector as the game is running. And that is because our fields are public. So what if we try something like 0.3 in x and 0.15 in y? So we have enough space in Y, I believe. As far as X, this is also fine to me. So I'll be rolling with these new values, 0 0.3 and 0 0.15. When you stop the game, however, those are going to be reset at what they were before the game started. So I'll have to re-input them manually when the game is not running. All right, so that should conclude it for the very second section of this course. In the next one, we'll create an actual level, and from there, we'll be creating objects, we'll be creating some enemies, we'll be creating a combat system. I hope you tag along, because the next one is using the new tile map editor, and it is going to be quite fun. So guys, I will be catching you there. Hey guys, welcome to the tile map section. In this section, we're going to be creating different rooms for the game. The first thing we'll be doing is we'll get rid of all these nasty floor and also walls that we've been putting there just for testing purpose. Now we are going to create them using the awesome new tool Unity has for us. It's called Tile Map. Now to do this, we are going to need some tiles. So we're going to go under the artwork folder, click on the atlas again, and we're going to start sketching out some more tiles we can use. So right now we have the wall zero and the floor zero. We're going to need some more. Of course, you can use all of them if you want but I will be going over a very specific one that we will be using for the gameplay. Like this one over here. This is going to be a healing fountain that we can use in the game. Now what is really amazing with this atlas right here is that everything is really 16 by 16. So everything is made out of blocks that are 16 by 16. Like this over here. The healing fountain is something we'll be using, but as you can tell, it sounds a little bit weird we take all that empty space, but this is something that uh, is required so we can have um, this piece right here, then that piece right there, and another piece that also has some floor on it. This is going to be really useful when everything needs to be placed next to each other. And we'll give this a try. So the first one right here is this block. I basically cropped a 16 by 16 starting at the very top here, and like I said, it looks like it doesn't make any sense right here because we take so much empty space but everything is going to be made out of 16 by 16 blocks, so this is actually required. Let's go ahead and go down here, say, Ealing Fountain, 
and this is going to be underscore zero because there's going to be multiple part to it. So let's go just be it. Make sure we do the exact same thing. So take a 16 by 16 block again, just like this. And this is going to be the ailing fountain underscore one. And finally, one more time. 16 by 16. So ailing fountain two. So here we go. We have this right here. So let's see what else we could have. I'm thinking about cropping this at the top here, all of this part, actually including this, oh, sorry, including this, and have this as a whole object. But like I said, everything has to be cropped in 16 by 16. So I'll go ahead, go to the very, very top here, and start slicing those one by one, always making sure I have 16 by 16 down here. So I will be calling this wall underscore one because we already have wall underscore zero, which is this black here. And we're going to keep on going like this. I invite you to crop as much as you want. Of course, the more you have, the more you can make your level look good. In my case, I'm thinking about grabbing this, then grabbing some floor, different color for the floor, like the one you've saw down there, and maybe the crates. And after that, I think we will be good to go and then after that, we'll also grab those right here just to create some kind of animation, see how that works and how we can change sprite over time. But now, for the moment, I will go back to slicing these, making sure I always have a 16 by 16. So I will keep on cutting this and I will be right back in a moment. All right, so at this point I have all of these, they're all 16 by 16 and they are all named properly. So I'll go ahead and get the exact same, do the exact same thing I've done, but this time for these floor right here. Make sure of course you don't move the ealing fountain at all. So this is going to be floor one. And I also just realized that my naming convention is not constant and that's not something you want to have. So as you can tell here, Everything starts with a small letter, but for the Ealing Fountain, I think I took some caps. So let's go back and change that. Ealing Fountain written this way. And this was one, and this was two. All right, so we're going to feel better about ourselves later on for that. So I'm going to go ahead and start cropping all the floors. Okay, so now we have the floor as well. We have this floor clutter here. What I'll be doing is I'll head over here at the top and also get those stairs, but I don't really feel like having two extra space at the top here. But as you can tell, they are above the line. So I think we'll be cheating just a little bit and um, grab one less pixel in this down there. Let's actually see if it works. So I'm going to create my first stair and that's my second one. This one is 16 by 16. We get all the color we need and that's how we're going to be cheating this one a little bit. So let's call it stairs zero. This is stairs one. And let's get the other side. As you can tell, this is really something you can play around. You don't have to follow all the rules. You don't have to follow the rules that the creator put. You can just do whatever you want at this point. You crop exactly what you need. It's starting to look good. We could go ahead and crop some more. I'm thinking about the pillars down here and also the pillar up here. They're a little bit different. One of them has a wall and the other one doesn't. So I'll go ahead and grab those and the crates as well. So I will be back once that is completed. All right, so now we have the pillars and also the crate. The final thing that I will actually do right here in this uh, cropping session is I'll grab those torches one by one this way we can actually use them and animate them later on. So I think those are also 16 per 16. So let's just make sure we do a 16 per 16 square and try to match it perfectly where it would fit um, everywhere. And as you can tell, this is not really, you know, this is not fitting in the 16 by 16. We'd have to actually move one block like this and have two of those sprites every time we have one torch, which it's not really fun at this point, so what we'll do instead is we'll create our own size for it. So I'll go, say, right here in the middle, 
grab the highest point, and that is something like 15 or 12 by 21. So we'll be using this size instead for every single one of these. Let's go ahead and put that one at the beginning. I'll call this one torch. Zero. Like I said, we're making our own rules at this point, but everything has to be 8 by 21 in this case, so that's 8 by 22. Let's change it. Torch 1, and so on. So you get the whole idea behind this. We're just remaking the rules behind this very specific torch. Alright, so we have a pretty nice sprite sheet with a lot of nice sprites on it. We make sure to cut everything so it works. So everything is 16 per 16, which means we'll be able to use it pretty much anywhere in the tile map, for the exception of these little torch here. In case we feel like we do want to have them in the tile map, which we totally, I mean, we don't have to do that. Like if we don't want to do that, we can also just put them on top, which is something I think we'll be doing in the end. Um, since those ones are going to be special and animated. But if we actually want to use them in tile map, we'd have to revert to using something that is more... Um, well, that is 16 by 16. As you can tell, you have the square space to do it, so you can actually use this. Go up to 16, so that one is 16 by 16, and just drag it down here as well. It's really hard to see because it's really, really light, but you have the space to do it. This guy that made the texture is, you know, pretty good at making sure everything was blocked in 16 per 16. Now after all that hard work, make sure you hit apply, we're going to be taking this inside of the game engine. And you'll be seeing all of that spawn inside of the atlas, so something quite big guys. So in the next lesson we're going to open up the tile map, we're going to set up a tile map in our scene and start designing our very first map. So at this point, we should pretty much have a lot of little sprites we can use in our tile map. So a lot of little tiles that are all 16 per 16, at the exception of those torch. We'll do something else with that in the future. So we're going to go ahead and open up the tile map by going under Window, Tile Palette. So this is where we'll do most of our work. Now we also need to make sure that um, we have a tile map in our scene right now. But before that, let's take our tile palette and anchor it somewhere. I'll go and anchor it down here where the console is. Okay, now let's head over to the arrow key, right click, and create a new 2D object, tile map. This is going to create you a grid, and on the grid there's going to be the grid component, and beneath that there's going to be a tile map with the tile map and the tile map renderer. We are going to rename that tile map for something like Let's go and call this one floor. And that is going to be our tile map that contains all the floor. So fairly simple stuff. We're going to go ahead and create a new sorting layer for it as well. The sorting layer are actually shared with the sprites as well. So as you can see, if we click here, you're going to see we have actor, the sorting layer we've made in the past for all the player object or the NPCs object. Let's add a new sorting layer. We'll call this one floor, and we're going to make sure that this one is above actor. So it is being rendered first, so when an actor is on top of it, this one is rendered last, which means it's going to be on top. So the highest one is going to be the one beneath everything. The lowest one is going to be the one rendered last, so the one on top of everything. With this new sorting layer, we're going to click on our tile map, so the floor tile map, make sure we apply it here and we can then start adding stuff in our tile map but right now we don't have any palette so we have to go down here in the tile palette click on create a new one and that's going to be something i'll call dungeon we're only going to have one palette for this game but i've seen games in the past such as warcraft 3 they give you editor you could swap in between palettes where like a winter scene a desert scene a forest scene that could be quite cool, but in our case, we only have a dungeon uh, kind of settings. So we're going to click dungeon, make sure we hit create, and it is going to ask us where to save it. I'm going to go under artwork and level. Select the folder, and you'll now see under artwork level, you'll see dungeon, which is right now a prefab. In this next step, we're going to import what we've made in the past, and we're going to put it in here. 
Now all they ask you to do is to drag a tile, a sprite or a sprite texture here. So if we go under Atlas, we have all our sprite beneath Atlas. So let's assume that we want to import our four crates. I'm going to click on the first one, hold shift and just drag and drop this in here and you'll see it gives some space for it and we're going to drop that there. Now it asks you for your place to save. Of course, we're going to go under artwork, level and I will be creating a new folder in here called tiles. I'm going to select this folder and you'll see that it creates tiles on its own right here. So we can find our four crates and they can also have different color. They can have different collider type. So this is something really you can customize just a little bit. Right, so let's have a look at what happened down here in our tile palette. It gave us our four tiles, but in a weird order. So we're going to have to place them again. So what I'll be doing is I click on the little edit button, click on say this tool right here, the select tool. Now with the tile selected, I can now go on this tool, the move selection tool or M and move it around just like this. This one for selection is S. So if we try to work quickly, we can press on S, select M, move by drag and dropping. So S select, move, and here we go. We just replicated what was in our atlas and this way it can look good if we import all of these together. We're going to be doing the same exact thing with the rest of the tiles. So I'll head under atlas, I'll take all the floors and I will drag and drop them right here. Making sure of course I save under tiles. As you can tell, there is going to be some work that need to be done and also for some reason, since this is a very very early version of 2017.2, uh, you can tell that my atlas just got messed up. So hopefully in the version you're in right now, that doesn't happen. Uh, if it does, you might want to import everything first before you do, you do any changes. So I'll actually do that right now. Put everything else I need, such as the ealing fountain the pillars and we're also going to be using the stairs. I'm currently holding control to select what I need and finally the walls as well. So this right here is going to be our tile palette and there's going to be some ordering to be done of course but I'm going to go ahead and save this one for now making sure it doesn't crash by hitting control and S. I went ahead and I closed the engine just to give Tom up a try, see if my changes were saved after I just reordered a little bit of it and uh, it turns out that they weren't saved when I booted back up so um, this is something I hope you have less problem than me on this but just bear with it if you are having the same trouble I'll be going through making the whole level manually using one tile at a time and when we need to do some special changes I think we're just going to do them by hand. But hopefully by the time you're watching this, there is no bug in this and it actually save the state of your palette. Until then, uh, just bear with me. <laughs> We're going to have to deal with that. So I'm actually going to end this episode right here. In the next one, we're going to lay down the whole main scene. But the first scene, the main scene is only going to be used just for moving around, maybe interacting with an NPC and really basic stuff. Also having healing fountain. So some kind of safe place for the player to be. So guys, I will be catching you in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson guys. Today we are going to be creating the main level using the tile map editor. If you have a look down here in my tile palette, you're going to see that it's a little bit different from the previous lesson. That's only because I had to redo it. I wanted to make sure I split every items in different section to make sure I have access to them because they were all clutter and it wasn't really useful. Since at the moment I'm not able to save my tile map, or sorry, my tile palette properly, this is going to be the way I work on this project. One big problem you're going to notice is when we try and click on something down here, say the pillar, we try to put it in the scene, you're going to see we only have four spaces at the moment and that's because our grid spacing is not done properly. So we're going to click on grid and make sure we change the cell size to 0 0.16 and that is because 100 pixel is equal to 1 in this case, so if we want 16 pixel, divide that so you get this amount. Right, as you can tell right now, if we drag our cursor around, this makes a lot more sense and we can start 
spawning infinite pillars just like this. Okay, the floor layer is really going to be used only for the background and also um, showing us where we can actually walk. So when we go ahead and add additional layers such as the asset layer or a, a wall layer, collision layer, you're going to have better ideas where to put it because we're going to have the floor layer. So we're going to start by actually making sure the camera is on. As you can see, we have the main camera. Make sure the camera is expanded so you can have a nice view of where it actually hands in your screen. Now remember that that camera moves, so you're going to have to give yourself a little bit more room on the outside. So uh, this way you don't see some blue pixel. That is the color the camera is rendering in the background when it needs to clear. All right, so we have this selected. We have the black square selected right here. And then you're going to click on this tool up here, or you can press U on the keyboard, and you'll be able to drag and drop big areas like this. So what I'll do is I'll just say take five in diagonal here. So one, two, three, four, five. Drag and do the exact same thing on this end. So one, two, three, four, five. And then I release the drag. And that's going to be the background, the black background behind everything. Now to show where I'll be walking around, I'll just take this color right here. That's part of the floor. That is the floor underscore zero asset. And we're going to just give ourselves some room for the player to experiment when he first joins the game. So maybe, oh, let's use the other tool, maybe that much room. So he can just walk around and, you know, feel the controls a little bit. And then when he needs to leave and actually go, like, in the venture or something uh, for combat and more, we can give him this kind of pathway to go up. And up here is going to be some kind of portal he can join. So that's going to be really the layout I'll be using. And if we just play this real quick, let's have a look if we can actually see beyond this. So I don't think we can see beyond this unless you actually go through the wall in this case. But just to be sure, we're going to give ourselves one more square of space. And here we definitely can see at the top. Bottom seems fine. So bottom is fine. But for the other one, we need to put some more squares. Now we have the old. Uh, not the old, but we have the, the light color right here, and we want to have the dark color to fill those in. What we can do is hold Alt on the keyboard. Actually, it is going to be holding Control. So you're going to hold Control on the keyboard and click on the darker one. This is going to be a color picker, and you'll see you can now use this one. So I'll be adding two square on the left and two square on the right. And maybe something like four square at the top, so maybe even five. It really doesn't matter how much you put, just make sure you can't see beyond that point. If you stay, of course, on your floor layer. Which, in this case, everything works fine. Now, the second layer we're going to put is going to be some kind of accessories layer. Um, it is not going to be where we do the collision, but it's going to be where we put some walls in graphic. And, you know, we're just going to have a good time doing that. So let's make sure we right-click on grid and add a new tile. So under to the object, add a tile map. This one is of course gonna be the wall, or we can call this um, accessories or design, because this is gonna be just graphics really. So this is gonna be some kind of asset. Um, there's gonna be the healing fountain, there's gonna be the walls, but it's not gonna be the collision layer. You'll know what I'm talking about in a moment. Okay, so we're gonna make sure that this one is above by actually putting it on the floor layer Let's put both on floor layer actually. And this floor layer is on order and layer zero. This design layer should be on the one. So one above that. Okay, next step, we are going to start designing this. So fairly simple stuff. I think I'll be using some of these wall and I'll just put them right about there. And as you can tell, if we do that, we override the last one. So we're currently not on the good layer. We wanna be on the design layer. Right now we're on the floor. To change this, what you have to do is go in the tile palette and click on the active tile map. Put that on design. And now, as you can tell, it's going to keep the background right there. So I'm going to go ahead and um, just do a little bit of design. I'll put that here. It's really subtle, but they have one pixel, say, on the left here that's closing on the left. And they also have others that have the closing on the right, like this one. Very, very subtle. This one has no closing, so that's the one you put in the middle. And you just keep on going like this. So same thing for these. 
I think you can actually stack them. So if you want to have two, two floors of that, you can do that. In my case, I'll just be keeping it simple with a single floor. And if you want to work faster, what you can do is, of course, use that control key. So in case you want to do another layer up here, we can do that. Something like this is going to work wonders. Right, so um, let's keep going in that direction. I'll be removing this one in the middle. Now, if you want to remove, you're going to have to hold shift and drag where you want it to be removed. So just like that, I removed those two. I'm going to replace them by stairs. So I'm going to go ahead and start laying that down, um, say right about here. And we now have stairs that go there. I'd also like to have healing fountain next to the door, just in case the player wants to exit really quickly and heal himself. So I'll put some right here. Let's make sure we put the head as well. And now he's going to have some healing fountain. We also have the pillars we can play around, so maybe put one here. I'm going to replace what I had. And maybe even do something like this. Of course, it's all a matter of experimenting and finding what looks good for you. I'm going to keep on going by putting some floor design right here, just changing the aspect of the floor. That floor by itself is kind of boring. So we're going to go and make it quite big. Make sure we have different shapes in it. So I'll go like this. And then take the top part, duplicate it a few times. And just keep going in that direction until we have something that looks good. So I went on and I added an additional floor right here um, at the top and I've also added a lot of these little walls just to give the player the impression that he's high somewhere on top of a castle or something. And um, I'd like also to put some crates just to put some additional stuff. Why not? We have crates. Why not put some? And here we go. So we have a couple of things now. Now I'm also going to go back on the floor layer just for a little bit and just give it an additional touch right here. So. You have the feeling that you have to go back up there. Um, let's give this a try in the game, see how it looks. So you can go left, you can go right. When you go up, this is what you see. So that's going to be it, I guess, for the um, those two layers. We can add more details, of course, later on. We just wanted to have a basic level completed. Now, the really important part is the next one. We have to create the collision layer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click, create a new layer, just like we've been doing a new tile map. This one's going to be collision. And I'm just going to make sure it's on top of everything right now. So I'll put that on floor, put that on say 5. And we're going to go ahead and draw the collision. So changing the active tile map to collision, taking whatever color you want, like that black color, and we're going to be putting that where we don't want the player to go. So here is fine. He can go uh, behind the crates, but on top of the crate, I don't want him to do that. Uh, we don't, of course, want him to go right here. That's illegal. That's also illegal. Make sure, now I know this is the bad color, black is also a very bad color for what we're doing since it's also the same color as the background. Um, so we're going to have to do that and remember where it is. Maybe if we can focus on the tile map. Oh yeah, right here, that's good. So change the tile map down here, put that on focus on tile map and you're going to draw it all around where the player is not allowed to go. So really see that as if it's black, the player is not allowed to walk on it. So I'm going to put this right here. He'll be able to walk down there, that's fine. And on top of this fountain, we don't want him to be walking directly on the wall, but he can walk in the little pool down there. That's going to heal him in the future. Also, lock this up here, up here, and something like this. So that's going to be the collision mesh for this game. Actually, for this scene. And, um... What I feel like doing is just turning off the tile map renderer so you don't see it, but it's still there. And to give it a collision, you're going to change the layer at the top. Remember, we made a layer for this. It's called blocking. So you're going to change that to blocking and also add the tile map collider 2D, which is going to give you this in the end. And you can just turn off the tile map renderer and you'll see that it's still there. And if you play the game, even though you don't see it, you're not allowed to collide with that.
anywhere you go, you're not allowed to collide with that. As you can tell, we can go behind the crates, we just can't go on top of it. So that's something um, pretty cool, but we'll have to fix the rendering order so that one is on top. Okay, so the rest seems pretty fair. Maybe we want to lock it here, we don't want him to go down there. And then at the top here is going to be our portal to go to the rooms or to the dungeons. Alright, so that will conclude our lesson today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. In the next one, we'll be creating a dungeon. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we will be creating a new dungeon that will be added next to our main scene. So you'll be able to go from the main scene to that dungeon uh, later on in the course. But let's go ahead and get started. I've just created myself a new scene. So I went up here, click on New Scene or Control N. I'm going to save this under the name Dungeon 1. You are free to do as much dungeon as you want. Okay, now you probably notice I have ordered my palette over here on the bottom left. And I am now ready to start editing this thing. So I gotta make sure that my main camera is on size 1 for the orthographic. And then I will right click. Create a new 2D object, tile map, go on my grid, and make sure the cell size is 0 0.16. And we now have the same exact setup as we had inside of the main scene. Now what I will be doing is renaming this one for floor. And I'll be creating a very, a very simple dungeon. It's going to be something quite small. I'll start by just grabbing all of this. Go here, paste that somewhere where the user is going to spawn at the very beginning. I'll maybe give it one more row and then we'll just extend that towards this side and then maybe go off like this, create another big square, oh my bad, and then maybe go up. I'm just randomly making this pattern right now, um, I'm not quite sure exactly how yours is going to turn out of course. I recommend that you use all your creativity to make some awesome level. But I'm just trying to go fast. Like I said, it's a very, very small dungeon. Um, but, you know, it is going to have all we need for this thing. The boss room is going to be quite big. And squarish. And here we go. So, I've got pretty much all I need. Now, I'm going to start decorating this thing. Maybe by uh, changing the floor a little bit, so I'll make sure to take the floor. Maybe add a little bit of pattern, just like I've done where the player starts. Could add one here. I could technically add one in the bus room as well. And these are kind of dialable, so you could go ahead and just like go on like this and keep on making this and changing until you cover a bigger area just like I am doing right now. So it's really up to you, you have some tiles you can work with, which is quite cool, and uh, which is also why we love this little tile set. And here we go. Okay. Right, so this is going to be the boss room. Now what I'm going to do is create another layer. I'll just duplicate floor for now. Actually, I won't duplicate floor, if I duplicate floor, I'm going to get this uh, as a copy, we don't want that, so I'll right click, create a new 2D object, a new tile map. The purpose of this tile map is for me to actually keep on working on the floor, keep on making the floor, adding walls next to it, adding some uh, visual visual stuff around the, the floor, but um, there are some places where it overlaps, so let me put that on active tile map, other, and then I will go ahead and just use these at the top here, and I am going to put them right on top. Something like this. Now, like I mentioned, I want to be able to overlap, like over here. This is overlapping the floor. If we were on the floor layer, this would actually disappear. Something like this. So we don't want that. This is why we created a new layer. Now also, uh, let's make sure our other is higher in priority. So I'll put order in layer 1. And let's keep on creating this. We can We can copy... A, uh, a tile that is already in place by holding control and the rest is just your usual tile map stuff so I'm gonna go ahead quickly fill this in I don't want to be taking too much time because this is not you know this is not your creative thing um, we're here to code we're here to learn how to make the game 
don't want to spend too much time making the level but just know that level design is a whole other thing it's a whole other art that you'll have to master if you want to make some very very good game unfortunately this is not a course about it I wish it was but it's a lot longer uh, to explain and a lot of more feeling based stuff which I don't have so much as a programmer at the moment okay final one we are then going to be able to start spawning the wall around this oops mistake here we could go ahead and start spawning these beneath but you know what I will be doing that last I'll start by just adding as much stuff as I can and I'll reserve that long and annoying part um, for the very end all right now over here we could also be putting a front end I was thinking about putting it here but that's not really making any sense with the amount of tile we have so let's go ahead and expand that to one more on this side and also one more on this side here all right I'll go back on the other just fix this little mess good thing we have the control key and the shift key to remove and I'll also go back on the floor and do something of the sort over here okay now we should have everything we need um, to lay down a fountain so I'll be doing that over here oh I'm still on the floor let's go back let's do that on the other now we can go let's put that on the floor that's fine and I might need another wall and here we go so we have a fountain this is where the, the player is actually gonna go heal himself before he go fights the boss so I'm going to go ahead and just fill in the rest of this thing going to fill in um, the rest with these wall over here and I'll just make sure to put a bunch of them pretty much everywhere okay so I'm pretty much done adding all of these wall as you can see here uh, one thing here is that I cannot keep on adding walls at places like here simply because it's going to go over this layer so um, the best way to fix this would be to actually create a new UI tile map and just sneak that in in between so I'll go here tile map and I'll just call that floor dash other I'll put that order one and I'll make sure other is on two and it's gonna be something I just put in between as you can see it should take me oh I'm not on the uh, done the right tile map here on the active tile map I'll go on floor other and if you can see here I will sneak this in right in between now um, I'm not sure if this actually looks good I don't think it looks good so I'll be getting rid of this here and that one there and I'll just replace this other thing here by a little bit of shadow and here we go so that's gonna be first level now in terms of what's gonna be inside of it like the um, the gameplay prefab we're gonna put inside of it so the chests, the enemies we're gonna be doing that in the future right now we have something we can just play around with and uh, you know that's that's all <laughs> so I hope you understood a little bit of how to use this tile map the feature is still a little bit bugged if you're using this in 2017.2 you might run into some bugs I'm not going to lie I had a, a bit of a problem uh, making this tile palette stays the way it is right now actually I was not able to do it just yet since the progress uh, was being reset every time which is quite annoying but if you do uh, run this a little bit later, hopefully the bug is fixed. But until then, we are going to do what we can with what we have. But there is one thing left. We're going to right click on grid to the object and make sure we have a collision layer. Let's put that layer on blocking. Make sure we have a tile collider 2D and let's draw right on top of it. So I'm gonna take the black square and um, start drawing make sure your active tile map is on collision and you're gonna go ahead and just start drawing the collision over here you can see it pops as green or you can just put the order in layer to say something like five something that is above everything so you can see and I'll just go around and do this should be fairly fairly easy to do we only have a small level thus far 
and make sure you don't forget the pillars over here so I'll go ahead and do a little dot for those pillars if you do a mistake hold shift there you go and that would be our collision for this whole level fairly simple once you're completed go ahead and turn off the tile map renderer but the collision are still going to be there all right now that should be complete for the section 3 I do encourage you to make your own level make a bigger level this one is quite simple and it's gonna be only used to uh, test out the mechanic will implement in the game but of course I don't create so much content on the scores you are encouraged to do that on your end though okay so that concludes the section 3 I will see you in section 4 Welcome back everybody, we are in section number 4, and in this section we are going to create some collidable objects, something you can interact with as the main player. So we are going to start very very simply by creating a, uh, a script called Collidable, and Collidable is going to be a script that we will be putting on every single object that you can collide with, whether it is something that's going to be destructible, or even a NPC you talk to, or a chest that you loot, all of that's going to be under a single script and that is what we'll be doing right now actually. We are going to turn our test NPC into a collidable object. So let's go ahead, right click on script and create a new C sharp script. I'll call this one collidable. We are then going to open it up in your favorite editor. Once it is open as we always do, at the top of your script you're going to declare some variable things that we're going to need as the collidable object so what is it from outside do we need to make this script work well first we're going to take an object called contact filter 2d and that's going to be some kind of filter to know what exactly you should collide with uh, we'll see more about this in a second and then we'll need a box collider 2d which should also be on this object so we made it private the reason I made it private is since it is on the object, we don't need to drag and drop this for every object. We're simply going to assign the box collider in a start or a wait call. And finally, we need a private collider 2D array called hits. And you'll see why we need this once we lay down the formula. But basically, this is an array that is going to contain data of what exactly did you hit during this frame. And I've put a maximum of 10 in here. 10 is a big number actually, we don't need that much because every single frame uh, you could be in collision with say maximum 10 different things in this case. Um, technically you're going to be in collision with more but we, the information we're going to receive we're going to limit that to 10. And like I mentioned 10 is already a big amount. Alright so I'm going to go down here and write down a start but I'll make it protected and virtual and we'll see what this means in a second if you've done inheritance before you'll understand and if you haven't I will go briefly on what inheritance is as we do it so in the start just imagine this is a normal start if you don't know so in the normal start we're going to do a get component type of box collider 2d which means that whatever object the collidable script is on it requires a collider 2d what you could do in Unity, they let you do that at the top of your class. You can say require component type of box collider 2D, and this is going to automatically add a collider 2D to your object. Let's give this a try just to see what happens. So, right now we don't have any collidable script. Let's put it, say, on the main camera. I'm going to drag and drop this on the main camera, and as you can see, it created a box collider for us. No, we don't need that on the camera, so I'm going to remove it. You have to remove the collidable script because, of course, it depends on the box collider. But as you can see, this is what the require component does. In my case, like I mentioned before, I'd rather not have this here. I'd rather have an error instead that's going to let me know that box collider is not defined. The reason I would rather have an error is quite simple. When they put the collider to the end of your object, you don't define the scale. They put one automatically there. So I'd rather be um, told that there is an error and the collider is not, you know, is not put properly than have it put there automatically and not the way I want it. Second function is going to be a update. So private virtual void again. And we're going to be creating a normal update. Like if you haven't done inheritance, like I said, normal update. This is going to be for all the collision work. 
and this is what we're going to be doing. So we're going to take our bus collider 2D and we're going to cast the function overlap collider. Overlap collider takes in our contact filter. This is why we need it. And it also takes in an array of result where to put it, which is also why we declare that at the top. So these two go hand in hand together. All right, so once we call this function, what this is going to do is take your bus collider and actually look for other collider beneath it or above it. So something in collision with your bus collider right now, and it's going to put it inside of the hits array. So let's actually iterate over this array. We're going to do a four. And what I do here is I type in four and I double tap on tab. And it is going to autocomplete this for me. So for and i is equal to zero as long as i is smaller than hits.length. So we're iterating through the whole array. We're going to check if hits at index i is equal equal to null. That means there's nothing. And that's going to happen every time because you know the array is the size of 10 and you might not hit 10 things every time. So you have to make sure that um, you check if it's null or not. If it is null, we're going to continue. Now, if this is not null, we are going to do a debug.log and just shout out what is the name of where we've hit. So let's do hits at the index i dot name. This way we can know what we collided with. And then um, the array is actually not cleaned up every time. So we're going to clean it ourselves by doing a hits at the index i is equal to null. So let's give this a try. We're going to put the collidable on our NPC. So where's our NPC? Right here. I'm going to have the collidable script on it. And it's not going to create a box collider because first we remove the required component and second there's already one on there. So if I press on play now, every single frame, you're going to see what this player, the test NPC, is actually entering collision with. So as you can tell, right now the test NPC is entering collision with player zero, which is my, my main guy. And this is what we need. So we need the information on what is actually hitting us right now. And this is going to help us in the future. Like uh, instead of having a debug.log in here, we could say something like uh, send text to the player, tell him what to do or give him HP or sell him hide him. All that kind of stuff could be done from right here which is also why we're going to turn this thing into something more general. Because if it is a NPC, maybe he wants to say something to the player. If it is a chess, maybe he wants to reward the player with some pesos or something. So we have to make sure that we can actually work with this function in any cases. Now we could go ahead and say, well, if this dot tag, say it's the NPC number zero, then you're going to say something. If it is a pesos chess, then you could go ahead and grant pesos. But that is just too much work. That is not something really efficient. We are going to do something else instead. We're going to be using the power of inheritance. And to do this, we are actually going to create another function. This one again, protected virtual void on collide. And we'll send in a collider 2D that I'll just call call. And here is what's going to happen here. Debug.log call.name. The exact same thing. And we're going to make sure that in between where our debug.log was in the past, we're going to say on collide with hits at the index i. Because of course, hits at the index i is a collider 2D. So what we've done here in this very specific case is nothing. <laughs> it is the exact same thing as it was a second ago. We just changed the flow of things. So this way, once you enter here and you call the on collide, instead of just doing the debug.log, it is going to go to this virtual function and do it here instead. Now, through the power of inheritance, we are going to be able to change the content of this function through different means. So if we are a chess, we're going to be changing it to something like Grand Pesos. If we are NPC, uh, change it for something like Talk to the Player. That kind of stuff is doable if we use inheritance. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, 
we learn how to make something collidable using Box Collider 2D and our little script over here, but we didn't really make it so it could change. Right now we only have one function that does a debug.log and that's all it does at the moment. What we're going to do in this lesson is we are going to create a chess that is going to use the collidable function to give the player some pesos. Okay, so in order to do this, we're going to start by needing some chess. So I'm going to open up the atlas once again, go under the sprite editor and just crop some chess really really quickly. Um, I'll use two of them. So this one over here that's open and empty, that's going to be chess. Uh, this is actually going to be chess 1. Make sure it's 16 by 16, and this one just beneath it is going to be chest 0. There we go. Let's hit apply. We now have these two new sprites in our collection. I'm going to go ahead and find the chest 0 and drag it somewhere in the scene. So it is right here behind my actual game. I'm going to have to go under the sprite renderer and give it a layer. So I'm going to add a sorting wall. This is going to be interactable. And let's make sure my chest is in that sorting layer. We'll now be able to see it over here. I'll reduce the size to something like 0 0.75, unboot axis, and we now have this thing. All right, now the question is, how do we use this collidable script and turn it into something useful for the chess? Well, first up, let's make sure that this chess has a box collider 2D. As you can tell, they mention it down here. There is no box collider 2D attached to the chess zero object. So we're going to actually give it one. And as you can tell, we now have a collider 2D. Now, our very next step is going to turn this, what you see over here in the console, so the player zero called into the grant peso call. To do this, what we're going to be using is called inheritance and it is a concept in programming that is pretty much everywhere in high level languages such as C sharp and even C++. What we're going to do is actually get rid of the collidable script. So remove component. Now we're going to head over to the script folder, create a new C sharp script, call it chess and we're going to open that one up. Now, at the very top here, you might be wondering what is this over here, the mono behavior that we see all the time. Well, mono behavior is something that we inherit from, meaning that your chess, even though it looks like there is nothing in the class right now, we still have access to a couple of things. As you can tell, first off, we have the, you know, the private void update we can use, we have the private void start, and anywhere you are in that object, you still have access to things such as transform, Collider, even rigid body. I think this one is, yeah, this one is deprecated, but as you can tell, we still have access to all those things, including get component. Now, these are not something native in C sharp. Those are not something native in, in the code, in the language we're using. It is something that Unity gives us through mono behavior. And now, let me tell you a little bit of a secret. If you double click on mono behavior and you press F12, you'll be able to see what's inside of it. So every time you actually create a class that inherits from mono behavior, you also inherit from cancel invoke, invoke, stop coroutine, start coroutine, all that kind of stuff. But you also inherit from behavior because mono behavior inherits from behavior. So you also get this one. What's inside of it? Enabled is active and enabled. You have function you can call on your object, but you also inherit from component. This one, of course, has all these things we just mentioned. So, so every single object you create under mono behavior have all these things, and that's a that's a bunch of things you can call. So they also inherit from object. An object is the final one, but you're going to see function we use such as destroy, don't destroy on load, instantiate, all that kind of stuff, and also some override over here. So we we have all of that in chess. At the moment it doesn't look like it, but chess has all of these functions and that is because he inherits from mono behavior. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to add a layer on top of that. You saw how we have mono behavior and beneath that there is a behavior, then component, then object. Well we're going to add our own layer. We're going to add collidable. Right, so how does that work? 
Chestnut now inherits from Collidable, and Collidable inherits from Mono Behavior. So we still have the same exact thing as we had um, in the past, but we include all of this on top. Let me give you exactly an example of what this does. If we go back on our chess, as you can tell, there is nothing on there, there is no Collidable. We're going to add our very new script, which is, you know, it's pretty much empty as you can tell. It's just this, but it inherits from Collidable. What happens? if we actually go on top. The same exact thing as if we had the collidable. So you can think of it as some kind of copy paste of what we had in collidable and we just put it inside of chess. There is some neat thing, very nice things you can do with this and it is the fact that you can change some function that collidable has because we made them virtual. Virtual means they are defined, they are there, but you have the opportunity to change them. You have the opportunity to override them and this is exactly what we're going to do right now. So we're trying to change this bit of code for something like Grant Pezos. Right, so what we're going to do is head over to the chess and type in the exact same security type. So right here was protected. We're going to say protected and instead of doing virtual, we will do a override. As you can tell, they are actually recommending it to me. So we can override start, we can override update, and we can also override on collide. Right here, we will want on collide. So let's make sure we include that one. Now, they're going to give you something called base on collide, which means you'll be able to call the one from your parent. You'll be able to call the one from collidable. If we leave this in there, same thing happens. You're going to see that it still calls the name of the player player zero. Now if we go back and remove this, just leave this as the empty function, it is still going to call the function, however there is nothing in it. So we totally destroyed the one in Collidable. We didn't really destroy it, but we are not running the one in Collidable anymore. We're running the one in chess and the one in chess is empty. We could call the one from Collidable if we decide to call it uh, using base, just like you saw over here. Now, we do not want that. Here we want to give the player some pesos. And unfortunately, we haven't created the code around that, so we'll just say grant pesos. Let's have a look what this does in the game. And here you go. So we totally change this, what we received over here before, so the name of the player, to this, grant pesos. These two things, they both use the code behind collidable.cs but they have different behavior and this is the power of inheritance and there is a lot more thing you can do with inheritance but this is the main big thing that you'll want to do with it so we'll be using it quite a lot and if you did not really understand this concept I really recommend that you go watch the video in the resources there's another additional video uh, you can watch it's on my youtube channel right now but it is something that might help you understand a little bit better it is something you'll want to use in video gaming. Any video games you're making, this is something that is really, really useful. Alright guys, I will catch you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to keep working on our chess, but we're also going to create an additional layer in between Collidable and chess. Because there is other thing we might also want to collect in the future. So we are going to create a class that is called Collectible. In between Collidable and chess. And the reason I'm doing this is because if we have a weapon and that weapon you can swing it around in front of you, um, you don't want this to be collectible, but you want this to be collidable. So we're going to create this additional layer. And also if you want to have something else than just chess that you can collect in your game, you will be able to inherit from collectible and not collidable. Let's add a little bit of logic in here. We are going to go right in between these two by making sure this one inherits from collidable. And now we're going to go on chess and make it inherit from collectible. Everything is still going to work because just imagine we just did a, a normal copy paste, but this one has nothing in it. So it has nothing to bring to the table just yet. Um, we are going to create some logic field at the top though. So the logic field we're going to be using is a simple protected boolean called collected. And that is the only thing we're going to need. So now imagine that this is a normal boolean, so a normal variable just like we've been using thus far. Uh, it could have been public, it could have been private, 
but in this case it is going to be protected just like the function we've saw in collidable those are protected protected basically mean that it is private but your children are going to have access to it so it's going to be private to everybody but your children in this case chest is a children of collectible and collectible is a children of collidable so this one they have access to the protected function and also the protected fields or protected variable from their parents in this case if we create a protected bool nobody's gonna have access to it but itself so collectible and also chess as you can tell from chess we can say collected and that is our boolean if it was private we would not be able to do that if it was a private bool just like this you don't have access to it it doesn't even show up so this is what protected means and of course if it was public everybody even even your player script could have access to it so this is something you might not want in this case we don't need anybody to know about our collecting or collected status um, if it's not us we're going to keep this here and we are now going to override a function so protected override void on collide now what we're going to do in this case is a simple check that simple check is going to be is it the player that's actually hitting me so if call dot name if the the name of the collider is player with a capital P then we're going to call a function call uncollect just like this uncollect is going to be a function just like uncollide so it's something we're going to override it is something that we have to declare down here and we are going to do that right now so private void on collect the reason we're not going to need anything in parameter is because we know that it is a player the reason we know it's a player only the player or any collider with the name player is going to be able to call this function so collected is going to be equal to true that's going to be my simple logic right here now why exactly did i do that why did i not just leave it the way it was well it is quite simple if we actually um, put that on collidable like it was before you're going to see that if we move our chest anywhere else where there is a collider say right here this is a wall collider it is going to grant pesos even though the player is not on top of it and that is not something we want so definitely we have to check whether this is a player hitting you or not and we could have done it like there is nothing stopping us from doing it here so if call dot name is equal equal to player then of course we could have done it that way by the way since we're using collider dot name we have to make sure the collider dot name of our player is really player really really important let's change the name of our player to a proper name <laughs> Okay, so just to make everything clear, we are now inheriting from collectible. But we could have made the call right here, like I said, if call.name uh, is equal equal to player. Instead, what we're going to do is totally get rid of all of that. And to grant peso this time, we are going to override. So actually, let's make that protected. Override. And we're going to override on collect. And when we do uncollect, I'm going to leave the base in here and I'm going to say debug.log grant Bezos. Now, if you're curious why I decide to leave the uncollect, the base uncollect in here, it is simply so we can have this call collected is equal to true. Remember that uncollect, the base function has this, as you can tell, so collected is now equal to true. Now, if you do not want to have the base on collect in here, if you think it doesn't look good, if it's not clean in your code, if you can't read it properly, because of course, um, every time you want to know what is inside of on collect, you're going to have to go back and check. Okay, so collected is equal to true. That is exactly what's going on right here. Just copy paste what's in there. Now, um, of course, if you don't want to have that, you can simply type it right here. So on collected is equal to true. Now let's go ahead and expand on the logic of this chest. So this chest is going to have to do more than just a debug.log. We are going to start by if statement. So let's just disregard all of this. We're going to start with an if statement. If we are not collected. So if collected is equal to false and false is shown here by this exclamation sign. 
Well, if it has not been collected, let's say that it has now. So collected is going to be equal to true. And then we can do our chess logic. Now we don't really have anything to track the amount of pesos our player has. So we're going to go ahead and uh, work around only the visual aspect of the logic thus far. So what we'll do instead is we're going to work on the visual aspect of it. So we're going to say public sprite, empty chess sprite. And also public int, pesos amount. The first variable right here, the empty chess, is going to be so we can swap the full chess sprite to the empty chess once we collect it. And then the pesos amount is going to be to say how much pesos are you going to earn from that. Now, I remember in the design, the little design I've made, um, one point of reward was equal to 5 pesos, so I'll make sure I put 5 in here. But you can change it directly on the chess if you want to, since this is a public int. Okay. Let's keep on writing this logic. So what we have to do here is we have to grab the sprite renderer of our object and change the sprite on it. We can do that with a get component. So let's do a get component sprite renderer and change the sprite. It's going to be equal to empty chess. Okay. Um, next up, let's do a debug.log again so we know that you know it happened. Debug.log and we're going to grant the amount of pesos through text right now. So grant plus pesos amount plus pesos. Little exclamation sign just to show how happy we are we gain pesos. And let's give this a try now. So nothing happens. We go here and I just realized we're gonna have an error. <laughs> um, we did grant five pesos and the chest totally disappeared. The chest disappeared because it changed the sprite to none. I thought we were going to get an error, we didn't get one. Apparently it's fine to have it on none, but we're not going to leave it that way. Let's make sure we go back on the chess. And here where it says empty chess, you're going to find chess1. And just like this, we're going to run this again. And the chess is now empty once we walk on top of it. Plus, we have been granted 5 pesos. If we want more, scroll this, go ahead and play the game. And we're now granted 855 pesos, which is too much. Okay, let's put it back on 5. Make sure we change the name of chess to chess. And we're going to put it in our prefab. So now we can spawn chess wherever we want by simply drag and dropping this in the scene. Here you go. So we got a couple of chests around now. And this one here could grant 10 pesos. This one could grant 25, and we can now play this. This one gives 10, this one gives 5, 25, and so on, guys. So we're actually going to end this lesson right now, and I will move on to another collidable object in the next one. Cheers. Welcome back, guys. In this lesson, we are going to make another collidable object. This one is fairly a simple object, but it's something we will need for the game flow of our game. So it is a portal object, something that is going to teleport us to another scene. Now I don't think I'm going to have a sprite for this one, I think I'll just leave it blank and the player is going to have to find it. So at the top over here, I am going to create a 2D object, this one's going to be a sprite. I'll put a box collider on it, box collider 2D of course. Make sure I open up my box collider and now let's actually play with these. I will be editing the collider so I can actually grab the sides and just make a zone in which the player is going to step in and trigger the on collide thing. So right about here sounds fine. You can make it bigger, it doesn't really matter at this point because you know it can't escape from the two other sides. Right, so this is going to be my portal. It doesn't look like much, you can't even see it. But we have the zone and this is all that matters to us. So let's change the name of this to portal. And now we are going to create a new component. I'm going to call this portal. So again, create a new script, put it on here, apply it to portal and then we're going to open it up and we'll redo the flow one more time so you can understand exactly how to override a function. 
just like we've done for the chess, this is going to inherit from collidable and make sure it is not the collectible. We're not trying to collect the portal. We want to collide with it. And to override the function, we use the same exact security type. So in this case, protected override on collide. Let's check, is this a player? So if col.name is equal to player, then we're going to teleport him. So teleport the player. Okay, so where exactly do we want to teleport the player? We're going to give it a random dungeon. So we don't really know which dungeon he's going to get. It is something that's going to be random. Now, the way we're going to do this is by creating some kind of logic right here. I'll do a public string array. And that string array is going to be scene names. So there is multiple strings and it's all going to be the scene names. Then once we do collide, we have to pick a random scene in there and just load it. So we're going to pick a random one doing string scene name. So this one is singular. It's going to equal to scene names, the array, and we'll do a random dot range zero scene names dot length. Just like this. Okay, what exactly does this line do? This line creates a new string by itself. So it's not multiple string. It's not like this one here. This is an array of strings. So you can have multiple one. Um, this one is singular, a single scene. And we're going to pick a random scene in between zero and the amount of scenes inside of the scene array. So we just get a random scene in there. And then we're of course going to load it up. To load it up, um, there is multiple way you can do that. So when you load a scene in Unity, what you can do is use the scene manager and do a load scene. Exactly written this way. Now to have this working, you absolutely need to do the using statement at the top. Now this is something you're going to see at a lot of different places. People on the web, they like to do that. Um, I personally like to do something else instead of having a using statement at the top I will just put it all in one single call like this so unity engine scene management scene manager load scene and I'm going to get rid of this one at the top and also why not get rid of the other one as well if I only have one load scene I'd rather just call it manually like that and that's it that's all we need to do for this script so let's give this a try we have, we currently have only two scenes at the moment. We have main and dungeon one. Now, obviously we don't want to load the main scene again, but for testing purpose, we will actually put it in the array. So on the portal object, find your portal script and you're going to have a size, say two. First one's going to be dungeon one and second one's going to be main. So there's going to be one out of two chance to reload the same exact scene. And there's going to be one out of two chance to only dungeon one. Now you're going to realize as soon as you step in there, you're going to have a error. <laughs> and that is simply because we have not added them to the build setting. This is something a little bit complicated to understand when you first start off using Unity. But all of these scenes you create are never put in the real game until you add them to your build settings. And this is really useful for multiple reasons. While you're developing your game, you might have some something we call gym scenes. So hidden map, developer maps that the real player is never going to see and you've been using those maps to test out, say, the distance in between your jump. You, you test out different gameplay prefab or just, you know, just to mess around and try to create something, try to create the new level. This is not something that would be completed and it's not something you want to ship in the final game. So technically you don't add it to the build settings. However, these two scenes, we want to add them to build settings. We want them to be included. So we'll go up here under file, build settings, and the scene in build are currently empty. We'll make sure to drag and drop main and also dungeon one. Make sure main is the first one. Then we can play the game, go here. And as you can tell, we've been teleported to the other scene, to dungeon one. And uh, Dungeon 1 has a little bit of issues with the camera, as we, as we could tell a second ago. So I'm going to fix that, put that back on 1. 
and here we go. Let's go back in main, give this a try. We're going to collect the first chest, go here. As you can tell, we've been re-teleported into main, which means that we hit the one out of two chance of main being reloaded. Now, let's go back. This time, we loaded dungeon. So that's pretty cool, we have our portal working, and we did another example of inheritance, so quite happy about that. This will conclude the interactable section, and we'll then move on to the next one. In the next one, we'll be doing a lot of saving stuff, so we're going to be saving our state in between the two scenes, so this one we're in right now, and say the dungeon, so we can keep the same amount of pesos in our bag, we can keep the same gear, we can keep the same experience amount, we're going to be working on all these nice stuff just to connect everything together in the next section. So guys, thank you so much for watching and I will see you there. Welcome back to a new lesson. In this lesson, we are going to create all those little fields, all those little variables that we should have been keeping track of since the get-go. We're talking about the amount of pesos, the amount of experience our character has, his weapon, and all that kind of good stuff. So most of them are not created just yet, so we're going to lay down the groundwork and um, once we're ready, actually implement those. So let's go ahead and open up our script folder. I'm going to create a game manager. Now this one is going to turn into a little gear by default because Unity just likes to do that. Um, it recognizes game manager as a script that is going to control a lot of things, but just tell yourself that nothing changed, it's just like a normal c -sharp script. The first thing I'll be writing in this game manager is a public static instance of myself. Now, if you don't know about static, it is something you can access from everywhere in your code. So, assuming that we are in portal right now, we can access instance, which is our field over here. We can access that variable by doing a Game Manager getting the type of my object, so that's the name of the class, just like portal, and then dot instance. And it is going to be there because it is static. Now, what that means is that we could get the instance of a Game Manager from anywhere. Now, the question behind this is which instance is it going to be? Because in case we have two Game Manager, uh, which one is it going to pick? Well, we have to make sure that we only have one. That's the big problem here and we're going to make sure that the instance is going to be equal to this. So once we start the game, we're going to assign this to ourselves, which means if we go here and we say game manager instance, this is going to be equal to the instance we're going to put in the scene. So it's going to be equal to something, at least it's not going to be null, it is going to be equal to the first game manager that it finds in the scene, which means we have to put that somewhere. So under main, I am going to right click in here, create an empty game object. It doesn't need to have any mesh, it doesn't need to have any sprite. This is going to be our game manager. Going to put the position on 0, 0, 0 and add our new component to it. Right, so now we only have one game manager and this one is going to be the one equal to instance. Okay, so now we have this one script that is going to be available anywhere in your code. This one script is going to contain a couple of things. First off, resources for the game. I'll be typing in four fields in here. We won't be using them all today, but we're going to be creating a list of sprites, and that is going to be the player sprites. Right now, we only have two. Public list of sprite, and that's going to be the weapon sprites. Then a public list of int. This one's going to be the weapon prizes when we upgrade public list of int again and this one's going to be the xp table so how much xp do you need to move on to the next level these one we're not going to use it just yet but at least they're going to be there and then we'll need some more logic stuff so actually not logic we're going to call that references references to different things such as the player script the weapon script so public player, this one we already have so we can leave it in here, there and there's going to be something like public weapon, weapon, and so on, depending on how many references we need for our game. Okay, next up we are going to need um, something to keep track of the amount of pesos, so just some simple int 
I'll just call that logic in here. And it is a public int for the peso, so amount of money you have right now. Public int experience, how much experience does your guy have right now? Alright, so this is going to be enough for right now. We have a couple of variable right now, we're not really using them. Um, we know this one exists, we can have a reference or a player. We'll do that manually in a second. Uh, these one, they're brand new, we're going to be using them in the save state. And these one are just here for, uh, for the future, so they're going to be resources for the future. We are going to be adding a couple in here, in between here in the future, but right now, like I said, that is going to be enough, and we're going to move on to the function. We're going to start with one called public void save state. This one is going to save your game. Then public void load state. As expected, this one is going to load up your progress. Those two are pretty much focused around the save state of your game, so let's actually just say that at the top here. Save state. Okay. Now, um, sometimes I do export these functions somewhere else. Maybe I, I put them in a other script, and I also put the pesos, the experience, all everything I need to save could be in a different script, and I just decide to serialize that as a whole. But right now, we're not going to need so much. We're going to need the um, the skin that the player prefers. We're going to need the amount of pesos he has. We're going to need the experience and also the weapon level. Um, all these things we can actually get from the game manager itself. Alright, so before we actually go and write these two functions, how we're going to be saving this, let's actually just hook them up at the proper place. So we're going to write debug.log, save state for this one, and this one's going to be, of course, load state. And we have to make sure that we load and save at the proper time. When looking at our game, we need to first load when the game starts. Of course, we need to make sure that we have the proper data as soon as the game starts, and then we need to save um, we could save at any time we get something, so as soon as you get a new chest, a new amount of pesos, you could call the save state, that could work, or you could save every time you change scene. At this point, I think it's really up to you, you could save on a button click, but um, just to keep this fairly simple, I think we're going to save every time we change scene, because it's only a function call in the end, all you have to do is call that one function, and it is going to do the whole saving process. Okay, now how do we save, actually how do we load? upon starting a scene. Well, we do have some callback that Unity gives us, so we can actually call a function when the scene is completely loaded. We will be learning about these function in the next lesson. Welcome back guys, welcome to another lesson. In this one, we're finally going to tackle the content of save state and load state. These one are going to be quite fun to do, quite simple as well, and um, we're going to do exactly what we said in the theory video. So. Alright, so the first thing I'll be doing at the top here is give myself some space to type in what we need to input in the save state. So first off, the first value we'll need is a int called preferred skin. This is the skin your player is going to like like the most in the character selection. So which character is he playing right now? The second int could be the amount of pesos he has. The third int could be the experiences he has. And finally, one more for the weapon level. And I just realized that I'm not constant in my writings, so let's fix that. There we go, and that's all we really need. When you think about it, that's all we're using, that's all we need to conserve in between the scenes. So, let's actually code this. Fairly, fairly simple stuff. We're gonna start by declaring a string s, make it equal to nothing. I called it s for saving. And by the end of whatever we do in between here, we're gonna have a player pref, Oh, so let's fix that. Player pref save actually is going to be set string, and then it's going to be our save data. So we need a key and then a value. The key is going to be save state, and the value is going to be s. Now we have to fill that s with our value, with our data. So to do this, we're going to start by saying s plus equal, which means we're going to append to this. Right now, there's nothing in the string, so we're going to just set it at the beginning. And uh, what we're going to do in here is get the current skin, because the very first thing here is the prefer skin. Unfortunately, we don't have that just yet, so we're going to set something, say, uh, we're going to say 0 for now. And then, 
in between every single number we input is going to be a pipe sign. Pipe sign for me is alt code 124, so I just hold my left alt button and do 124. If you don't have it on your keyboard, like I do. Second up, we have the amount of pesos. This one we do have. So let's say pesos to string, making sure our int turns into a string, and then plus alt 124. And next up, we have the experience. We also have that. So experience to string plus the pipe sign once more. Really important you don't put the pipe sign in between single calculates. Actually, you could but you have to make sure um, that this is actually set on to string because if you do something like this you're going to end up with some weird bug you have no clue why it happens what happens is it actually takes um, the int value of experience and it adds the int value of this pipe sign and it gives you just a weird number uh, that you don't really want so really make sure this is a string and this is a to string just to be a hundred percent sure you don't end up with some weird bug and finally we have the weapon level again we don't have the weapon level just just say plus and here I'm not going to do a, a plus pipe sign like this because we are not going to need it that is the final one that is the final uh, value in our save state if we were to expand on this then sure I would put that and then create another line and that's what we need actually that's everything we need for the save state now when it comes down to loading the state it's gonna be a little bit different but very very similar in some way we're going to declare an array of string called data and that array is going to be something we load so player pref and instead of doing a set string we're going to do a get string the value of the key save state make sure it is the same exact thing you type here and here we go now this is going to return you a string but what we want right here is an array of strings, so multiple string. This is why we're going to add dot split, and we're going to split on the pipe sign. Now you have to make sure it is single quotes because this is a character, and it's not going to be interpreted as the end. Right. All right. So what this is going to do is assume we have something like this in the memory in the player pref. Assume we have zero, um, say ten pesos and fifteen experience plus weapon level 2. What this is going to do is take that single string, this would be like a single string like this, it's going to take it and instead of having that, it's going to create you a bunch of little string like this and of course split them in different strings. So we have that right now in our data. Data the index 0 is equal to this, data the index 1 is equal to this and so on. So we're going to be using that value to change what we need to change. Okay, so right now, change player skin. We can't do that. We don't have any mechanic around it at the moment. So we're going to skip it. Second up, we have the, what was it again? Was the amount of pesos. So let's say pesos, because we are in the game manager and it's, you know, it's right here. We're going to change that value right there manually by saying pesos is equal to data at the index 1. Now the problem we have at the moment is that data is a string and pesos is the int. So we have to make sure we cast it first by doing int.parse like this. And this way pesos is now going to be equal to the int value of that string. Let's actually duplicate that. We're going to need it for the experience as well simple stuff and finally change the weapon level which we cannot do at the moment and that should be everything we need to do at the moment for the saving state so let's give this a try directly in the game I'm going to go and play this now one thing that I forgot that is going to happen at the very first time you boot your game um, this this is going to happen simply because you don't have any save state at the moment and it wants to go further so before we do anything here, let's check if player pref has key, if you have the key, actually if you don't have the key, so let's make an exclamation sign in front of it, save state, if you don't have save state, 
simply return. We're not going to deal with the rest of that and this should fix the error. Okay, so having this error fixed now, we're going to give this a try in the game. We have, say, 10 pesos. Let's make sure we hit a point where we can save the game. So right here. The game is saved and we now have 10 pesos. We load the states again, that's fine. Let's close it off, press on play again. And as you can tell on the right hand side over here, we still have 10 pesos. So this was saved forever and that's it. So we managed to save our game and we can keep it through the scenes just by walking outside and doing our thing. We might want to add some more function to it such as the uh, destroy save so you can start over again and you know try this out. If you do want to start over again in case you're curious what you could do is um, head somewhere say in your event like anywhere where the code is ran so you could go in the awake and say player pref delete all and just by having this function call over here you should be able to press this it's going to put zero here because you're not loading anything anymore everything is deleted then you go back you can remove it and start fresh without having that um, in the way anymore and there is of course other way you can go about that you can go manually delete it in your registry you can delete only one key so you can delete that one key called uh, save state and only delete that data in case you have other data you want to keep and that should be it for the saving section of course we're gonna have to come back once in a while to add our data in here such as the weapon level and also the preferred skin for the player now on the next one we are going to have a look at creating a floating text system. This is going to be cool because it's going to let us know, um, say when we collect those chests, it can say plus five pesos or something like that. Give a feedback to the player so he knows what happened. And if we run into this guy, he can say some text, you know, that kind of stuff. Also floating combat text so we could have uh, damage displayed on top of our hits. All right, guys, I will see you there. Welcome back. In this new lesson, we are going to learn about event and how to use them. So in the last lesson, we were looking for a way to actually hook these at the beginning of your scene and also at the end of your scene. In this lesson, we're exactly going to do that using events. So let's go at the top here and actually have a look at the piece of code we'll have to deal with. We're going to start with a scene manager. This one is not going to be available, so just type it out, double click on it, and then hit control and dot if you're in mono develop oh, sorry if you're in visual studio and make sure you do the using statement at the top if you're not in visual studio simply go at the top of your script and type in this using statement now we have access to the scene manager we're going to say scene loaded and you're going to see that this is an actual event so it has this little lighting sign then we're going to do plus equal the name of your function in this case, load state. Now you're going to see that there is no overload for save state that matches the delegate, which means save state is a function, of course, that is going to work, but it does not match the, uh, the parameter that it should get. So it says you need a scene and a load scene mode. It says that at the very right hand side. So we're going to go down on our save state function and actually add those. So it needed a scene. We can call it S and also a load scene mode that we can call mode. At this point you're going to realize that everything is back to normal and everything should work. So what exactly is going on here? We have this event called scene loaded and scene loaded is the event that uh, the scene manager fires on its own. So once you're done loading a scene, scene manager is going to go through every single function you put in here. As you can see over here we have the plus equal sign and then we have a function. So what happens is Every time that this event is fired, it is going to look for all the function inside of this event, so in this case, save state, and probably some others that we don't even see ourselves, and it is going to fire all of these functions. So it's going to call all of these functions once the event is fired. So you could have something else here. You could have a load state as well, and it would just load both. Let's give this a try. So we're going to put this parameter in here to make sure it matches the, uh, the signature, and then let's click on play and have a look at what happens now both function were called save state and load state upon firing that event that and that event was simply 
scene loaded. So once the scene was loaded, it fired everything in here. So what you can do just to prevent that from happening multiple times is go inside of the function you just created and just add it to the event. And inside of save state, you can say, well, let's do minus equal once we're done. Once it has been called once, we're going to remove it. So in this case, it did call a save state because it fired the event and it was in it. Now, if we were to load another scene from now on, it is not going to do it. It's not going to um, call a save state. Okay, so now we managed to find the place where to hook our code at. So this works. We know it works. The only problem right now is that it's in sort of the save state when it really should be in the load state. So let's swap that around and do it that way. So now it's going to call load state instead. We still have some trouble with the save state though. Like it is not, it is not put where we want it to be. We want to put it before we exit the scene or before we exit the game. Well, for this to happen, we need to find where we exit the scene. And at the moment, we only exit the scene at one single place in the code. And it would be in the portal.cs. So let's open up the portal.cs and when we, once we actually teleport the player here in the scene management load scene, we're also going to be calling the save state. And now that is the beauty of the public static instance we've done at the beginning. We can simply say game manager instance save state. And just like this, it is going to work. Now, remember that save state takes in those weird parameters, which is like a scene and a load scene mode. Since we're not going to be using them in, in this event, we don't need these parameters anymore. So let's get rid of them. And just like this, we should be able to call save state. Okay, so let's actually give this a try. We move around, we have the load state that just that was called a second ago, and we're going to enter one scene, it says save state, which means we saved before going in. Now, we don't have a load state for this one simply because there is no game manager in here. If we did have a game manager in here, then it would have been called. Alright, so this leaves us with a single problem right now, and it's really a decision you have to take. Do we want to be loading the game every time we enter a new scene, or do we want to just keep that data with us um, everywhere we go? This is two different approach that you can choose in between. There is not going to be much different in the end, actually there is going to be no difference in the end. Uh, since it's really small operations that are not really expensive. What we can do, the simplest thing to do is simply copy and paste this game manager. So copy, head over to the dungeon one and paste it in here. Now if you play this game, you're going to go here, you're going to have the save state and load state. Now, of course, we loaded the same scene so it's kind of hard to tell. Let's go back and here you go. You're going to have the save state and the load state inside of dungeon one. This is something you could actually go for, uh, but since we want to make it as clean as possible, we are going to get rid of the thing we just put, and we're going to make sure our data persists in between the scenes. So what we'll be doing right here is heading back into the game manager, and in the game manager, we're actually going to remove that call that removes this event. So every time that uh, we do load a new scene, this one's going to be called, and we're going to forget the fact that uh, we, we're going to remove this. So it's going to stay in there and every time a new scene is going to be called, load state is going to be launched. That is something we need to do in order to have this working. Of course, we're going to leave this one at the top. Now, something else we have to do in the awake call or as soon as you start the game is something called don't destroy on load, our game object. This is going to make sure that as soon as you start the game and as soon as you change scene, the game manager is going to remain in here. I don't know if you saw it, just have a look on the right hand side in the hierarchy. When I press on play, there is a new scene created called Don't Destroy Unload, and the game manager is on here. Which means that if we go and get Dungeon 1, game manager is still here and it still loaded the state, even though we removed the call, even though um, there is no Dungeon 1, uh, there is no game manager in Dungeon 1. So this is something that is going to help us keep the data. Now, um, there's going to be a bug if we load this scene here. If we load the, the main scene again, which we will eventually, 
you're going to see that we have two game manager and this is just going to create a lot of conflict. So we must make sure that this does not happen at all costs. Again, here, there is multiple solution to this. In coding, there is always multiple solution to go about um, fixing those little bugs. But one I like to use and I tend to use most of the time is that I would have a scene before all my other scene, I would have something called the preloader, where I would put a loading screen, I would put like a loading bar, and um, my game manager would be in that scene, which means that this is one scene I'll be calling only once at the beginning of my game, and I'm never going back to it. So the fact that I'm never going back means there is never going to be a duplicate of those objects I would put, such as the game manager. Now, there is also one more solution that we are going to use right here. And it's to turn our game manager instance into some kind of singleton. Not the best one, but at least it's going to do the job um, just fine. So we're going to do an if statement. If game manager dot instance is equal equal to null, actually it's not equal to null. So if there is one already, we are going to first destroy myself. So destroy game object and then return, making sure we don't run this code down here. And that will result in um, having a new man game manager created once we load the scene, but that one is going to destroy itself and we're going to keep the old one. To prove this, we're going to give ourselves some peso, so like 15 peso, and hope we get the right scene. And you know what? Let's actually force it. I'm going to just put one scene in here, call it main, and this way it is not going to break. So we're walking in here. As you can tell, we only have one game manager and we still have are 15 pesos. So this is exactly how we're going to fix this problem. In the next lesson, we're going to finally tackle the save state and the load state, the content of this function. In this section, we are going to create a system that will display text on the screen and maybe give it some motion and we'll make sure to put it in a pool. A pool is some kind of design where you can reuse the asset you've used in the past because you did not destroy them, you only turned them off. And this is something we'll be doing with our text because there might be a lot of it and we don't really want to instantiate a new asset every time. So what we're going to do is instantiate one, two or three asset and we'll turn them off when we're done with them and turn them back on when we need them again. Now the text I'm trying to create is a text that is going to be um, a little bit complicated. So it's going to have its own logic. That text is going to need to know if it's active or not. It's going to need to know how long it should be on the screen, where it should be on the screen, does it have a slight motion on it, so does it move on the screen while we're displaying it, and also what is inside of the text, what's the color of the text, what's the font of the text, all of that, we are going to create a new script that is going to contain all of that logic for a single text. So let's go ahead, right click on script, and create a floating text object. This is the first one we'll be defining in this lesson, and it should be quite fast. So let's start with a public boolean active. This is of course to know whether or not it is being used at the moment. Next up we have a public game object that I'll call geo. Now this is going to be to have a reference to our very own game object and you'll see why it's useful in the moment once we implement the pool mechanic. Next up we have the text object. So text I'll call txt. Now the text object is not something we currently have access to, it is something we need to import and that is because of the, the way um, they added the, the new UI system in Unity. They've done it after implementing a couple of things and they still haven't put it as part of the Unity engine at the moment. So what you have to do is do a using statement at the top, Unity engine.ui. You can either do that or of course double click on text, press on control dot and find it in here. And there we go. Now we have the public text txt. Next up is the public vector3. Oops. Motion. We have the public float duration and public float last shown. And all of these fields are going to be used in a single floating text object. Now, this floating text object is also going to have public function. The first one being public void show once we decide to show that text. We're going to turn it on, so active is going to equal true. We're going to say last shown is equal to right now, so time.time, and geo.setActive true. 
or we can say set active active that could be something else we're also going to have a function when we need to hide it because we're not destroying it so we're not doing a destroy on the game object what we're doing is a simple active is going to be equal to false and geo set active to false as well or if you want active all right so we have a basic show we have a basic hide now we're going to need some kind of update so let's do a public void update um, something I don't want in this case, since we're going to have a couple of floating objects, I don't want this to be part of model behavior. It's going to be too heavy. Well, technically, it's not going to be too heavy. We can definitely handle it. But just to make it clean, we don't actually need it. We don't need all that overhead. We're going to keep it as a simple C-sharp object. And instead of having an update just like this called by Unity, we're going to have an update um, called by us. So I'm going to create a public function, call it update floating text. And we'll call it update floating text from some kind of manager. In that update floating text, we're going to check, are we active or not? If we are not active, return. We don't need to do anything if we're not active. Now, if time.time .time minus last shown is bigger than duration, we need to hide this text. Now, this is one formula that I use most of the time. So let's actually go through it real quick. Let's assume that time.time .time right now is 10 seconds in the game. So 10 and last shown, we started showing this object at 7 seconds in. If that is bigger, then assume that we have a duration of 2. Then we're going to go ahead and hide it. So you see how simple this is. The time right now minus the moment we start showing this. In this case, that's 3 seconds um, total. If that's bigger than 2, which is the duration of the text, we go ahead and we hide it. So this is simply to know if we've been showing this text for long enough. Now, if we have not, we're going to say go.transform.position is plus equal to the motion times time.delta time. So every single frame, if we're still showing this because, you know, it's still active, we are going to move the transform of our text by the motion. Usually this is always something like vector3.up, so it's always going to go up a little bit. All right, so this is all we're going to need for our floating text. Now, make sure you also remove the uh, the mono behavior here. We're not going to be using mono behavior in this case. And that's it. So in the next lesson, we are going to create some kind of manager to instantiate, to move, to change the text inside of it, to change the font, and uh, do all that kind of stuff. So I will see you there in the next lesson. Hey, welcome back to a new lesson. Today's lesson is going to be about the floating text part 2. So in this second part, we are going to create one object, one manager, that is going to take care of all the floating text that we put everywhere in the map. So let's go ahead and right click on script. Let's create a new one. Um, let's call it floating text manager. And of course, open it up in your favorite editor. Now, what we're going to do in here is we're going to create an object that is going to contain a list of the um, the floating text and also um, is going to keep them in some kind of pool. This way we can reutilize the same exact object over and over again. But of course, every time we do change object, every time we reutilize one object, we'll have to change the text inside of it, the color of the font and, um, you know, the position, all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. First off, we're going to need two objects. One's going to be a game object called text container. And the other one is going to be another game object, text prefab. Now what's going to happen is all of our text, all of our floating text object, they're going to be in a um, in an object that's going to be based off the text prefab. And we're going to put them all under one kind of container. So in the scene, they're going to be ordered. They're not going to be directly just put in the scene somewhere. Um, you know, they're going to be somewhere clean. <laughs> then right after that, we're going to have a list, so a private list of floating text. That is, of course, our class we've created ourselves. Let's call it floating text and initiate that list right away. Now, in terms of function, we're going to start with the pooling mechanic. To create a pooling mechanic, you're going to require some kind of object you want to pull, in this case, our floating text, and also a mean to uh, obtain them. And this is what the function right here is going to do. So private floating text, we make sure to return a floating text at the end of this. We'll call it get floating text. Simple like that. 
Now we're going to start by looking, is there any floating text available right now we could use and that is not active, so that is hidden. To do this, we're going to create our floating text, call it txt. It's going to be equal to floating text the array, and then we're going to find something in it. So we're going to look using a predicate. So we're going to say t equal, then of course the arrow sign, t.active. All right, so now what this is going to do, it is going to take the floating text array and then try to find one of them that is not active. Realize that there is the exclamation sign, so we're looking for something that is not active. In this case, t right here, t is some kind of enumerator. So we could have said something, um, well, basically this line could be resume like this. So it could be for loop, and as long as i is smaller than floating text, dot count. And then we do a if statement. So if floating text at the index i is not active, then we would go ahead and uh, return that one. This line does exactly the same thing. So let's keep the first line. It's smaller, it's more efficient. And we're going to say if text is equal equal to null, really important here. So in case we don't find any here, this is not going to crash. This is not going to return an error, no exception. It is simply going to make text a null object. So what happened is, if we do find something, we totally skip this and we can just return that something. This way we just grab a random, not a random, sorry, we grabbed a floating text that is not active and we just return it. This is what happened if we find one that is inactive. Now if we don't find one that is inactive, we have to create a new one. So here's what we'll do. We'll say txt is equal to a new floating text, and then we're going to assign stuff in it. So txt.geo is going to instantiate and a text prefab. So we're creating a new game object and we're assigning it to txt.geo. Next up, we're going to say txt.geo.transform set parent, and we're going to say that the parent of this new game object is going to be the transform of text container. Now there is also one more thing we need to assign if we just look at our floating text, we need to assign the text as well. Motion, duration, and last shown is all assigned in here, so we don't have to deal with that here, um, but we do need to have the text component assigned, so this is what we'll do with the following. So txt.txt .txt is going to equal the game object, so txt.gameObject get component type of text. Again, we don't have the text right here, so let's make sure we include the using statement. So utengine.ui. And finally, once we created this new object, once this object is set properly, we're going to add it to our list. So floating text.add txt. And we never remove it from there because if it is uh, needed to have one more object, we want to leave it in the pool. We don't want to destroy it, we don't want to lose the reference. It's just going to stay there, and if we don't use it, it will be hidden. And now, just like this, we have created a function that is going to return us a floating text whenever we want it, whether there is some available or not. Okay, so that's a very good start. Second up, we are going to need a, um, a show function, so public void show. Just like the text has one, we're going to have one ourselves as well. Now, once we do a show, we need to pass in some parameters. The parameters are the following, so the text, the message we want to send, so we could call it message, the font size, color, a color for the text, a vector3 position, a vector3 motion, and finally a float duration. So you see there is quite a lot of parameters, but this is something that is going to help us customize the text in the game, and of course, is going to make sure we can adapt to any situation we want with that. So. What happens in here is first we need to declare a floating text, so floating text txt. We're going to get one from the pool, so get floating text. We're using a function ourselves. And now once we have one, whether it is a new one or an old one, we need to put all of these parameters you see at the top here. We need to fill that right inside of the floating text. So we're going to say txt.txt.text. Now that is really, I just realized that this is quite annoying to type. Uh, it doesn't look very good. So let's say floating text 
we're going to call that floating text with a small f and floating text dot text object dot text because there is a variable inside of the text component called text to change the message. It's a little bit weird like that, but that's how we do, that's how we do it. Um, that is going to be equal to the message. So we're manually just changing the text inside of the text component here. This is what we do. Now, next up, we're going to need the floating text dot text font size. And if you realize, that's why we have multiple. Uh, that's why we have two layers in text. Text is the component, and the component has a message. You know that text message. It has a font size. It has a color. We can actually have a look right now if you want. Maybe it would be easier to explain this way. This is the text component right here. Inside of the text component, there is text, which is what we just changed. So we changed that for our message. And then inside of it, there is, of course, the font size, uh, the font style you could change as well, the font, the spacing, um, all that kind of stuff. So we're really just interested in having the font size and the color. And that's only for what we'll be using. So text, font size, and color is all we'll be doing in here. So I'm going to remove that canvas, go back to the code. That font size is going to be equal to the one we receive in parameter. So font size. Now next up we have the floating text dot text dot color. It's going to be equal to the color we receive in parameter as well. And then we have to mess around with the game object. So floating text dot geo for game object dot transform dot position. And this is going to be equal to um, not just position because here is something quite new that I'm going to bring up to the table. Position in this case is a position in the world. So assuming that you're five in X and you hit something, want to display some combat text, the text is going to be, you know, uh, five in, in X. But now that floating text is a text component. And this one works on a different kind of coordinate system. It works on a different kind of axis system. I'll just try to explain this with the actual visual. Here, as you can tell, we have the player. We're moving 5 in X. Actually, that's 0 0.5, but you get the point. So we have the transform position up here. Now, our text is not going to be in the same coordinate system as this guy. This one is in what we call world space. In our case, we're going to be messing around with UI. And he has to be in screen space. And screen space is totally different. If we move 0.05 uh, in the screen, it's actually going to move 0.05 pixels. So it's barely going to do anything. You're barely going to see it at the proper place, which is why we need to transfer our world coordinate to screen coordinate. And we will do this like that. So we have to take the camera we're looking from. In this case, camera.main. And camera.main is going to return any camera in your scene that has the um, the main camera tag to it. And by default, it's there. So in case it, it's not for you, make sure that your camera, the one you're using, has the tag main camera to it. When you create a new scene, this is there by default. So you should be fine technically. If you remove your camera in the past, you added a new one, uh, you were just testing out stuff, make sure that it is on main camera right now. Okay, we're back to the code. Once we do have a reference to that main camera, we're going to say world to screen point. And this is going to take your world position, your say five in X and transfer it in screen space. And of course, screen space is the coordinate system that the UI uses. So transfer world space to screen space so we can use it in the UI. Okay. So one more thing completed. Next up, we're going to need some kind of motion. So I'll just transfer that by saying floating text dot motion is equal to motion. Now, um, the floating text itself is going to be taking care of moving it. And finally, not finally, but duration next, um, duration is going to be equal to duration. So these one are just there to transfer the knowledge from the manager to the floating text object. They don't do anything right here. They're not going to be used, um, but the floating text himself is going to be using it. And finally, floating text dot show. We're going to call the show function inside of it. And just like this, we'll be able to set everything we need inside of the floating text and show it on the screen. So this is the step in between the show and the hide we did not have in the floating text. Okay.
we're missing one more thing and that one last thing is the update if we want to have some nice motion if we want the um, the floating text to hide himself after x amount of time depending on the duration well we have to tell him um, to update the floating text because he's not going to do it on himself if you guys remember we remove mono behavior so there is no update available in here plus this is not even called update it's called update floating text um, so what we're going to do is create an update in here because this one does inherit from mono behavior let's do a private void update and just say the following so for each floating text txt in floating text that's our array we're going to say txt update floating text and this way we should be able to update every single floating text in the array every second sorry every frame and of course if this is not active they're simply going to break here and return so we don't do that operation down here all right so right now we have been coding a little bit too much without testing i don't love doing that so much but sometimes it is required so make sure you tune in in the next lesson where we're going to hook up all of this um just link them together make sure we have everything in the inspector filled in and we can call the show function and see if the text does appear on the screen or not hi right, guys i will see you in the next lesson welcome back to another floating text lesson in this one we are going to hook up everything making sure everything is connected and ready to use so at the moment, I am in my game manager. It is now time to create a new reference right here. We haven't created the weapon just yet. That is totally fine. We are going to create the floating text at the moment. So let's call this floating text and just leave it like that. Once we have our reference, we are now ready to call this somewhere down here. So what's happening right here is we do have public function we can call from anywhere. And um, the show text function is something that we want to be calling from everywhere because any object really can use that function. We want to allow the chest to say it, we want to allow the enemy to say it, we want to allow NPC to say it. And every time all of these guys want to say something, we don't necessarily want to have a reference to the floating text object that is going to be in the scene. So we decide to put it here in the game manager only at one place and we'll be calling it from here. So here's what we'll do. We are going to create a function, a public void show text function that is going to look very, very similar to the one we have in um, the floating text manager. So I just realized that should be that should be floating text manager actually. My bad, small mistake here on my part. Let's make sure we change that. Um, and also, let's add stuff in here. So. The first was message, the second one is font size, third one was the color, fourth the vector3 position, fifth vector3 motion, and finally the last one, the duration. So we, we basically just copy the same exact thing we had in the floating text manager and we're going to call it. So floating text manager dot show, we send in the message, the font size, whoops the font size, the color, the position, the motion, and the duration. So the reason we're doing this, like I mentioned, oh, mention, sorry, motion. The reason we are doing this is simply because we don't want to have a reference to the floating text manager from everywhere. We just want to have it at one place. And the way we're doing this right now is going to allow us from anywhere in the code, say the portal, the portal could say, well, game manager, that instance, show text and then just send in those parameters from here and have the text shown. Okay, so we are now ready. I'm going to just tag this as floating text. And we are going to go right in the engine and link everything together. Okay, so the game manager is right here. We have the player, which is not assigned, the floating text, which is not assigned. Let's, uh, since we're here, let's actually put the player in here. Um, and as far as the floating text manager goes, we need to create it. And this is where we have to right click, create a new, uh, we could create a new panel right now and just remove the image. Change the name of panel to floating text. And now we're going to add the component floating text manager. We need two things in here. First, a text container, which is going to be ourself in this case, because why not? This is a, uh, this would be a waste of game object if we didn't do that. So let's drag and drop floating text. 
put it in the text container but the field is here so in case you want to have something else in another canvas or another container for say a smaller portion of your screen you could also do that here by putting it in the text container so we just made that uh, available though it could have been private and we could have just used that very object next up we need a text prefab and this is where uh, we'll need to do a little bit of work because we don't have a text prefab we never actually tried spawning one on the screen so let's actually right click create a new UI text now we have to make sure that this one complies with everything we need so so let's go ahead and make this as big as we can so maybe 60 in height um, we have to test out because if you go too far away on the font size, say if you put a font size of about um, 55 in this case, this is going to disappear simply because we don't have enough space in height. So if you want to have say a font size of 60, as you can tell now that this, the actual text is not visible, you'll have to up the height of your prefab. Um, I don't think we're ever going to need something as big as that if we have a look on the screen right now. On the game screen this is way too big I'm thinking about an average of maybe 30 in between 20 and 30 so maybe 25 and that will do the job for me let's also make sure we have enough space in width let's say we write the long text such as hello little boy it's now your time to shine let's see how much width we need for this about 300 would be fine. Um, I don't think we're going to have text that big though. So 300 in width, 70 in height. That is what I'll be using. And I'll make sure this text is centered on both axis. And I think that's pretty much it. So this could be our text prefab right here. Once you're satisfied with your text prefab, I'm going to rename it to floating text. This is going to be the floating text manager. And that floating text object, the one with the, um, the text component on it, is going to be dragged and dropped inside of the prefab folder. This way, we now have a prefab. Just like we have a chest prefab, we now have a floating text prefab, which means if I delete it, I can simply drag and drop a new floating text in there, and it's going to be an exact same copy of what we just did. That being said, we are now ready to add it to our new field, text prefab and try this out in the game. Right. At the moment, I don't think anything is going to crash, so nothing crashes. The only problem is we never really do anything, so we never really um, call the show text function. Let's do that with the chess. Why not start with the chess? We're going to go down here where it says grant 10 pesos, or you know, you go back directly in your chess.cs file, and instead of doing this debug.log, we're going to do a game manager instance show text and let's actually send the text that we need to send so for this one I'll just do a plus sign plus the real amount so pesos amount and then pesos exclamation mark so that's going to be my text in the end it's gonna be something like we had so plus five pesos like this oh we might want to add a space so it looks like this now, what kind of size do we want? I'm going to go with 25. We just said 25 is perfect, so let's use that. Um, in terms of color, since we gain currency, I'm going to go for a bright yellow. So just color that yellow. In case you want to have your own custom color, you can create a new um, color definition like this and just send in your RGB, as you can say here. They are not 255 base, so it's a number in between 0 and 1. It's not a number in between uh, 1 or sorry, 0 and 255, so it's in between 0 and 1. In our case, like I said, color that yellow is going to do the job here. What else? We have the position. We're going to use the position of the chest, so transform.position, because of course, we are in chess.cs, so transform is going to equal to our own transform, in this case, in our own transform as chess is, of course, the chess transform. Motion, okay, so that is if we want to see the text move up down, left, or in any direction you want. In our case, it would be fun to have a slight up motion. So we're going to say vector3.up, and we're going to say times 100. The reason I'm doing 8 times 100 here is because we are in screen space, and that is 
over a second, that should be 100 pixel up. That might be a little bit too much now that I think about it, say 50. So every second, we're going to gain 50 pixel in height. Next up, we have the duration. So how long do we want to say or display that text? Let's go for three seconds in this case. Everything in here is tweakable. As you can see, you just mess around with the parameter in case you don't like it. So let's play this game, see how it looks directly in the game. Oh, we have a no reference exception, and that is because I think our game manager doesn't have the floating text manager. So let's make sure we fix that by drag and dropping it in the field. Second attempt. Plus 10 pesos. As you can tell, this is wonderful. Now, it lasts way too long. It might go up for... <laughs> Uh, it, it might go up a little bit too fast and it lasts too long, so let's go back and tweak it. Like I said, we're allowed to tweak everything. We have everything we need here. Let's put that on 1.5 second. Make sure he goes up by 25 pixel. And this is it. So plus 10 pesos, plus 5 pesos. And here we go. So that is pretty cool. We have something that works and something that can be used to display the text. So this is actually all we needed for the floating text section. Now we're going to be using this floating text in the future. Once we create our combat system, once we make our little guy here talk, we're going to be using that um, you know, as we progress in the course. But now we have the base done. If we want to actually call this from anywhere, we know we can just do a game manager dot instance show text. All right, guys, I will be seeing you in the next section where we're going to start tackling the combat. Welcome back to another section. In this one, we will tackle the combat system. Now, I understand that there is a couple of things we left there, such as the chest, which does not really grant puzzles right now. We get the nice text, but we don't really have it change in our game manager. So we understand that this is not completed just yet, but we have to move on to the combat and we'll just connect all the dot once the combat is completed. So we're going to jump right into making the combat first. And then, like I said, connect those dot. Today, we are going to go under artwork and actually crop out one of the weapon. Since we're here, we could also crop out multiple weapons since we're going to be able to upgrade it. So I'm going to go to the very top and we will start with a nice wooden sword. Now I'm not quite sure how big we should make this. Let's actually take the biggest weapon there is. Maybe this one over here. And make it the size of the longest weapon. When cropping this weapon, make sure you take the largest one. So this one over here and also the longest one at the same time. So it's going to fit all kind of weapon. I have something that is about 10 by 27 and it should fit everywhere we go. We're going to start with this over here, the wooden sword. Let's call this weapon zero. Once that is completed, we're going to create another one of these box. So 10 by 27. And we're going to move on to the rusty weapon. So that's weapon one. Again, let's move on one more step to the not rusty weapon. Make sure it is 10 by 27. Weapon two, and we are going to fix the crop. Now, we're just going to keep going like that until you feel like you have enough weapon for your game, enough, um, enough of those. I'm going to actually, we have what, zero, one, two, three. I'm going to take this one next. Let's also make sure this 10 by 27. That's weapon number, actually number four, but that's the fifth one. And then I'll move on to the golden weapon down here. Then 27. That is weapon six, or sorry, weapon five. And finally, the last weapon there is going to be is this one. That's for my game, of course. If you want to have something different, you can have something different. And I just realized that this one is a little bit bigger than all of the rest, so I'll go back and actually change that to um, 1030 for every single one of these, because I think this one could fit in a 1030. Yep, it does. So let's make sure we change that to 1030 for everybody. And here we go, okay. Having this completed, we now have sprites for every single weapon we'll be using in this game. You could, of course, went here for daggers, for the hammer, for different colors. 
but these are the six I'll be using, starting from the wooden sword, the rusty sword, the normal one, the normal one with a handle, the long sword, golden one, and the golden long sword. So now that we have these, we are going to create a new script called weapon. This one is always going to be the player's weapon. We're going to make sure that this weapon is actually beneath the player's object. So I'm going to scroll down, find weapon 0, and drag and drop it beneath player. We should now have something like this. The weapon is going to be beneath everything. We have to make sure that it is on the proper layer. So I'll actually go here, add a sorting layer. Let's call that weapon and projectiles, but we'll just use that for weapon right now. And put it on top. You're going to see that it pops up right here. Now we're going to play with the size and the positioning of this, so I think I'll be putting it right next to the head. Um, just be really careful with the size because it is going to be affecting the gameplay as well. And we could be using something like that. Now in terms of the sorting layer, we'll have to fix a lot of the sorting layers in the future, such as um, this bug over here where we're behind the actual chest. It's all a thing we have to fix and we will do that later on. Right now, let's just have a weapon in our hand. And that weapon needs to have a collider as well. So we're going to go here and give it a box collider 2D. If you click on it, you're going to be able to see the whole distance it covers. And this is pretty cool. This is pretty accurate. We want to have it a little bit um, bigger. But if you don't, you can also just reduce it like that. But in my case, I like to have it a little bit bigger. This way it's going to be easier for the player to actually play this game. It is really up to you and your difficulty level in that case. Okay, now let's get started scripting this thing. We're going to go on the weapon and actually add the weapon script to it, the new script we just created. Let's open it up inside of our favorite editor. And guess what we're going to do? We are going to get rid of mono behavior and make this a collidable object. Just like this. Now if you remember, making it collidable means we can override the onCollide function and actually know what this weapon is colliding with, which is going to be really useful um, one, once of course we know which person we're going to attack. Alright, we're going to start with a couple of fields as always. I'm going to start by declaring a little section at the top that I'll call damage structure. Public int damage point. I'll make that equal to 1 at the beginning and then public float push force equal to 2.0. These ones are going to be used once we transfer the information. So once our weapon collide with an enemy, we're going to transfer that information to the enemy to know how much damage he taken. And also we're going to add a push force on top of him so he can um, actually be pushed away from us. Next up, we're going to have a upgrade section because our weapon is upgradable. We start with a wooden one and in the end we're going to have the golden weapon. So we'll go here, make a public int weapon level. I would usually make that private, but we're going to be using it from the game manager as well to do the saving, to do the upgrade, uh, a lot of other things. So this one is going to be public in this case. And also in terms of upgrade, we're going to need the sprite renderer. This is so we can actually change the sprite of our weapon. Just like this. Now the sprite renderer is private, so we need to actually assign it in the start. But if you remember, Inside of the collidable, we already have a start. This one is virtual, so we'll have to override it if we want to use another start. Back on the weapon, we are going to declare a protected override void start. And we'll keep the base.start because we need to assign our box collider, so we have to keep this. Whether we transfer the code right here or we keep base.start, it's up to you. Mine, I'll just like to alternate. I'll just keep this base.start this time. Then we'll make sure we have the sprite renderer is equal to get component type of sprite renderer. Simple. So we're simply getting the component call sprite renderer, which is also on top of our weapon. It's right here. The reason we're doing this is so later we can say, once we upgrade, we can say, okay, now your weapon underscore zero, well, just become weapon underscore one. And then two, three, four, five, and six in the end. Alright, so we have all the field we need right now for basic logic. The next mechanic we'd like to implement is the swing. So a really simple swing, you just swing the weapon in front of you, it is going to attack the people in front of you, and you'd like to you know, take more space in the screen than what it's already taking right now. 
So what we'll be doing is we'll go down here and we'll just add a new section of variables. First one being private float cooldown. So how often can you swing? What is the cooldown? I'll say 0 0.5 here so you can do a swing every 0 0.5 second. Then a private float last swing. This is going to be used with the cooldown to know if you can swing or not. And we will be testing that in a update. So protected override update. Again, we are going to keep the base.update because base.update in this case is the one doing the collision work. We were not allowed to get rid of that. We need that to be running uh, simply because if you don't have that running, then we're never going to be able to call the on collide function, which again, we will need in the future. The only um, kind of mechanic I wanted to add in the update is to check whether or not we're allowed to swing. So if input get key down, and we are actually hitting say spacebar, so key code dot spacebar, spacebar will be our key to attack, to swing, then we'll check if the moment right now, if the time at this moment minus the last time we tried to swing is bigger than the cooldown, that means we can now swing again. So last swing is equal to time dot time, make sure we reset that, and then we will swing. Swing is a function, hasn't been created just yet, so let's go ahead and create one private void swing. Here we go. We will go down here, do a debug.log, and just say swing at the moment. So we have pretty much everything we need. We're only missing one thing in this weapon script. We're missing the override on the onCollide function. So once we do collide um, with the enemies, we're going to have to create something. We're going to have to create some kind of damage structure and send that over to the enemy. We will be taking on this task in the next lesson. Right now I'd like to just go over what we have at this moment. So we have some field at the top here that are going to be bound to the weapon, but they're also going to change once you upgrade. Once you upgrade your weapon, you'd like to increase the damage point, you'd like to increase the push force, so uh, once you do hit your enemy, it's going to be pushed further away, it's going to eat more damage. And then the upgrade right here, some other field we'll be using from outside, really important that uh, we keep them public because the game manager uses it to save and also the upgrade weapon menu we will have in the future is also going to read this value. Sprite renderer is only here so we can have a reference on the weapon and we can just change the sprite, change the visual aspect of it. And finally we have the swings. So these two float over here are for us to just monitor if we're able to swing right now or not. And that's all we do in this script. Right now in this moment, we have a weapon that we can swing every 0.5 seconds and we just have some extra stuff for later. So that's all we have at this moment. In the next lesson, we are going to create the link in between the player and the enemy when it gets it. So you're going to be able to override the on collide function. This way, uh, the weapon you have right now is going to send a message over to the enemy and that enemy can now aid some damage. All right, guys, I will see you in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we are going to create the on collide function. We're going to override the on collide function. This way, our weapon can actually affect the enemies and so on. So we're going to go ahead and lay down the base work here with a protected override. And we're overriding the only function left we have to override, which is on collide. We already overrided the SOT update. Now we're going to do it for on collide. And let's check. Do we need to actually keep the base in here? There's only a debug.log, so we're not going to keep it. Let's actually get rid of it. And at this point, we need to check, is our weapon colliding with another actor, another fighter, another player, another object that moves around and has HP? And we really don't know that until we tag them all. So this is what we'll be doing. We're going to go back in the game engine and make sure that everything that we can actually hit with our weapon has a tag. So let's have a look at the player right now. There is a tag, the tag is on tag, and that's not really cool. We are going to start ordering everything that we can hit with our weapon with a specific tag. We'll call this one fighter, just like this. And let's make sure that the player is now a fighter because he can also get hurt. We can hurt people with our weapon, but the enemies can also hit us, the player. So we have the player in here, we're missing something we can hit. And we could technically put the test NPC in here and just have a, a go at him, but uh, let's go ahead and actually crop out one enemy. 
let's go under the atlas and find some enemy we'd like to kill. So which one would be the best? We need to start with a small one. And I'm gonna choose this one at the top here. This one is really clear, looks good. Let's actually take him. And uh, you could technically put it into a 16 per 16 as well if you wanted. I think everything should fit within a 16, 16 block, so let's have a look. Yeah, everything seems to fit within that, so let's go ahead and use a 16 per 16, and I'll just make sure to hanker it at the bottom. So that's going to be enemy number one, so enemy underscore zero. Let's hit apply, and put this guy somewhere in our map. Why not right here? It doesn't show up simply because it is on the wrong sorting layer, so let's fix that. It's going to be on the actor sorting layer. And we now have our very first enemy. It looks awful, but um, that will be it. Now at this point, we need to put a box collider on this thing. So let's go ahead and do that. Box collider 2D. If we expand it, it should take the proper shape. If you don't like that, let's make sure you actually edit the collider. I'll just take his head in there. Why not? He has quite a big head, so he'll be able to, um, he'll be easy to it anyway. And here we go. Now we have to make sure the tag is fighter and the layer is actor. Okay, so let's go back in our code real quick. And under on collide, we're going to say debug.log collider.name. We're going to have the same exact thing as we had earlier. So let's play this game. As you can tell, our weapon right now. So our weapon is actually hitting our player right now. This is another condition we will have to add in the future. But let's walk toward this thing, see if we also get his name. And as you can tell, in the console.log, you also get the enemy zero. So we, we are able to hit him. And what if we go next to the test NPC? We're still able to hit that guy as well. Now we have to filter both the player and the test NPC. The way we're going to do this is like this. We're going to go inside of the code and wrap this around a if collider.tag is equal equal to fighter that's going to be the first one this should get rid of the test npc but we're still not getting rid of the player because the player has the fighter tag as well so we'll do if collider.name is equal equal to player then we can actually go ahead and transfer our damage structure which we don't have right now but let's just imagine we do with that debug.log so we're going to walk around with our sword and for some reason we are still hitting the player. Why is that? Oh, I actually typed that wrong. The logic is flawed over here. I said if the tag is fighter and if the name is player, we have to actually turn that around to a is not player. Or what I like to do better is to actually say if it is a player, then we just return. Something like this could also work. Okay, alright, so let's try this really quickly in the game. We should not have anything in the log except the enemy zero here. And we don't, as you can tell, it is only the enemy zero. We're not getting the player call, we're not getting the weapon call. Now, if we actually go back on this test NPC, you're gonna see that we still get the weapon and we get the player, but this is for another reason. This is because we never actually change the basic um the basic call inside of the on collide. Now let's go ahead and just add another message to this so we actually know that this is the basic on collide. So we're gonna say something like on collide was not implemented in we'll do this dot name. This way you're going to be able to know which object has not implemented on collide, has not overridden on collide. So if you walk on this guy, you're going to be able to see on collide was not implemented in test NPC. And if you go over to this guy, you're only getting the name because that's the function we override it. Okay, so now what else do we have to do at this point? We actually need to send that message as a structure. So we have the option to send it in many ways. We're going to be using Unity send message function. And to do that, we'll have to wrap everything that we want to tell the enemy into a single class, a single message. To do this, we're going to go back, create a new script. And that new script is going to be called damage. So let's right click, create a new C sharp script, call it damage, and imagine this as the container of your damage. So imagine you're sending out a fire arrow in some game. 
well that that fire arrow is going to contain the amount of damage it's done maybe where it started from to calculate its velocity it's also going to contain uh, who sent it at first so you can attribute the kill to the right person well this is this is kind of what we're doing right here but it's going to be on a smaller scale that damage structure is only going to contain three fields they're all going to be public the first one is going to be a public vector 3 called origin the second one is going to be public int damage amount so how much damage do we transfer and finally a public float push force now um, what we're going to be doing with this is we're going to push the receiver using push force and also the origin so the position of the receiver and the origin we're going to have a direction out of that and then we'll just push that guy using push force we're also going to deduce the amount of hit point he has by damage amount all right so let's go back in the weapon and send this over to the enemy so we are going to create a new damage object and then we'll send it to the fighter with hit. To do this, damage DMG is going to equal to a new damage object. And we can just assign it directly. Of course, we could do damage like this and then say damage dot damage amount is equal to X. But you can also assign it manually just like that. At the same time, you create your object. So let's remove these and just say damage amount is equal to damage point damage point being this thing at the top here also our public field that will be changing and uh, those take comma they don't take a semicolon the origin of the damage is going to be transform dot position so our current player position and then finally the push force equal to our push force let's make sure we put a semicolon on that and we now have our damage structure all that is left is to send this over to the enemy and we can do this this way so collider send message and now we have to send a message you need to send a method name and finally the structure so object value over here so the method name is going to be receive damage the object value is going to be our damage structure and just like this we are now going to send this message over to the enemy this is not going to work just yet because if you have not realized receive damage is not a function we have either on the enemy or on the player itself receive damage does not exist at the moment and it's something that we'll actually address in the next lecture so if you try to run the game right now you'll be able to run around you'll be able to create your damage structure but as soon as you try to send it to the enemy you're going to have this message the send message does not have a receiver that's completely true and in the next lesson we're going to do a little bit of inheritance again to make sure that both our player and the enemy can have this function welcome back to another lesson today we're going to make a script that is going to be inherited from our player and also the enemy this script is going to grant them hit points and also the function receive damage so we can actually complete the mechanic we started in the last lesson so let's go ahead and right click on script, create a new fighter script, open it up in your favorite editor and we're going to keep mono behavior. So our initial mono behavior is going to be uh, inherited from fighter and then player, this thing over here is also going to inherit from fighter. No longer mono behavior, but now we're going through this so we can inherit the following. We're going to need a couple of public fields first one being a public int hit point then we'll have a public int max hit point and finally a public float push recovery speed let's make that 0.2f the hit point could be on say 10 by default hit point is going to be the same and then we're going to have some field for the immunity we want this so this way you can't actually just spam your hits on the enemy or you cannot get corner and just kill instantly so we're gonna have a immune time this way you have like say one second to get out of problem if you are stuck we're also gonna have a last immune so this is going to act the same exact way as the last cooldown and the swing we just implemented on the weapon now a little bit more we're going to have a uh, protected float for the push so protected vector 3 push direction okay so 
At this point, we have all the fields we need. We're going to implement the function. All fighters should be able to receive damage. So all fighter can receive damage and also die. So we're going to need two functions here. One is called receive damage and the other one is going to be death or die. So we're going to start with the first one, protected virtual void, receive damage. And it's going to take in damage structure, just like we sent earlier. Now, um, we're also going to need another function. This one is going to be called death or die. So protected virtual void death. And if you realize, I made those virtual, so in case you want to change things around, in case the player has some kind of special armor or like a shield, you can overwrite that if you want in the player script. Okay, so by default, what should happen if you receive damage? By default, we're going to check if time.time .time minus the last time you've got hit, so last immune, if that one is bigger than immune time, then we're going to allow you to receive damage. So last immune is going to be equal to time dot time. Hit point is going to be minus equal to damage dot damage amount. And then the push direction is going to be equal to some kind of formula we're going to create right now. So we want to have the direction in this case, the direction you should be pushed towards to. Now the damage structure contains the origin of your damage, but it does not contain your position. You're going to have to calculate that yourself by doing a transform dot position minus damage dot origin. This way you can now have the vector in between you two, normalize it, and add it to the damage dot push source. This way you're going to have your vector normalized and then we'll multiply it by the amount of push force the weapon uh, the enemy use to push you. Okay. So just like this we should have everything we need in the receive damage. Uh, we're also going to be creating a little check down here. So if your hit point goes below or equal to zero, let's actually call death. So if it goes below really far, like minus four, minus six, let's make sure we reset that to zero, but we're also gonna be calling the death function. Something we'd like to add just in between here is some kind of cosmetic, some kind of visual effect to let you know that you've been hit. So we could add particle effect in the future, but right now the only thing we have that we can put is the show text. Remember, we have this nice floating text thing. So we'll say game manager, that instance, show text and now the message is going to be damage damage amount to string so we're actually removing that amount and then we'll say um, the font size could be something like 15 color could be red the position is going to be our position and the motion could be a vector 3.0 in this case we don't really want it to move why not we could have it for say 0 0.5 seconds on the screen. All right, so now to make this work in the game, we're going to need a proper receiver. Right now we have a receiver on the player, that is totally fine, but we don't have one on the enemy. So let's go ahead and create a enemy script as well, since we're here. We're going to create a new C-sharp script, call it enemy, put it on our enemy underscore zero, go in the script and make sure it inherits from fighter. We're going to wipe these two functions, just leave it like that, and now try this out, see if it does work. Once we're playing the game, we're gonna run into that enemy, and it's gonna say one, as you can tell. Really small one, we could increment the size of it, and it should actually work just fine. Okay, so at this point, the enemy should be, should be down in HP. If we have a look here on the right-hand side, the enemy has three hit points. And as we keep running into it, you're going to see the hit point go down. So now it reaches zero, it should have called the dev function, which does nothing right now. We also have a bunch of warning over here, so let's double click on one and check out what is wrong. It mentions that we're trying to create a new mono behavior object, and the best way to create a mono behavior object is to do a instantiate. Now they are totally correct, we should not be doing it this way. Uh, if it is a mono behavior object, but in, in our case, it doesn't have to be. So I will go back on the damage structure over here and actually get rid of mono behavior. And you know what? We can even turn this into an actual real structure since we're here. This way we don't have anything to worry about anymore. We won't get that warning anymore. 
So let's try and run this once more. And here we go, we get the plus one on this little guy. So I'm going to go back on the fighter real quick, uh, implement a bigger font size, so say 25. This way we should be able to see it a little bit better. So we did one damage to this guy. Okay, so now this enemy is finally taking damage. Of course it doesn't fight back, of course we're not getting any damage. Um, but at least we made a really good step towards making this combat system work. And we finally have some damage on the enemy. He receives our messages. In the next lesson, we are going to add another layer to our inheritance. Um, in this case, we're going to be adding something called mover in between fighter and player. This way we can have mover, have object move around, and enemy can inherit from that as well. So now both thing can move, the enemy can start moving um, as he wants once we're done implementing this. So I will see you in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson guys. Today we are going to implement another layer in the inheritance tree. So we're gonna go and open up player and actually make sure we get rid of most of the code in here in the fix update. We're going to be delegating that to another script that we'll call mover. So we're going to right click on script Call this one mover, and this one is going to inherit from fighter. So everything that move can also fight in this case, which might not always be the case uh, since you might have NPC that are only there to help you. But if that ever happens, we can make them immune forever by overriding couple of fields. Okay, so in here, we're basically going to take whatever it was that we had in player, um, everything that was used to move around, we're going to put it in here. So let's have a look at what exactly that was. We have the move delta, the box collider, and the hit. This is all used to move. Then we might add some more such as the speed in X, the speed in Y. We're going to be moving that. So let's actually take all of this actually. Well, you know what? Let's actually take everything. So let's scrap everything that is inside of the player and put it in the mover object. There's gonna be a couple of things we need to remove such as the, um, the inputs over here simply because the enemy is not going to be using these. So let's go through that quickly. We're gonna need a bus glider, that's fine. We're gonna need the move delta, that's also fine. A hit. We're gonna need a protected float. Y speed. We'll put that on something like 0 0.75. Protected float. X speed. I'll leave that on 1. So we're going to have the same exact speed as we had before, except when we're going up and down. Let's also make sure that everything else, all of these other fields, are now protected because we might want to be using them in player. Now the start is going to stay the exact same, though we're going to make it so you can override it. So protected, virtual void, start. Now the update is going to be quite different. What I'd like to do is actually split the whole updating of the player position and um, actually keep it somewhere else. So what I'll do is I'll just take everything in here except the inputs. I will be creating a new function and I'll call this one protected virtual void update motor. This one is going to take in a vector3 input and this is what is going to differentiate the player from the NPC. The NPC is going to have something pre-calculated. We're going to send it the input it wants to go in and the player is going to be uh, having the keys we send him through the inputs. Now I will make sure to copy everything we've had in the past and just put it inside of the update motor. Whatever we were receiving at the top here is now input. So when we say move delta is equal to a new vector with the inputs in it, we replace that completely by the input field we receive in parameter. The same exact logic is applied, everything works as it was working in the past. Now we have to do something about the fix update. And I really don't feel like doing anything with it to be honest since no mover object is going to be put on the field. So what I'm saying by this is that no object is going to have the mover.cs script on it. Everything's going to be either player or enemy. And these two are going to inherit from mover. But mover itself, I don't think we'll ever see that. In fact, if we are certain that we're not going to be seeing the mover script anywhere, what we can do is make this class abstract. By putting this abstract, what is going to happen is that you're not going to be able to drag and drop this on any object from now on. 
it has to be inherited from else it just won't work. So let's go ahead and grab these two over here, crop them out, remove the fix update and go in our player object. We are of course going to change that for mover. Now don't worry we actually keep the fighter as well because mover inherits from fighter so it looks something like this. And then so on so behavior object blah blah blah. And what we'll be doing in here is we'll create a private void fix update and in that fix update we'll say well float x is equal to our input float y is equal to our input and then we'll do a update motor with those inputs so new vector 3 x y and then 0 and just like this we should be able to transfer all the code we had in the past and our player should behave the exact same as it did so let's actually try this out in the game see if we haven't broken anything and everything still worked just as it was working before. So this is fairly cool. Um, one thing we haven't implemented though is the Y speed. So we still go at the same exact speed as we were going before. So I'll go back in here and I'll make sure to change that. As we reset the move delta with input, we're going to change that and actually allow us to change the speed of both X and Y at the same time. So I'll go in here, create a new vector 3 and use input.x and I'll do times X speed and then input dot y times y speed and finally zero on the z-axis. This way we'll be able to implement the speed in here and we should not be going as fast up and down as we're going left and right, which is the case right now, I can feel it. We don't go as fast up and down as we go left and right. And everything should be back normal. We now manage to create a layer in between our fighter and our player. We will be applying this layer on the enemy object in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson guys. Today we're going to have a look at the enemy and how to give it some kind of AI, give it some kind of logic to run towards our player. Something very very simple and it's going to require a lot of fields but we're going to make it work in, um, in a really easy way. So it's not going to be that complicated to understand but it's going to be big in code. So let's actually get started right away by opening up the enemy script. At the very top of our script, we want to change the fighter to mover. We are now inheriting from mover because our enemy is now able to move. Now, um, there could be another thing in here. We could create a target dummy that could die and uh, you know have a hit point, have the receive damage function that would not necessarily move. So you could create some kind of target hit point, uh, sorry, target um, dummy.cs and just make it inherit from fighter. That could also work. But right here we're talking about a real enemy that is going to move on the map. So let's actually code this right now. We're going to start with the experience little section. All we have to do for the experience is declare an amount of XP this target is going to be worth. So in this case, 1 XP for this target. This is public, so it can be changed directly in the inspector. Now in terms of the logic, we're going to create a couple of logic fields in here. First one being public float, trigger length I'll put that on one and then a public float chase length and i'll put that on five the trigger length is going to be one meter that means if the distance in between the enemy and the player is less or equal to one meter we're going to make it so he starts chasing you now how long is he going to chase you for he's going to chase you for five meters and if you exit that initial range of where he was and um where you're going right now if that length is bigger than 5 then he's going to go back to where he belongs. Those are the simple logic we'll be adopting for this very very simple enemy. We're then going to need some private field, private boolean chasing, so are we chasing right now? Um, also another private boolean colliding with player and I'll tell you what this is in a second and private transform, player transform, oops and in a private vector 3, the starting position. Okay, so chasing is going to be a boolean to know whether or not the enemy is chasing the player right now. Colliding with player is going to be um, a way to know if currently you're colliding with the player. Now if you are colliding with the player, don't move, just keep on, stay there, you're going to be uh, hitting him anyway. Um, if you're not colliding with the player, that's fine, you can go towards him, but if you are already colliding, don't go towards him, it's going to create some awful bug, it's going to be um, really hard to test collision at that point. 
So we're going to make sure this one stops there. And that will be all handled through our logic that we're about to lay down right now. Now before we go any further, we also need one more section and that's going to be a section that is about the enemy's weapon. Remember the player has its own weapon, it is a whole different class. It is going to be the same exact thing for the enemy, but this one is going to be a hitbox. Since the, the enemy doesn't have a weapon in its hand, it's not swinging at you, it's only going to be there and dangerous if it touches you. So we're going to use the hitbox right here. Now that hitbox is going to have an additional collider, so private box collider 2d that's going to be the hitbox and then we'll have also uh, to do some collision detection and here we cannot inherit from collidable unfortunately so we'll have to create our own little logic in here and you'll see why um, the reason we can't inherit from collidable is because we're already inheriting from something and that is that is just part of uh, C sharp so we cannot have multi inheritance we're simply going to duplicate that very small chunk of code so to, to actually have this uh, colliding mechanic work, we're going to need a collider array, collider 2D array, call it hits, new collider array of 10. We're going to do the same exact thing as we've done for the weapon, for the chess, for the NPC, and such. So now that we have all the field we need, we are going, before we go in and um, type in the start, the update, and everything else we need, we're gonna go and create that hitbox we're talking about. So we already have the player hitbox, the enemy hitbox, which is just the size of its head at the moment. We are going to create an additional hitbox on top of that that is going to be the uh, damage hitbox. So let's go on the enemy. We have it right here. I'm going to call him small enemy. So small enemy. And beneath him, then I'm going to create a new 2D object, a new sprite. We don't have to keep the sprite renderer, actually, we don't really want to put anything in there. Um, just temporarily, I'm going to put the chest, I'm going to add a box collider, and then I'll remove the sprite renderer. This way I can have a proper size collider. Now we're going to shape this collider bigger than the small one, so bigger than just the head, and we'll be able to see them both in action in a second. So let's call this one hitbox. Now click on the small enemy, you should be able to see the two collider. One of them is really hard to tell right now, you can only see it through the eye really. But the head shape is going to be where you, you're allowed to hit this small enemy and the, the whole box around it is a hitbox. So if that touches your player, you are in trouble. We could actually do it this way so it's a little bit easier for the player. The head over here would be the hitbox and the head inside, so the white part could be where your sword has to hit. Uh, in order to be a real hit. Okay, now our hitbox are ready. We're going to start laying down the logic and we have a couple uh, line of code to do that. We're gonna start with a protected override virtual void, actually protected override void uh, start, not dev, start. And in the start, we'll do a base.start because we still wanna be using what's in the base. So we still wanna have the box collider from the mover. And then what we will be doing is getting assigning some of these at the top here. So we'll be assigning the player transform, the start position, and also the hitbox. Let's start with the um, the player transform. Player transform. Now the player transform is going to be equal to the transform component on the player. And there is multiple way to do this. You could say game object fine player dot transform. We could do we could do game manager instance player dot transform. You know, you can find your transform in multiple different ways if you want to. We'll keep this one. It's cool because we assign it manually through the game manager. Next one is going to be the start position. It's going to be equal to transform dot position. This is called on the start. So wherever you place your enemy in your map, that is going to be their starting position as soon as the game is launched. Then we have the hitbox, and this one. It's a little bit complicated because if we do a get component uh, box collider 2D, this is going to return us our box colliders, the little head, the place where we can get hit, not the hitbox. The hitbox is actually below us on a children. So we'll do transform get child at the index 0, the first children, and then we'll do a get component. This way, it's going to do this exact same thing here. So it's going to go, it's going to start from the small enemy. 
and say, okay, we want to get the first children, so let's go down. And then do a bus glider 2D, so we grab this one. Next up, we are going to override the fix update. So protected, override, void, fix update. And I don't see it here, so... Oh, right, we didn't actually include it in the mover. So we have just to create a private void fix update. That will do the job. I was about to override it, but I realized that we did not put one in the mover. We just completely got rid of it since it's now abstract. So in our private void update, well, we have to de-update motor at one point. So let's actually leave it somewhere here. Update motor, vector 3 to 0 for now. So we're updating the position of the enemy. Right now, we still don't know what's going to be in the input. Okay, now at this point, we're going to have to look, is the player in range? And if he is not, well, we don't have to move because the player is not anywhere close. We don't need to chase him. So what we will be doing here is check whether or not the player is in between um, our starting position and the biggest distance of the chase, so the chase length. We'll do that using a vector3.distance. So if vector3.distance in between the player transform dot position and also our start position, if that is smaller than, let's say, the chase length, then we can go ahead and check, are we chasing him right now? Because this is going to be possible from 5 meters away. However, we want this to be, um, we only want the trigger to be at 1 meter. But if you go away while he is triggered, while he's chasing you, you will be able to run for 5 meters before the chase stops. So we're going to do another if check in here. If the vector 3 dot distance using the player transform dot position and also our start position, if that is smaller than the trigger length, then at this point, chasing or chase or whatever the boolean was, so chasing, it's going to be equal to true. Or if you prefer, what you can do is also say, remove the if statement and just say, chasing is going to equal to the result of this condition. Now, if we are chasing, so if chasing, now let's assume that we are chasing the player. If we are chasing the player, we're going to say if we are not colliding with him, if we do not collide with the player, let's update the motor in such a way that we're going to run towards him. So we're going to say update motor, and we're going to use a directional vector using player transform dot position minus the transform dot position dot normalize, and just leave it like that. So it's going to go in the direction of the player. Now, if we are not chasing, we'll do an else statement. And that else statement is simply going to be update motor with the start position minus the transform dot position. So we go back to where we were. Okay. Now, if the player was not in range in the first place, we have to reset the chasing. We have to reset this thing here. So we'll do an else statement and we'll say update motor start position minus transform that position again. So we're going back the same exact way and we'll say chasing is now equal to false. And we won't need this thing anymore. So whatever happens, we are updating the motor. The only thing missing in this algorithm is the colliding with player. So we never really know whether or not we are colliding with the player. And this is something we'll check inside of the fix update. So just after everything is done, we're going to check for overlap, so check for overlaps. And we're going to say colliding with player is going to be equal to false at the beginning. And then we'll actually do the exact same thing we've done in the collidable. So if we go here, I'm going to grab this thing, go back on my enemy.cs, and paste it down here. So box collider, overlap collider. Um, do we have a filter right now? I don't believe we declared a filter. We should have declared a filter. I don't believe we declared a filter, so let's go back and declare one. We're actually going to need one. So um, in the hitbox over here, we'll say filter 2D. So contact filter 2D, call it filter. And now that should work. Then we're going to do the exact same thing as we were doing before. If the hits are null, uh, we don't do anything. Now, instead of doing a on collide, we're going to do our condition right in here. If hits at the index i dot tag, is equal equal to fighter so if we're colliding with another fighter n 
hits at index i dot name if that fighter is player then we are colliding with the player so colliding with player is going to be equal to true and again we make sure we clean up the array once we're done okay so that should be it for the um, actual logic behind our enemy we are going to need one last thing and that one last thing is going to be um, to reward the player when he kills the enemy so we're going to override again another function so public override def and once this thing dies so as soon as the enemy dies we're going to destroy it so destroy game object so now the game object the enemy is out of the game it's out of the actual scene that's quite good but that's not really um, satisfying we're gonna need more than that and what I mean by that is we're going to need to first create some kind of way that we can give XP to our player so we can say game manager instant experience is plus equal to the XP value that could be it and also let the player know that we gave him XP by showing text so game manager instance show text and we can do something like a plus sign then the XP value give a space call it XP and say font size is gonna be 30 color could be magenta transform that position vector 3 dot up this one could go up by say 40 and it can last a full second okay so a lot of code we haven't tested this out hopefully everything works in one go let's go in the game and this little guy over here should be triggered in a second you will be able to see it there is the maximum amount of hit point which is 10 a little bit too much so let's go ahead and reduce that to say um, 2 or 3 the push recovery speed is not going to do anything right now since we have not implemented it in um, the mover but we'll do that in a second as well XP value could be 1 uh, trigger length is fine chasing is fine so if we start playing this technically oh it is actually running towards me so that that is kind of bad at the moment but let's see if we can do something with that so I just realized that one is quite a big number in this game this game is quite small if you remember we had to uh, scale it down to 0 0.16 so this is a very very small game let's go ahead and change the trigger length to something like 0 0.3 um, and the chase length could be a full meter now a full meter for this game is something like this starting this position and going there okay so the position it was at the beginning to where it was right now that's a full meter now 0 0.3 we should not be in it technically we might be okay so we're not if we get a little bit closer it's gonna do something it should be doing something hmm so there is definitely some kind of mistake here but we did kill him we did get one XP uh, does it actually work is it actually showing in the game manager yep we have the plus one experience over here now we just have to fix this whole um, chasing mechanic which is not working as intended at the moment all right so I found what the problem was over here I've made a little mistake so I said chasing is equal to this but that's not actually true um, we want to make sure that chasing is only set to true here because we have our own place where we set it to false so we only set it to false if we're outside of the chase length in this case if we do it this way it triggers it actually puts it back on false if it's outside of the trigger length so we don't want that we are going to change this turn this into a if statement and then say that if this is true we're just gonna say it's equal to true we're never going to set it on false um, at this point this way what this is going to give us is this behavior over here so we have a trigger length that is a 0 0.3 which would be just about here where my cursor is and then he can chase me for 3 meters which is I think the whole screen in this case so as you can tell he chased me everywhere we go now um, he still doesn't hurt me I can I can hurt him by doing pretty much anything just turning around is gonna kill him right now um, but we're gonna be creating a weapon for this guy in a moment but at this moment um, if we actually go back into values put that on say chase length could be on 1 and test this out this is going to happen right here so if we go too far away he goes back to his starting position so that is what we could actually do with this guy uh, in terms of giving ourselves some XP as you could tell it did work so I'm going to choose my game manager 
experience he's on zero right now we fight him we get one point we have one experience the text was shown and the enemy got destroyed in the next lesson we're going to fix these two problems first off we cannot get hit from the enemy only us the player can hit the enemy it's not the other way around and second we're never getting pushed away so if we do hit the enemy or if the enemy hits us um, the person that got hit should be pushed away by the weapon. We should actually have a little bit of sliding in the opposite direction. So this is what we'll be doing in the next lesson, guys. I will be seeing you there. Welcome back to what should be the final lesson of the combat section. So in the previous episode, we made the combat work a little bit. We still needed the player to hit us and also have some kind of pushback, which is what we're going to implement right now. We're going to start with the fact that the player can never hit us. The reason he can never hit us is because he doesn't have a weapon. The weapon should be his head, but right now it's not doing much. So what we will be doing is to turn this hitbox over here into a weapon. How are we going to be doing that? It is quite simple. We're going to start by adding a new component, call it enemy hitbox, and that's going to act as the quote weapon. Let's open this one up and we're going to inherit from collidable. So again, this Collidable class is coming um, to save us all from writing that big, long code we don't want to write every time. Okay. So at the top, we're going to have a damage section, public int damage, and then we're going to need a public int, or we could do a float here, push force. That's all. <laughs> That's all we need in here. That's our simple weapon. At this point, we need to override. So once we do collide with something, we override the on collide. And we do not need the base. Remember, the base is only debug.log, a really annoying one. Um, so we don't need that in this case. We need to check whether or not we've hit the player. So if collider.tag is equal to fighter and the call.name is equal, equal to player, in that case, we are 100% sure that we hit the player. We could have only did that, but like... Uh, with the fighter tag, we also have a additional confirmation. So it's up to you. You might want to remove this. It's, it does not really matter. It's just an additional check in case you have another object called player. Okay. So we're going to create a new damage object, of course, before sending it to the fighter we've hit. In this case, the player. So to the player. Same exact thing as we did for the sword. So where is the sword at? Where is the weapon.cs at? We're going to be taking this and copying it in the enemy hitbox. I think that's it. I think we actually got all we needed. Let's make sure we match those. So damage amount is going to be equal to our damage right here. Um, transform the position, that's fine. Push force is also fine. And we send a message. Receive message is the same exact function as the one the player has. So we're actually done. We actually created a weapon just like this. It took what it took even two minutes, three minutes, and we're already good to go. So let's actually play this. I'm gonna get close to this thing. And if you look on the left hand side over here, we are getting hit by uh zero. <laughs> this this thing doesn't have any damage on us. Let's actually bump up the damage, shall we? Let's put that on one. Hey, we are now hitting one damage at the time. Let's put that on five eating 5 damage at a time, and we should pretty much be dead by then if we have a look at our player. Player script, 0 hit point. We never override the def function on our player. We don't do that just yet. We'll do that uh, later on during this course, but we are dead. The only thing left to this thing is some actual uh, feedback, more than just a little 5 on top of us. We need to have something else. In this case, that is going to be the push. To implement the push is going to be so simple. We're going to head over to our mover script because this is where you would implement something that goes in both the player and also the enemy. Now, what we're going to do is right here, after checking the sprite direction, we're going to say add push vector if any. So if there is a push vector, we're going to add it. We'll say move delta is plus equal to push direction. Now, push direction comes in directly from the fighter. So fighter knows if we have a push direction and and that's really all we need to do. Now a uh, push direction is going to be set once but we never reduce it which means that um, if we get hit once we're going to start flying in a direction 
forever. Let's actually give it a try, see if it actually does that. <laughs> um, I'm going to go here, I'll push the NPC away, and he's being pushed in that direction forever. We're of course missing some kind of mechanic in here where um, that push vector needs to be reduced every single frame. So we'll go back again in the mover and we'll reduce the push force every frame based off the recovery speed. So this is why we do have the recovery, um, the push recovery speed on both the enemy and the player. So we have it in the fighter, I think. We're going to say push direction is going to be equal to a vector 3 dot lerp. We lerp in between the position uh, sorry, the direction we're going with our push and also vector 3.0 and hopefully eventually we can achieve vector 3.0 so push recovery speed. Let's give this a try now. Say we go here, he's gonna run into us and then be pushed by the sword and he barely got pushed but as you can tell he got pushed a little bit. Let's actually change the values so my sword has a bigger push force, maybe 3 or even 4 and let's see my player has a push recovery of 0 0.2 now the enemy his hitbox needs damage so let's go here put one push for us let's put that on say 0 point or maybe 2 I don't know how much is enough we'll actually try it out until it works okay, so I do I do get push as you can tell like gently push at the moment we might need more than that, so bigger numbers here, but we do get push and that is some good feedback. So what if we go back in the enemy and actually give it some proper values at the top here? Actually the enemy hitbox. So damage could be equal to 1 by default and push force. Um, it could be equal to something like maybe 5 could be good. I'm really wondering if 5 is enough. And we can actually tone down our recovery speed as well on the player, so maybe 0 0.1. This is going to cause us to slide a little bit more than what we were sliding before. So let's try this. It's really hard not to hit the, the actual enemy because the sword is always in front. So what if we actually disable the sword for a moment? Yeah, we do get push. So we get push fairly good and we can always come back like extremely fast because we have some push recovery speed. Um, and of course, if we just tone that down even more, like 0 0.02, it's going to be harder and harder to come back. You're going to slide for a long time, which is not really what we want. This looks really awful. So let's go and put that back on one. What we'll want to change if we want to be pushed further is simply the push force. So what if the enemy has a push force of 10? Okay, that is obviously a little bit too much. By default, we put it on 5. And that is, again, a little bit too much. Maybe if we change our push recovery speed back to 0 0.2. This does make a little bit more sense, um, you know, but we're still jumping around a little bit too much. So I'm thinking about reducing the hitbox to, say, 3. 3 could be good, and the player recovery could be at 0 0.2. Those value you can play around as much as you want uh, until you have something that feels really good. Okay, so at this point we pretty much completed these two tasks. There is one thing that I haven't done just yet and that we'll actually tackle in the next section. It's going to be how to use the animator to make this thing swing. Right now we have a weapon in our hand but it never swings so uh, it just stands in front of us and it hits the enemy because it's, it's just there. But in the next section we are going to actually learn how to use the animator in Unity to make sure that this thing swings. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching and I will be catching you in the next section. Welcome to a new section. In this one we are going to learn more about the animator and also the animation window in Unity. If it is your first time using a keyframe kind of system, you're going to experience something that is quite cool, something we use in video editing, something we use in animation and a bunch of other places and uh, I think that's going to be quite interesting if you haven't ever used a software like that before or some kind of system that use keyframes. So we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to put that in my script folder for some reason it was out and we're going to go in the artwork folder. Now under the artwork folder there's this folder called animation 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to create a swing animation for the sword. We're going to be using the animator and we're also going to be using custom animation that we'll make by hand. So we're going to go under player, then weapon, and we're going to go in add component, add a component type of animator, and now we have to create a new animator. So we'll go beneath animation, right click, create, animator controller, that's the name of it, and we'll call it weapon. Let's go back on weapon, make sure that the controller field over here is our brand new weapon animator controller, and then we can start animating this thing. So let's double click on the sword. This is going to zoom in your view and you'll see it in the scene view. I'll just make sure to make a lot of room for this one. Then I will go under window and find the animation window or you could hit control and six. We now have the animation window somewhere. Uh, it is currently on my second screen but it should actually pop up in yours if you only have one monitor and you can actually anchor it somewhere. Um, I put mine just beneath the scene view. Okay, so right now, while we have the weapon selected, you're going to see that it's going to ask you, if you don't have the weapon selected, it's going to ask you to create an animator and an animation clip. If you go under weapon, you're going to see that it doesn't ask you to create an animator because we already have one. So weapon is our animator controller. Now we are going to create an animation clip. Let's say create, call this one weapon underscore swing and we're going to drag and drop it in our animation folder okay so that is the very first step the second step is going to be to keyframe this thing now this is where you're going to get creative and create the animation for your sword uh, remember we have a cooldown on our sword where it says we can only swing every half a second so we had the 0.5 f for the uh the cooldown time so we can only swing twice a second so I'll make my animation 30 seconds now what I will do is I will actually click on the recording sign as soon as you hit the recording sign whatever you do here whatever you do in the inspector is gonna be as you can tell um, put there in the animation window so you gotta be really careful what you do once you click on that let me just revert it we are currently recording and I want to make sure that this is the beginning frame so this is where we start our very first animation. I'm going to be putting a keyframe in here. So let's hit add keyframe. Now I will be putting a keyframe in here. So let's make sure that at the very beginning, we save the position of this thing. We save the scale and the rotation. So we could do add property, transform and just get them all. Or what I'd like to do is just slightly move them. Just like if I was replacing them, uh, slightly rotate then reset the rotation back to zero and you can also slightly scale. This way, once you modify that, everything is going to be uh, turning red and these fields will now be keyframe. All right, so now before we go any further, let's have a look at what exactly is this keyframe system we're talking about. Most, if not all of the keyframe system, they all use three different things. First, you need a timeline. In this case, we have a time in between zero and one second. Now we could zoom out, as you can tell, I can go up to 10 seconds, I can go up to as many, as many seconds as I want, but we'll actually keep that in between 0 and 0 0.3, like we said, because we have a cooldown of 0 0.5. Now I'll be removing these two, I don't know why they are here, but we're going to go back to the default settings, where we only have the initial keyframe. So first, we have the timeline. Second, we have these over here on the left hand side. So these are the properties we're going to change. And now every single one of those properties are going to have keyframes. So first, timeline, second, properties, and then keyframe. It is fairly simple way. It is going to work like this. So assuming that you have your timeline, you decide that at 0 0.3 seconds, you want the sword to be looking like this. Well, since we're using the record mode right here, it's quite simple. All we have to do is move it while being here. But what's really happening down here is that it creates a new keyframe for every single thing we saw and it just assigns a value match to a certain time. So at 0 0.3, the sword has to look like this. Like no matter what happens, the sword has to look like this. Now, the really cool thing is that they'll do interpolation for us. So in between these two points, there's going to be a smooth transition the whole time. So let's actually give it a try. Let's create a real animation. 
we said to ourselves we only want 0 0.5 second of animation. So that is it over here, 0 0.3. What we're going to do is take all of those keyframe. I will hit copy and then paste. So whatever happens in here, um, you know, it happens. But then once the animation is over, once the animation is done, I want the sword to go back to its initial state. So our animation has to fit within these keyframes. So we'll do everything in here. Now in video game animation, we want something that is very, very fast. You want something that is extremely responsive. So once you press on the button, you should be able to have the, uh, the, the sword fully extended like a matter of few frames. I'm going to go with 0 0.5 frames. I want to have a full extension of the sword at 0 0.5. Now we are currently recording at the moment, so we'll actually just move it in the scene view and it will be automatically giving us keyframes at the end here. So the full extension could be something like that. I'm just improvising a little bit. And then it would retract over time. We could actually move this a little bit towards the 10. And here it is. So if we play this, you're going to be seeing the animation. Now I'm going to do a little bit of modification because I'd like the sword to actually hit uh, down here as well. So I'll try and create something that goes a little bit beyond that. So say over here. And we'll just try really, really hard to make this look good. So I'll actually move that. Like this could be a lot better. It does look weird though, but <laughs> the more we work on our animation, the more um, we can make this look good. But I will be keeping this like that for now. As you can tell, we cover most of the zone in front of us, which is uh, what I wanted in the first place. If you just pop the collider, you're going to be able to see which zone it covers exactly. Okay, so now this is what happens when you swing your sword. This is what happened visually. The cool thing about Animator and the animation in Unity is that you can actually add more property that are not really something visual. You can actually add more things that don't have anything to do with the visual. Let's actually give this a try. So what we're going to do here is turn on the collider only when we're swinging the sword. So you remember earlier when we were actually just uh, going to the enemy over here and it was automatically hitting him. We're going to disable that. If you want to hit the enemy, you need to have your swing and you need to you know, deal damage to him when you press on spacebar, not when you just walk up to him. So here is what we're going to do. We're going to hit the record button at the very beginning and say, as soon as we're ready to enable the collider, which could be like right at the beginning over here, we're going to make sure you're on record. We're going to toggle off the box collider and then toggle it on again, which is gonna create a keyframe over here and it also created another keyframe at the beginning let's make sure we remove that one we do not want to have that one at all costs so at this point assume that the collider is off here it is going to be forced to be turned back on now once we're done with the full swing we're actually still while recording we're going to turn it off which means that if it is off here it's going to be forced to be enabled on that frame it stays enabled this whole time and then finally on the last frame it is going to turn off. Okay, so let's turn off the recording and let's also turn off the box collider by default. So there is no box collider here at the beginning but as soon as you click that keyframe you're then gonna have one. Next thing we need to do is to create a idle state. The idle state is going to make sure you're back on the normal settings, so the settings you had prior to swinging. And it is just some kind of safe thing to do because, you know, you already go back to the default setting at the end of this animation. But we have to make sure um, it is actually 100% sure because sometimes you might be cancelled in the middle of your animation uh, by some other state we could be calling. So let's create another animation over here. We're going to click on Weapon Swing from the animation window and create a Weapon Idle. And all we'll be doing in this Weapon Idle is a single frame. Now let's hit Record. I'm going to slightly move the weapon and then put it back exactly where it was. Uh, rotation, same thing. Or we could go down here, you know, like add, rotation, add, scale, 
And finally, there's one more thing we enable and disable, the box colliders. Let's make sure we disable that here and we leave it disabled. Okay, so that should be our idle. As you can tell, we have weapon idle. This is a position right here. If we hit play, you're going to be seeing it in the game. All these fields that turn blue, including this little checkbox over here, they're all things that are going to be affected by animation. If you go back on swing, same thing here. They all turn blue because they're going to be affected by the animation. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to learn how to connect these animation to our code to actually call them once we need them. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we're simply going to learn how to connect our code to the animation we just created in the last lesson. Now, it is fairly simple. We're going to start by creating a graph in Mechanim. To do that, we need to open up the Mechanim window. There is two ways to do it. You can either go under Window and go under Animator, which is going to open this up, or you can simply double click on your animator, which is weapon right here. So that's our animator controller. At this point, you should be seeing your two animations. Sometimes they do pop up. If you have done your animation in some kind of different fashion, they might not even be there in the first place. If you don't see them, go ahead and right click, create a new state for every single one of these. Right now we only have two. And rename those state using the inspector at the top right. This one would be weapon idle and we're going to make sure to connect the motion. This is only a animation state. It's not actually going to link to our weapon idle we have down here. So we have to make sure we put the motion weapon idle in here. Now we're going to do the same exact thing for the weapon swing and also change the motion. From here, you're going to see a pretty, pretty easy to understand graphic flow. Entry is as soon as the game starts. What happened when the game starts? Well, weapon idle is what happens when the game starts. Now, if this arrow is actually pointing towards swing like this, make sure you right click on the proper state, the proper one that should be executed when the game starts. And you're going to turn this into the default state. Okay. Now, what happens at this point is that the sword enters this state and it just gets stuck in here because nothing can get him out. As you can see, there is no arrow pointing out. There is no arrow pointing to anywhere, really. Not even uh, the exit. Now, in our code, what we could do is once your weapon is idle and only when your weapon is idle, you're allowed to swing, assuming that X condition is met. And we can create those conditions using parameter at the top here. So make sure you go under parameter and then you have a empty list. We can then create a list. These are all basic um, variable. You can use variable types. You can use a float. You can use the int, a boolean. In our case, we're going to be using a trigger. Now, um, this trigger, I will be calling it swing. And I'll go over how to use a trigger in a second. If you would be using a float, it would be fairly simple. You could say if that float is bigger than say 0.5, then you do this. Now, um, this is really useful for say speed value. What you can do is keep feeding the speed value to your animator and then your animator checks if the float value of speed is below 0.5, you can now walk. If the speed value is above 0.5, then you should be running. So. The animator in here could be taking care of that logic. Now, um, there is a boolean as well. It works just like a normal boolean. And finally, there is the trigger. Now, the trigger is something you activate only once and it's not getting unactivated until it's being consumed. So just like a boolean, you turn it on, but it never goes off until it gets consumed. In this case, what we're going to do is right click on weapon idle and create a transition. Now, just like this, if we were to play this, what's going to happen is you're going to play the weapon idle animation and automatically after that one frame, which is just one frame, it is going to go to weapon swing. Let's actually give it a look. Sorry about that. The game actually crashed for some reason. So I'll just have the same exact layout work again. Um, we had something like this and I have mentioned that if you start a game, you're going to play Weapon Idle, which is only one frame, and then you'll move on to Swing. So let's give this a try. 
as you can tell, we played idle and then we're stuck in a loop with the weapon swing. So we have to make sure we limit that to um, we limit that to only when we press on the trigger. Now it's also important that you need to find a way to escape from the weapon swing, so to exit the the weapon swing. So we're going to right click on weapon swing and put a link back to idle, and we're going to have this nice little uh, side by side transition thing going on. So this one is when you're going to weapon swing and then it just swings and once you're done it goes back to weapon idle. If we play this you'll see that we'll be jumping from weapon idle to swing to idle to swing and that forever. Now how do we go and fix this? We have to put a condition on one of these two transitions. Of course we'll want to put the condition on this one over here because that's the one that goes from idle to swing. And these conditions can be found on the right hand side over here under condition. We can simply click the plus sign and then you can meet as many conditions as you want. In our case we only have one parameter so they automatically put it on swing and if we don't trigger swing this is what happens. It repeats idle forever and always. Now we're going to be triggering swing from our code but right now let's do it manually by clicking on this over here. Now there seems to be a problem over here when the animation actually plays for a second time and that is not because we've created a bad animation, this is not because we have some extra keyframe, it's because of the blending and how uh, the whole animator work together. As you can see if you click on one of the transition, you're going to be seeing some settings here with uh, the blending time, say you completely reduce that to 0% or 50 in this case, uh, you're going to be seeing that the transition is now fixed. We can just do that like this and it is going to remove all the blending. You could either go and do that, you can also make sure there is no uh, looping by clicking on your animation and turning off the loop time. I'm currently under weapon swing and I just turn off the, um, the loop time. As far as the weapon idle goes, I'd like to leave that on loop um, just in case for some reason one of the value of the sword gets corrupted and it has to put it back on the default location. Alright, now if you want to make sure that you have the same exact animation as I do, you're going to go under the transition in between swing and weapon idle, and you're going to make sure to just collapse this back to zero and then put it back to, uh, like we just did a second ago. Now, since I've done it um, here, it doesn't show up anymore, but I just collapse everything here back to zero. So turn it like that and move this all the way over here, and then it disappear. So we get a result that looks like this. Make sure it is both way, actually just one way is fine but I just made it both way and it still looks good. And we now have our player moving around and we still can't swing using the code but at least the animation is now clean. So this whole state machine in here, even though it is a very very simple one, it now works and we're now ready to go implement that in the code. Which is a very very easy task to do guys. I'm going to go under the search and find my weapon.cs script. We're then going to open up this weapon.cs and then we'll need to have a reference to the animator controller. Okay, so if we had at the very top here, we have the swing um, part for the field, so we're going to create a new private animator controller, or just animator in this case. That's the type in the code. Animator controller is just the name they gave it in the inspector. And we're going to make sure to assign it during the start. So we'll say anim is equal to get component type of animator. Just like this. And now when we swing, we're going to enable that trigger. And the way we do this is by taking our reference, in this case anim, and we're going to say set trigger. And then it's going to take either the ID in int or the name of the trigger. In our case we called it swing. Now note that you can do this for set float, set boolean, set int. You have every parameters we saw. You can also get those to see what is the state in, um, in the animator. But this is how you transfer values to the actual animator. So now what happens when we actually call swing after pressing on spacebar. It is going to do the same exact operation as we've done manually. So it's going to go here and click on the button but it'll of course it will do it in the code not manually through the window. Let's give this a try we're just walking around we're going to press on spacebar and we didn't even see it because it got consumed instantly and that's because there is no exit time. 
Assuming we did have a exit time, you're going to see it for a slight second here. As you can tell, it does pop up. And then um, once the weapon.idle animation is completed and the whole blending is done, then it does consume it. But like we said, we do not want an exit time. We want something to be extremely fast. And we can now go here and actually hit this guy. Nice. So we just completed the very, very little section about the animator and the animation window. And now we have this animation of our little guy swimming his sword in front of him. And if you guys realize, we also made sure to turn off the collider of the weapon. So right now, we have no box collider on this thing. So if we just walk here, we get pushed away and the enemy suffers no damage. So it's going to be up to us to press on space R to make sure we can actually kill this enemy. And uh, he might need some slower movement speed, but thus far, we do have a working combat mechanic and it is quite cool. Alright guys, I will be catching you in the next section where we're going to start laying down a menu. So some kind of UI that is going to let us upgrade the weapon, going to let us see how much Pezos we have, going to let us see uh, what is our current character skin and how also to change it. So I'll be catching you guys in the next section. Welcome back to another section. In this one, we are going to start linking things together using a nice little menu that we'll be making using the new canvas system in Unity. It's not really that new, it was introduced in 4.6. The reason I like to say that it's new is because you're going to be seeing some legacy uh, UI objects around sometimes, so you gotta make sure you don't use them. Okay, so we're going to start off by creating a new canvas. We already have one canvas that is uh, taking care of the floating text, but for optimization purpose, we'd like to have something else for uh, what we're about to do. I will be explaining in the future why you'd like to have two canvas differently and why um, it matters in terms of optimization. At the moment, all we need to know is how to create a new canvas. So we're going to right click in the hierarchy, create a new UI and canvas. Let's make sure we rename that one for something like the, uh, the pause UI or let's find a better name for that. So let's just call it menu. There we go. So let's go beneath menu and make sure we set all of these uh, components properly. The first one being canvas, this one is already set properly, it's going to be a screen space overlay. The second one is going to be the canvas scaler. This one, we'll want to make sure it scale with screen size just in case uh, you ever decide to scale up your game. Make sure you, set, you put the exact same resolution as what you're developing in. Currently we're developing in 800 by 600 so by default these are fine for me. Okay. Once this is completed, we are going to create one big button um, that is going to be acting as a background. So I'm going to right click on menu, UI, button. Now this button, I will be using it to actually exit the menu. So once we pop our menu, it's going to be there. There's going to be a big black background with transparency. And if you click on that background, it's simply going to go back to the game. So this is some kind of way to say, if you click away from the menu, you're going to be sent back in the game. And we're going to call it background exit now I'm going to remove the source image for the sprite this way we can only have like a uh, normal color as you can see right now it is white I'm also going to remove the text component then I will be making sure it takes the whole screen by going at the top left over here in the right transform and making sure it scales on both axis I'm also going to hold shift so we have a different pivot point now if you have a look at your rec transform again, you're going to be putting everything back on zero and this is going to just take the shape of the whole screen, of your whole canvas actually. And we're going to have that kind of result. So this background is going to be over the whole screen. Now to actually make it transparent, we're going to change the color on their image. So let's put that on black and in terms of alpha, maybe put it on something like uh, 50 or 150. Something that's going to be hiding the background, but not completely. And then this will be our new uh, button to exit as well. As you can tell, we do have the button component. We're going to leave it here for now. Next up, we can start adding the main piece of our UI. So some kind of container that's going to have every single information we want to put in here. I'll be right clicking in menu again, create a new panel. And this panel will make it something that is anchored in the center and has some fixed values. In terms of width, I'm going to be using something like 550 
in height, let's put that on, say, something like 300. I'm also going to give it a full black color with no alpha, so I can have a solid background, and that is going to be our container. So I just renamed this to container. Alright, so now at that point, we just have to be creative. We have three or four things we have to fit in here. First one is the equipment, so what type of weapon are you using? Second up is the character selection, so just a, um, your sprite, your character sprite, and then a way to change it uh, going either left or right. Third one would be um, character information, so how much health do you have, what is your level, and how much pets do you have. And then finally, and I'll put that at the bottom of everything, I'll just put a, an experience bar. So I'll go ahead and I'll lay down what I just said. So I create a new UI panel, and the first one could be the equipment. So put that on pick size, something that would be 200 and 300 in height. I'll make sure to anchor this on the very left side like this, and also hold shift so my anchor point is also on the left side. And I have this very first section over here. This panel, I will be calling it character equipment and I'll duplicate it the next one is gonna be the character selection this one might be a little bit smaller let's make that 150 and I will just be putting it in the middle with an anchor in the middle so holding shift clicking in the middle not holding shift and then putting the value back on zero so we have something like this going on now let's name this one character selection and I'm going to duplicate equipment once more, call this one character information, and just change the anchor side from left to right. This way we have something like this going on, so we have three sections. On the left side we'll be putting the weapon, in the middle the character selection and the character sprite, and on the right hand side some more information such as how much health do you have, what is your level, and how much pesos. And uh, finally, there's going to be one more thing, it's going to be the experience bar. Now the experience bar, I will be creating a, uh, a panel again, call it experience bar, and I'll actually be playing around with, um, I'm not quite sure here, let's actually do something like 550, so the whole size of this, and about 50 in height, and I'll be putting it at the bottom over here. Now uh, what we could do is give it a full background, with say some kind of purple color like this full alpha, and on top of it is going to be another bar uh, with a brighter color. So we're pretty much done with the skeleton of our menu. In the next lesson, we are going to actually create some kind of animation around this so we can pop the menu and also hide the menu when we want. Welcome back to another lesson. In the last one, we created our skeleton for the menu. In this one, we're going to create some kind of animation so when the menu is on, you see this, and when it's off, you just don't see it anymore. Now, to do that, we're going to need some triggers. The first trigger we'll be using is a button on the screen. So we'll have to create another canvas, create a button, and one, once you actually click on that button, you can then uh, see the menu. And then one, once you actually want to get rid of the menu, all you have to do is click on another button to turn it off. In this case, it's going to be the big black transparent box around the menu. Okay, so let's get right into it. It should be fairly, fairly simple. The uh, first thing I'm going to do before anything else is to head over to the atlas and just crop myself a button. Now there ain't much in this atlas that can be used as a button for UI, so what I decided to do is just grab this one chest that I haven't been using and turn that into a button. So again, making sure this is 16 per 16, I'm going to call this menu underscore zero. Hit apply. And then I will be creating a new canvas once more, and this is like, a, like I mentioned in the past, this is for optimization purpose. I'm going to create a new canvas. I'll call this one HUD for heads up display. And we'll create a button at the very bottom left of the screen. So I'll be anchoring this bottom left, also holding shift. And let's make that something uh, only 16 per 16 at the moment. And we'll just scale it up to see how good it can look in the game. I'll be removing the text component and I'll be changing the sprite to our menu underscore zero. Alright, here it is. 
Let's actually move the uh, position x to something maybe like 10. So we'll have an offset of 10 pixel in x and also 10 in y. Now in terms of scale, let's actually try something like 64 by 64. If we go around and we play the game with this, I think this menu is quite good looking. It just stands here and if we press on it, it's going to open up the menu. So I'm going to be leaving it like that and we'll make sure to actually connect this action to the opening of the menu. Now what I will be doing this time is a little bit different from what we're used to do. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to hook up the, the button over here, the button action. We'll be hooking it up directly to the animator. So this way we actually skip one step and that step was to create a public function in any script really and reference the button to go on that function. Instead we're going to be manually changing or manually activating a trigger directly in some kind of animator. Now we don't actually have that animator just yet so we'll have to go under menu and right here at the top level so on the menu I will be adding a animator. Just like we've done earlier we're going to right click on animation create a animation controller and that is going to be the menu by itself like that. Then I will be clicking on menu, assign in that to the controller. And then we will be creating some animation around that menu. So when it's off, we have a certain state. And when it's on, we have another state. Okay, now we have our animator. As you can tell, if we open it, it looks like this. What we're missing is, of course, the states. So we're going to need some state. And those state needs to be based off animation. So we need to create animation. Let's click on our menu, open up the animation window and we'll be just dragging it in here and we'll start creating those animations. The first one I'll be creating is menu underscore hidden and I'll just put it in the folder. The second one I'll be creating is of course menu showing. Now, menu showing is pretty much this state we see right here on the screen. So that would be pretty much uh, our state once the menu is showing. We, so all we have to do at this point is simply go here and uh, start recording. Make sure you have your menu selected. So we want to be saving the container position. When it's not showing, it is going to be somewhere, say, here at the top. When it is showing, we want it to be on zero position Y. So I'll just be moving it around. As you can tell now, the position is zero in Y. Um, something else I'd like to animate is also the alpha of the background over here. So what I'll be doing, let's turn off the recording. I'm going to go back on menu, add a canvas group. And canvas group is something that is going to allow you to uh, modify the alpha, as you can tell, and also modify the interactability and also if it blocks raycast or not. So we're going to go back in the menu showing, click on record and with showing we are going to modify the alpha, make sure it is on one and also modify interactable. Even though we want it to be interactable, we have to toggle it off and then on again. So it shows up down here and it's actually being considered a, uh, a part of the animation. Okay, now we're going to go back turn off the uh, recording and then go on hidden. Once it is hidden, let's put that on recording, we're going to make sure that the canvas group has an alpha of zero so we don't actually see anything. We're also going to make sure that it is not interactable and the block recast is not on. So uh, you, pr you can actually press this button down here. If you didn't turn that off, you would not be able to press the button because technically you would still be pressing on the background exit. Okay, and what else? We're also going to need, and for the sake of this, I'll be putting that back on one, but we're also going to need to animate this container and put it somewhere, say, 400 or 450. Okay, let's go back here, put that on zero. And these are the difference in between hidden and showing. They are quite easy to see now. The animation in between them, the blending in between them is going to be happening uh, in between the states of mechanism. So in between the um, these states over here 
and we're not really able to play anything right now to see how it's going to look like. So we'll just have to implement it and then tweak it if we need to. Okay, so we have our menu hidden and our menu showing. When the game starts, we of course want this to be on menu hidden. So you don't want to be seeing the menu as soon as the game starts. And then what I'll be doing is I will be creating a transition from hidden to showing and showing to hidden. We will now need some conditions. And those conditions could be based off a single boolean, it could be based off trigger. I like to do triggers, so I'll be using triggers. Uh, one of them is going to be called show, and the other one is going to be called hide. Now we'll go from hidden to showing only if the trigger show is there, and from showing to hidden only if the trigger hide is there. Okay. Now, um, all we have to do at this point is really just make sure we can hook this with our buttons and we should now be good to go. So let's give this a try by going under background exit and there should be your button. Under background exit, you're going to link menu, which is the container of your animator and you'll find the animator, which is right here. We'll do a set trigger string and you're going to say that is the hide trigger. So you're going to try and call directly this thing to happen through a button and not through a public function. And then we have the other button, which is under HUD, and that's the menu button, which I forgot to rename. And we'll be putting the same exact thing. So let's go back on menu, pick its animator, and do a set trigger. This time it's going to be show. All right, so if we play this right now, we're gonna have this kind of behavior going on. So at the beginning, it is unhidden. And if we press on this button, the menu comes down. And if we press anywhere at this point, it should go back up. And that's really it for a menu. So we just did the animator for that menu. We can still move in the background. That's fine uh, by me. If we did not want to move, we could also set a time scale to zero. But in this case, I think I'm pretty happy with the result of this. Now there is one last thing that I don't really like and sometimes you can tell there is some kind of slight delay when I click, I have to wait. And that can be simply fixed by removing the exit time. So let's go under the transition and remove the has exit time on both of these. Now we can go ahead and play this, have instant responses. So when we click, it shows up. When we click away, it goes away. And that is it for the menu animation. In the next few lessons, we are going to fill in those blank squares so we can have some good data in there. All right, I will be catching you there. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we will start filling in this menu skeleton we had in the previous episode. We're going to start by opening it up and under menu, we'll start with the character um, equipment. So this one, I want it to be quite simple. I just want to be able to display the, um, the current sprite of the weapon and then a number below it with a button and if you click that number you spend X amount of peso and you upgrade your weapon. So quite simple stuff. Of course if you want more information you can always decorate that as much as you want. Mine's gonna be quite simple. I'll be going under UI and I will be putting a simple image like this. Now that image, um, we could give it a dimension of say 100 by 150. That would be like the background where the sword lies. And I could actually say, yeah, it's going to be in the center position 50 in Y. And of course, those values, something you could definitely just modify on your own. I'm like, there's no, it doesn't matter what kind of value you put in here. Whatever is going to look good for you is, is what matters. This one's going to be called the weapon container. And beneath it, I will have another UI, another image this time. And that image is going to be my weapon sprite. Um, so in this case, I will be finding the very first weapon we have. I'll make sure to actually set the native size as well and then I'll scale up from there. So I can have the, the proper aspect ratio and then I'll just scale this up if we need to and obviously in this case we need to. Maybe go for something that is five times bigger than what we had and this will fill the whole container. So maybe a little bit smaller for four and four. Okay. So we have the weapon container, we have um, the image we needed, I'll just call this one weapon sprite. And let's also create a button, so UI, button, and we will call it upgrade button. 
And I just realized I started putting space in between. Let's not do that because we have not been doing that since the beginning. I'll just go ahead and correct this. Okay. Put the button beneath everything. I'll make sure to anchor that below. Um, the size of this thing could be... Well, actually, I'd like this to be uh, the same exact size as the, the background. So the weapon container, I want this to fit the weapon container at all time on the x-axis. So I'll go back in here, make sure I click on stretch horizontally, and then I'll just put everything on zero. Um, as far as the height goes, let's go with a something like 50, and we'll just reduce that from the position. So maybe minus 50 in the position as well. And of course, if you have some nice image you can put as a background, do that. In my case, I unfortunately don't, so I might go for something like a gray. Oh, I'm on the weapon right now. I want to be on the weapon container. Then I'll put that on some, some kind of gray, and I'll just reduce the alpha. Maybe something like this. But if you do have like proper buttons, proper background, go ahead and implement that. It's going to look so much better, and you'll be more motivated to work on this. Okay. In terms of the text, I'll put that as a number for now. Now, as far as the text goes, I'll input a number because in the end, what I want to have right here is the amount of peso you have to pay to upgrade your weapon. So um, later on, we're also going to go get a new font. So I don't want to work too much on the text just yet, but eventually we're going to have a new font. So uh, the font size is going to change. So I put that on 30 for now. It's a little bit too big, but like I mentioned, it will change when we change font as well. Okay, so that would be it for the character equipment. All right, so next up we have the character selection. In here, we will need an image. That's going to be the character sprite. This one, let's make sure it actually fits the same ex exact um, aspect ratio. So something like 15, 20 could be close enough. If you want to have the perfect aspect ratio, just go ahead, take one of your player, and do set as native size. This way is going to give you the proper aspect ratio, and you can just start scaling up from there. So let's find out what could be good looking. We don't want to go too, too big with that simply because it, it's too small. Uh, you know, it's really small in this case, that's 16 per 16. So if we go very, very big, it is not going to look so good as you can tell. So keep it small, keep it simple. Let's, uh, let's actually use this one. That looks fine. Uh, maybe bump it a little bit higher in the Y axis. So I was thinking about. 10 or 20 or 30 because we want to leave some space at the bottom for some buttons so these buttons are going to be coming in right now we have a new UI button and that is still inside of the character selection I'll call this one left arrow and we'll give it a shape we'll remove the the text inside of it we'll just take this one shape uh, make sure it is say I'm gonna try 16 per 16 again way too small um, what about 50 by 50 that could work if we make it um, if we make it take the proper place in the screen so what if we do minus 25 we're gonna go on this side and in terms of Y let's do minus 40 maybe something could work something like this um, might push it a little bit further on the left hand side so the right arrow this one that's about to come up can have some spacing in between like mentioned this lesson is all about you and what you want your UI to look like. I'm giving you the one I'm using right here, of course. You can copy it uh, pixel per pixel, but where's the fun in that? Just be a little bit creative and uh, you know try to just move things around. I like to compare those prototype UI to my room. I like to just switch things around most of the time, so um, I don't really focus on you know the final aspect of it, the final design of it just yet, because we'll have to give it a try. We'll have to try it in the game to see if it feels good or not. So while you're just prototyping, while you're just laying down the skeleton of the UI, I don't think you need to spend so much time. Just put things where, you know, somewhere you can see it and somewhere where it can make sense. And then while you're playing, you'll understand where it would make more sense and where your cursor is at certain part of the time. Like, oh, uh, upgrading here might not be the best place. Maybe you want to put it really, really close to this button so you can do a quick upgrade. And you see where I'm going. I mean, it really depends. So you'll have to try out your game before you decide on your final UI, which is also why uh, being a UX guy is is a job. You can have a job where all you have to do is create UI uh, for the whole day. <laughs> so under character information, let's keep on going. Under character information, I'll go and create some text. 
the first text is going to be the health label. And I'll call this label because I will be uh, adding something beneath it. So that's like the title and beneath that is going to be the paragraph. So this one, health, in all caps. I'll make that centered. I'll give it, say, a, uh, well, white color would be good in this case. So a big white color. And like I have mentioned, don't worry so much about the scaling of this because it's going to change once we import a new font. What does matter is that we're going to make this stretch on both axis. I'll go with say minus 50 and then I'll put everything back on zero, maybe a height of 50 as well. Okay, right. And beneath that is going to be another text object. I'll just duplicate this one and that's going to be the health. So we have the health label and then just beneath that, we're going to have the actual information. This one, I could put it on um, minus 25 like it is right now, but I want to make it so it's minus 25 from the parent. How do I go about doing this? Okay, so I just did it by uh, going back in this menu over here and holding shift to set my anchor point at the top as well. Now I can go here and say minus 25. And in this case, the font is going to be a little bit smaller. So let's try 15 um, and some, you know, some place older text as well. Something like this. Cool. Next up, copy this. We did it once. Let's actually move down to say minus 100, maybe 125. And once more, this time minus 200. Cool. We're going to change the second health label for level label and finally pesos label. As you probably guessed, we're going to change that for level, that one for pesos, and change the text inside of it as well. Level could be 5 and pesos could be 75. We can also play with the color of it, so pesos could be yellow and level could be purple or you know that color um definitely doesn't look that good right now uh, so what we're gonna do make sure it fits put it around here and we now have the art or at least the visual aspect of our menu the right hand side over here the one we just did this is going to change without user input so you play the game you collect some pesos this is going to change you get hit you lose health this one in the middle is going to be the character selection. So this one, we do have an input, the left button and the right button. And finally, on the left hand side, we've got the sword. Of course, this one does have an input. Um, you click on this button. If you do have the amount of pesos required, you are going to update or sorry, upgrade your weapon. Oh, and one thing I almost forgot is the experience bar. So we're going to go under the experience bar, create another UI image of the same exact size. To do that, I can either input it manually or make it stretch on both axis, then put everything back on zero. So this is going to give me a, um, an overlay of everything we had. And we'll just call this one progress. What I will be doing is through code, I will be changing the scale. And as you can tell, when we do change the scale, it's going to shrink. But now we have to make sure it shrinks from the proper position. So what I'll be doing with this proper size here, when everything is put back on zero, I'll go and click here, put the anchor on the bottom left, so I'm holding shift, or you can just put it on the left right here, and then it is going to return to a normal object that does not stretch, and the width and the height is going to be set. And we have this new anchor point, which means if we reduce this, or if we increase it, it's going to play just like a progress bar. So I will be leaving that to full. And um, changing the color, of course. So I'll just be picking a brighter shade of this color. Something like this. All right. Now, one more thing I'd like to put on this experience bar, and it's to um, actually display the amount of experience you have and how much experience you need to level up. Simple thing. We just create a new UI text. We make sure it is um, stretching on both axes. This one is fine. Anchored in the middle alignment in the middle, bigger font, maybe 30, and then we just type in our text, our default text. We'll be, of course, modifying all of that as we see fit. Okay, well, that is all we needed to do to put all the art in here. Uh, we're pretty much ready to start implementing the mechanic behind those. 
So I will be doing that in the next lesson guys, I will see you there. Welcome back guys. In this lesson, we are going to start implementing the code behind this piece of menu. So let's click on the menu, go under the add component, and we're going to call this character menu or whatever you feel like calling it. In my case character menu, I will be opening it up in my favorite editor, cleaning it up like I always do, and then we're going to get started. So we're going to need a lot of field in here. We're going to be playing with a lot of different variables. Let's start with the, the text fields. So we're going to start declaring a public text level text. If you have not realized, we're going to need to implement unityengine.ui. So if it is not done, go ahead and use unityengine.ui. And then you know what? we'll declare them on the same um, on the same line. So level text, we're going to need hit point text. We're going to need pesos text. We're going to need the upgraded cost text. And finding the XP text. All of those are required because we'll be updating uh, what's inside of the menu and all of those are dynamic values that we need to update. Okay. Um, next we're gonna need um, some logic field and those are for the sprites, for the character sprites and also the weapon sprite. So let's go and start declaring a private int current character selection. That's your selection in BEX. So if we have zero, we're looking at the player underscore zero. If we have one, we're looking at the player underscore one. We're going to need a public image character selection sprite and another public image. You can declare it on the same line if you want. Weapon sprite. And finally, a public rec transform for the XP bar. I mentioned in the last lesson that we're only going to be using the local scale to actually do the progress bar. So this is why I'm using a rec transform over here. All of these are public, so we'll have to go assign them manually um, as soon as we are ready. Okay, but before we do that, let's start declaring a couple of things. So a couple of functions we will be using. First one could be, um, I'm not quite sure. We have a couple of things in here. We could do the character selection first. So let's go and do that. We're going to need a public void on arrow click. This is going to be the function um, that the button, the two buttons are going to call. Now, both buttons are going to be calling the same function. Whether it is right or left is going to be determined by this boolean we're going to pass in. So I called it boolean right. If we are clicking on the right arrow, that boolean is going to be true. And if we're clicking on the left one, it is going to be false. So this is how I know which button we're going to click. Now, if we are pressing the right arrow, well, we have to do something like this. So current selection plus plus. We're incrementing that by one. And if we went too far away in the array, so if there is no more character um, after the current selection, we'll have to do if current character selection is equal to game manager dot instance player sprites dot count. So if we reach that point, that means we have to go back to zero. So current character selection is equal to zero. And then on selection change, which is a function that we will be declaring right after that. Okay, now if we're going right, we do the exact same thing, but you know, the other way around. So I'll just be copying this. We'll say current character selection minus minus. If the current character selection is smaller than zero, that means we went to minus one and that is not valid for your array. We're going to say it's equal to game manager instance player sprites count minus one because we are zero base. Okay, so in these two, these two are quite simple algorithm. At the end of them, I call a function call on selection change. So if we did manage to change the character sprite, or actually just the current character index, then we're going to be calling this function. So private void on selection change. And then in here, we can apply um, the different sprite, which should be quite easy. All we have to do, take that selection sprite, we declare at the top, say the sprite is equal to game manager instance player sprites at the index current character selection. And that's it. That's all we have to do. 
All right, so that was it for the character selection. Next up, we could have the weapon upgrade. So weapon upgrade. And it's also going to be a button. So we'll do public void on click upgrade. Or if we just follow that, that way I was calling thing earlier, we'll do on upgrade click instead. Okay, now inside of on upgrade click, we are going to need a reference to the weapon, which is not something the menu has. So I'll be leaving this empty for now, but we'll have to go back and uh, get a reference to the weapon. And the way I think we're going to be doing this is by using the game manager. So the game manager is going to try and update the weapon instead. And finally, we need some text just to update the character information. So that is all the text field you saw at the top here. We need to upgrade all of that. So let's go ahead and do it. We're going to declare a function, call it public void update menu. And inside of update menu, and then with the update menu, we run into the same kind of problem we ran into with the unupgrade click. We are missing some information in the game manager to just complete these properly. So what we'll do is um, we're going to fill in what we can, but then we'll have to go in the game manager, implement the weapon in there properly, and then uh, come back here. So uh, let's do, say, we have the meta, we have the weapon which we can't do at the moment, so let's leave that empty. In terms of meta, we can do hit point text. That text is going to equal to game manager instance player hit point to string. And then we can also do the pesos. So pesos.txt is equal to game manager instance um, pesos to string. And that would be it. We cannot do the level just yet simply because there is no mechanic created around the level. So the experience mechanic is not created just yet so we'll just leave that empty let's do level text dot text and we'll leave that to not implemented okay so something like this we'll have to come back here of course um, weapon sprite is also the same exact thing so we'll do weapon sprite since we're here I'm gonna write down the line but you know we can't really put the proper thing in here so there's gonna be a bug We'll just say weapon sprite at the index zero. Same thing goes for the text beneath the weapon. So the upgrade cost text, we can say dot text not implemented. And finally, there is the XP bar. So XP bar. Um, this one <laughs> also not implemented. We don't have the XP mechanic just yet. So let's go ahead and say XP text. Oops dot text is going to equal to not implemented in all caps and uh, we can mess around with the local scale so we could say xp bar dot local scale is equal to whoops again i'm typing too fast is equal to a new vector 3 let's say 0 0.500 0, 0. so it's going to be halfway um completed okay now we have the update menu we'd like to hook this up every time we open the menu so every time we open the menu through the button it would be nice if we have a nice refresh of all that data. So refresh of all this metadata we have here, refresh of the weapon, refresh of, uh, well, pretty much everything. So let's go ahead and add that as well to our little button call over here. So remember that button in the HUD, the menu button hiding behind everything right now? We're going to add a new function to it. Right now, it's only setting the trigger of a animator. We're going to hit the plus sign choose our menu because that's where our character script is character menu is and we'll go ahead put our function here so character menu update menu before we test this out we have to assign the value so back on the menu let's expand it completely so including these down here and we're going to set everything manually so let's go ahead and find the level text here it is the hit point text, peso text, the upgrade cost text that is on the weapon, so upgrade button at the top here. The experience text could be on the experience bar, character selection, um, that is our character sprite. So did I type that properly? I don't think so. Character selection sprite, okay, so it is typed properly, we just don't see the whole text because it's too, um, it's too big. Here it is. Um, for this, we're going to need this little boy in the center. So let's take the character sprite, put him here. Weapon sprite just goes below. 
and finally the progress goes in here. Let's actually try and play this game right now. We just collected a total of 30 pesos and they have not been updated because argument is out of range. What is wrong exactly? Let's find out what's wrong. Okay, so it turns out we get an argument out of range simply because we have um, this thing over here. When we update the weapon, we say at the index 0, but we don't have a weapon sprite array yet. I mean, it's not, it's not filled at the moment. So let's go back on the game manager and put something in the weapon sprite. Actually, let's put them all since we're here. How many weapons do we have? I think we have six. I might be mistaken. Let's type in a weapon. And we have a total of seven, including zero. So click on this one first. Let's go up to seven. And just fill in that array with our shiny little weapon. And then five. And then we need a total of seven for the golden sword. When we play the game at the moment, we should not have any problem. Let's go and open this. So not implemented, not implemented. Health is at 10, which is true. The amount of pesos um, is still zero because we never went and implemented that. Let's actually do that as well. We're gonna we're gonna start connecting things together right now. We're gonna go right into the chess.cs. And where we say this, we're gonna also say game manager dot instance pesos plus equal pesos amount. So that's all we needed to complete this. We should have done that um, earlier, but my bad on this. Okay, so we are back in the game. Pesos is equal to zero. Collect 25, and it's now 25. So our text works. Um, a couple of things are not implemented. So we have to go ahead and connect everything together. Now, what we will be doing in the next few lesson, actually in the next lesson, is make sure the weapon works 100%. So we're gonna have the upgrade on the weapon, we're going to have the swap of sprites, but we're not gonna tackle the XP just yet. We're going to take care of everything weapon related. And then we'll move on to the character sprite. And once we're done, we are going to move on to the experience. So stay tuned for the next lesson. I will see you there. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we will be taking care of doing everything we need for the weapon. So to get started, most of our work is going to be done in the game manager today. So we're going to double click on it, open it up, and this is where we're going to unlock the true potential of our weapon. So remember in the reference over here, we've created this temporary field. Well, it is no longer temporary. We are going to create a public weapon called weapon. And in here, we have everything we need already. So we did uh, we did think about the weapon level. We did think about um, the stats over here we have to change. Everything is pretty much done in the weapon. Most of the work is going to be done directly in the game manager. All right, so let's do it. We're going to go down here in the section where we create all of our function. Maybe go down uh, in between the floating text and also the, the save state and just create something for the upgrade weapon we'll do a public boolean called try upgrade weapon. And this one is all gonna make sense uh, as soon as we complete this whole flow. So what's going to happen is the menu is going to call this function. So it's gonna call try upgrade weapon simply using the uh, game manager instance dot try upgrade weapon. And if this one returns false, then we're not going to change anything on the menu. If it returns through, it means we completed the upgrade and then we're going to change the sprite in the menu. We're going to apply um, the new sprite in the game and you know, it's just gonna change everything there, but only if this returns true. So the menu right here, the, uh, the game manager is the one that knows whether it's going to succeed or not. Because our values are here, our pesos are here, the, uh, the upgrade costs are all in the game manager. So it did make sense we put it here. Let's start with a very simple call. Is the weapon max level right now? So are we maxed? And the way we're going to know if we're maxed or not is simply by counting using um, the weapon prices that count. So if weapon prices that count is smaller or equal to our weapon dot weapon level, so if that's the same or smaller, it means we are already maxed out and let's actually return false. We have to return a boolean, I almost forgot. So we're going to return false right away. So 
no way we can upgrade further than that. Now, if we can go a little bit further, we're going to check with the amount of pesos we have. So if pesos is bigger or equal to weapon prices at weapon, weapon level, so we're using the weapon level to know exactly where uh, to look at in the weapon price array. Weapon zero is going to cost X amount um, from the weapon price array. And then we just keep going in parallel. Those two array are going to increment in parallel. So uh, when you upgrade the weapon, the price also upgrade. If we do manage to do that, let's reduce the amount of peso. So let's deduce the amount of peso. So price is minus equal to weapon price at the index we just talked about. And then we'll actually try to upgrade that weapon. I think we did have that in the... No, we didn't have that in the weapon. So weapon's going to need a new function called upgrade weapon. Something like that. Very simple. Which will basically just um, do what we said. So it's going to change the sprite. It's going to increment the stats of that sword. Okay, now there is one more problem left with this algorithm, with this function actually. Uh, is the fact that we might not actually return anything. Here we have a if statement, but here we also have a if statement. So in case none of these two were called, so in case uh, we are not max level but we don't have enough pesos, we're going to return false. Simply. Okay, now that should be everything we needed to do in the game manager. We're going to hop on the, uh, the weapon class because we have encoded this upgrade weapon function. So let's go in there. I'm going to navigate to weapon, press F12, then on the class name, press F12, and we're going to scroll down at the very bottom. Let's declare a public function, public void, called upgrade weapon. And in this one, we'll do a simple weapon level plus plus. Also change the sprite, so sprite renderer dot sprite is going to be equal to game manager instance weapon sprites at the index weapon level. And this way we're able to change the real physical weapon in the game. Now um, we still have to change the one in the menu because once we upgrade it, every time we open the menu it's going to be uh, verified. But if we are already in the menu and then we upgrade, we want it to change there as well. So we want them to change it um, pretty much live. So uh, there is one more thing we'll have to do in here. It's going to be to change the stats. We'll come back in a second to this, but let's go quickly in the character menu where we were in the last episode. And we're going to go up here on the unupgrade click, do a if game manager instance try upgrade weapon. So if that succeed, if we get a through, then only then we're going to update menu. If we click on the button and there was no upgrade, we are simply not going to update the menu. And that should be it. So we pretty much completed that flow. Um, we're going to need one more thing, like I mentioned a second ago. We're going to need to upgrade the weapon stats. And I just realized we don't have an array for that. We don't have some kind of structure with the new, um, the new information. Just like we've done for the weapon price, we could go ahead and create another array, uh, say in the game manager, that could take care of that. So we can either create it there or we can create it directly on the weapon. In this case, it's really up to you. Um, I feel it would be a little bit cleaner to do it directly on the weapon. So I'll go ahead, open up my weapon, and at the top here, where the damage structure is, we will actually turn that into an array. That makes sense, right? Public int array, damage point, and we have a total of, if I remember, we have a total of seven. So let's make that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I know that is extremely creative for the amount of <laughs> of damage we will be doing. Um, same thing with push force. We can start at 2, then go up to 2.2, 2.5. This one's a big jump, so 3, maybe 3.2, and 3.6. So how many do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And finally one at four. Something like this could work. Uh, let's make that a public float array. And it should work. Now we have to um, change what we had earlier. So on our on collide function, which is on the weapon, instead of using the damage point like we were using earlier, we're going to be using damage point at the index weapon 
level. Same thing for the push force. And just like this, we can make that work. Now, I've assigned some values directly in the code here, but since we made them public, they're also going to be visible through the inspector right here. Oh, they were actually um, not assigned. That is quite weird. Maybe that's because they were public before. What if I do a reset? Yeah, if I do a reset, it's going to take the value directly from... Um, from the script so I did a reset and now my values are all in here and if I need to tweak them I can do that quite fast okay now to wrap up the weapon we have to hook up our menu to our actual logic should be quite simple so let's do that super fast we're gonna go under the menu let's go under the character equipment upgrade button an upgrade button is going to be put on um, I think it was under menu right Character menu on upgrade click. Here it is. If I press the game, if I press play on the game and I go on my game manager while it's running, I'm going to give myself some pesos. So let's see. Where is my game manager? Oh, it's on the uh, don't destroy on the hood. Now I'm going to give myself, say, 100 pesos in this case. Open this up, click on this, and we get a no reference exception. So what is this from? The weapon price array has not been filled in and that's completely true again I forgot to do that at one point I should have done that before so back on the game manager um, weapon prices we have seven weapon let's go ahead and make that seven prices as well actually I lied we only need six prizes because we already own the first weapon okay now let's say the first weapon is going to be something like 35 second could be a hundred um, that's going to take a lot of grinding, actually. Let me go bump those down. Maybe go with 30, 70, then up to 130, and then maybe 200. At that point, we can go in crazy number. And finally, 400 for the last one. Okay, let's give this a try. We're going to go right into the game, collect some peso. Uh, we should have enough for the first weapon upgrade, so let's click here, click there. And we have a null reference again. What is that problem? Oh, so the weapon price is actually failed. We just don't have a reference to weapon, so something I forgot again. Uh, let's head back into the game manager and over here, down there, there is no weapon. <laughs> let's actually drag our weapon here, making sure everything is correct. We're going to collect those pesos again. And this time it's going to work, I hope. So we did lose the peso. This was not changed over here. Did we have a new sword? We do have a new sword. So the only place where it did not work is in the menu. So the menu, I remember we actually did not implement it just yet. We're going to have to go back and go in the update menu, which is down here, and change this to weapon level. So game manager, instance, weapon, weapon level. Now, for real this time, this should actually work. We're collecting everything. And it did change over here. We did lose an amount of pesos. And we have our new sword. Does this one do two damage? Let's try it out. Yep, it does do two, um, two damages. And we were able to two hit this little guy because he has three HP. Okay, so that is fairly cool. There is one more problem that we'll have to address eventually. We're pretty much done with the weapon and the UI thus far. But there is one problem where um, this is not actually being saved in the save state. So again, we're going to go fix it right now so we don't leave it hanging. And in the save state, that is inside of the game manager. So in our save state, we do have the weapon level. We just have to change the zero for an actual value. <laughs> so weapon, weapon level, two string. That is fine for our save state. Let's go in the load state now. And here we have changed the weapon level. So we'll do weapon, weapon level is equal to int that parse. And that would be data at the index 3, if I can remember correctly. Yep, data at the index 3. Let's go ahead and test it out. We're going to upgrade our weapon. It is now the rusty sword. Let's walk through this so we can save the state. And then uh, this one doesn't load up things because we have not copied our scene thus far. But we're going to go back in the main scene and see if we have the proper weapon. Now obviously we do not have the proper weapon in our hand. 
but if we have a look in um, in the menu we have the proper weapon and if we go under the game manager you're going to see that our weapon weapon level should be one so this is fine the logic is working we just don't have the right sprite so let's go down back in our code so right here this is not enough this is only going to set the level value and we wanted something else we want something that sets the value and also change the sprite there is two ways to go about this what we can do is create a function inside of weapon to be clean we can create a function inside of weapon or we could go and turn this one into a public manually change it from um, the game manager so we can go back here say okay we just want to duct tape this so let's do weapon sprite render and then we say it's equal to the weapon sprite array but instead what we're going to do is head back in the weapon turn that back into private and we're going to create a public function public void set weapon level and we'll be taking an int in here so level it's going to do the same exact thing as upgrade weapon and we don't need to change that anymore but instead of doing a plus plus it's going to say is equal to level and we will now be calling this from our game manager instead of calling a change weapon level actually instead of changing manually the weapon level so it's going to look something like this and everything should work for real this time so we run into a null reference exception and that is because our sprite renderer at that time is not actually set so we don't have a sprite renderer uh, simply because the game manager when it runs it does a load state in the awake I believe so that happens fairly early and by that time if we go on our weapon we don't have a sprite render just yet because this one's private we set it in the start as you can see they don't have the time to um, have this working so what we can do instead is we can reorder things so the sprite renderer would be done in say an awake so private void awake remember awake is being called before we could do that and that would fix the problem so if we go and play this we should not have any more error in the console as you can tell it's here we have the proper weapon and it is it is just ready to be used now that's one way to do things the other way you could have done it is by making this a public thing the sprite renderer could be public and we just assign it through the inspector just pick which way you like the best I will be going with the inspector way you don't have to do that you can just put it in the awake and from there you'll be able to launch your game have the proper sword in your hand and defeat this little guy here Oops. so we still hit for two and for some reason he died there I'm not quite sure why we'll have to figure it out as well hi right, guys all right so we're pretty much done with the weapon uh, again one final thing I, I know I keep doing that one final thing but I keep forgetting we have to change the text right here because we did implement this we can't say it's not implemented anymore because it is let's go ahead and change that text to the proper amount of pesos you have to pay. I'll be opening up the character menu and where it says not implemented over here we are going to create some kind of formula. We are going to create a very very small algorithm because there is two options here. The weapon might be max level and we have to change that to something like max like this or we can just you know put the real amount of pesos you need to pay. I'll start with an if statement if game manager dot instance dot weapon weapon level if the weapon level is equal to game manager dot instance weapon prices dot count then it is the max in that case else upgrade cost text dot text is going to be equal to game manager instance weapon prices and that's going to be at the index game manager instance weapon weapon level make sure you cast all of this into a string by doing a to string and that is it so that's going to write the amount of pesos you need to pay and that is going to say max in case you are already capped hey let's go ahead and give this a try so we have to pay a total of 70 pesos right now to have this new sword let's go ahead and get this amount do we have enough now we have 55 uh, let's cheat a little bit give ourselves 70 we go in here upgrade that weapon we now have this brand new weapon this one costs 130 if you want it and uh, should one shot this little guy yeah boy big damage alright guys 
I will see you in the next lesson where we will be doing the character selection. Welcome back to another lesson. Today we're going to be having a look at this character selection over here. We're going to make it work and we're going to make sure that the sprite is indeed saved every time we quit the game or every time we change um, which zone you are in right now. So let's give it a look what we have at this moment. We have the weapon working, we have uh, most of the thing working. Now these two buttons is something we have to code. Right, we already coded a little bit of it. If you guys remember, let's open up the character menu. We have the function that should be bound on the buttons. And they were right here. So on selection change and on arrow click are the two functions we need. On arrow click, we have to bind this to our buttons. So let's go ahead and do that. Should be quite quite fast. So we're gonna go on the menu, head over to the character selection, left arrow. I'm going to hit the plus sign, make sure I drag and drop the item that has character menu in it. In this case, that was menu. And we'll find on arrow click. Now, um, this one takes an A boolean. Let's leave that one unchecked, so false. For the right arrow, we do the exact same thing, but this time we are going to check this boolean. Okay, at that point, we're going to give the game a try. And we have a out of range exception. All right, so now what happens over here is that we have the on selection change and this one runs into a problem because current character selection could be equal to one and we don't have a, a sprite in here. So in the game manager under the player sprite, we have zero. We have to make sure we actually put some character sprites in here. And uh, at the moment we only have two. So let's actually add that, put it on two and we're going to find the sprite first one was called player underscore zero and the second one was player underscore one having that done we're going to run the game now let's click as you can tell we have swapped in the menu but we did not swap in game so we have to make sure we can also swap in the game okay now over here we have the on selection change and what we do in here is we make sure to change the sprite inside of the menu now we'd like to also change a sprite um, in a game, but we don't have any reference to that sprite. So what we'll be doing is we'll let the player know that he needs to change his skin. How do we get the player? We are going to get it through the game manager. So game manager instance player. And we'll just do something like swap sprite with the index. So current character selection. Swap sprite, brand new function we're going to put right into player. So let's F12 on that player. F12 on the type. We are now in player.cs and we'll declare a public void swap sprite taking a int in parameter. That's going to be the skin ID. And in here, we're going to actually take our sprite renderer. So get component sprite renderer. Sprite is going to be equal to game manager instance player sprites at the index skin ID. Another way we could have done that is by keeping a reference to the sprite. This could be a little bit more optimal, so we don't have to do a get component every time. You know what? Let's actually do that. I'm going to save a little bit of memory in here. So private sprite renderer, sprite renderer, and in some kind of a wake or start. So protected override start. We're going to do the initial thing, so the initial base.start, but we also say sprite renderer is going to equal get component type of sprite renderer and here we go so we made it a little bit more optimal by adding a couple of line of code if we can avoid some get component call um, the better it is okay well, let's go back in the game try this out we're currently rolling around with our initial skin if we go here and press you're going to see that a change in both the game sprite and also the menu sprite now if I exit and I have this saved we are going to run into a problem so what is this problem over here now the problem we're running into right here is something that we're going to put on the side for the rest of this section since we want to make sure everything is actually um, done with the menu then we're going to go on and fix this transition problem we have um, the real issue right here is simply that since we have a game manager that purses in between scene, that game manager has some 
has some stuff over here, so the player, the weapon, the floating text, all of that is not being transferred properly over to the second scene. As you can tell here, they're all missing now, which is what caused the no reference exception. So for the remaining of this section, we are going to stay inside of this scene and we are not going to exit until um, everything is completed in here. So we're going to need one more thing in the next lesson. We are going to be having a look at the experience bar and how to turn this into some kind of leveling system as well. So we'll see you guys in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we will be creating some kind of leveling system that is going to be fairly simple. Um, this way we're going to be able to fill the rest of our menu, which is the experience bar at the bottom over here. So we're going to start off by declaring um, a couple of fields in our XP table. So how many levels do we like to have? Um, I'm thinking about something like 10. We could go with 10 different levels. Now the logic we're going to implement behind this XP table is the amount of XP you need um, on top of what you already have to go on to the next level. So we can start with say 10 XP. After getting, or maybe even 5, so after getting 5 XP, you're going to level up. And then I could say here 10, which means to get up to level 3, you'd have to get first 5 XP and then another 10, so 15 XP total to go to level 3. And we just keep raising that number as much as you want. We can do um, 17 in this case, maybe 25, 30, of course. I want to make sure every time it gets a little bit harder and harder. Until the gap in between level is pretty much something like 120. Okay, so the last level, so in between level 9 and 10, you're going to require an additional 820 XP on top of that. Okay, so we have our XP table. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put this script in here because I'm tired of seeing it and we're going to open up our game manager, create uh, a couple of function, maybe two function in here to get the current level of our player and also get the uh, the experience to go to a certain level. Using these two functions, we'll be able to wrap that around some kind of logic that would tell us what is our current level and how much XP we need to progress. So I'll go right here in between the upgrade weapon and the save state. I'll call that experience. You could call it experience system. And I will start with a public int get current level. So this is going to return me an int of what is my current level. Very simple, right? For the algorithm behind this, we are going to do a little bit of math. We're going to start by declaring a int r that's going to be my return value and another int that I'll call add. And you'll see what I do with this one. I'll say as long as my experience is bigger or equal to add, then we are going to add a level. So r plus plus. But before we do this, let's make sure we add plus equal to the XP table R. Okay, okay. Now let's go back and have a look at what this actually does. We are going to start with an R of zero. So our return value is currently zero. We're at level zero and our add is also zero. As long as experience is bigger or equal to zero, then we're going to go ahead and add the first and three in our XP table because that's also index zero. So add is gonna be equal to five after this, and then we can up the level. So at this point, we rerun the loop. We know we're at least level one, and um, if your experience is bigger than five at this moment, then we're gonna go ahead and do that once more. So it's gonna be at least level two, and so on. When we're done, we return R. Also, let's have a, a check over here for uh, if we are max level, so if, r is equal to xp table dot count then we're pretty much max level let's return r right away okay uh, because the experience could go up and up and up and we don't want um, the xp table to be looked at if it's a uh, if it's above the amount of entry it has so we don't want to have a uh, out of range exception here Let's actually test this out. I will be putting that in some kind of random update. Simply going to quickly create an update. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. I'll just say get current level. Um, that could be it. Yep. So get current level in an update. My console should be spam with one at the moment. Or it's actually not because I don't think I saved properly. 
Oh, I actually don't do a debug.log. My bad. Okay. Now that makes a little bit more sense. So let's see. We're going to have a look at our console down here. We are being spammed with 1, so we are currently level 1. If we go on our game manager and we change the XP in here to say 5, then we're going to be on level 2. If we go to 4, we're back to level 1. 5 is level 2. Now we've mentioned that in between the second level and third level, there is an additional 10 XP. So if we go up to 14, we're still going to be level 2. But if we go to 15, we're finally going to be level 3. Now I wonder how much XP you need to hit level uh, 10. You can take a wild guess. It's something around... Seems like it's 342. So after 342 experience total, you're going to be max level. Okay, now we know this function works. We just tested it out and it worked great. So we're going to create our new function called get XP to level. And it does exactly what it sounds like. So we're going to need a int level to know where to stop. Now this is going to add up the XP in XP table as long as we hit that level we mentioned up here. So if we say uh, get all the XP you need to hit level 2, it's going to return a total of 15. So this is the total XP to reach a certain level. I'll start with int r again and also int xp and as long as r is going to be smaller than the level we're going to say r plus plus but before that xp plus equal to xp table at the index r and that's it. Once we're done return xp and we are now good to go. With these two functions we're going to be able to calculate uh, exactly what is our level and also um, how much XP we need to go to the next one. So we're going to go in the character menu and start implementing those. Okay, so I'm down here in the update menu function. We have the level text uh, that says not implemented. This one, fairly simple. Game manager instance get current level. And this should return you exactly what uh, we just tested out earlier. So get current level. Why does it not work? Because this is an int and they want a string, so let's do a two string at the end. Now for the XP bar, uh, this one is actually going to be a little bit complicated. We're going to check whether or not we're max level first, because there is two there is two states. So whether you're max level and want to be displaying something, say uh, just like the total amount of XP you have uh, right now, or you're not max level and you're in the progress of another level. So in there, you want to be displaying the amount of XP you have into that level how much more do you need and uh, you know do the whole progress bar thing. So let's start with the easiest one. If game manager dot instance get current level, so if my current level is equal to uh, the max amount of XP table entries, so which is basically our max level, we don't need these over here. So if that is the case, we're gonna say XP text dot text is gonna be equal to game manager dot instance experience to string and let's add a little bit of text after that so total experience points so display total xp if we are max level now in terms of the uh, local scale i'm going to copy this and just make sure it is a full vector one so vector three dot one this is going to fill the bar completely Okay, now if we're not max level, we'll have to find the ratio into our levels. Um, the ratio is going to be useful so we can actually just scale the bar properly. So let's go ahead and try to do this. We're going to start with a new int, call it current level xp. And we're going to say it's as simple as doing a, um, a game manager instance get xp to level. And we'll use our current level. So game manager instance get current level. Oops get current level you know what I feel like we could actually put that in uh, another int here so I'll just clean this up a little bit int current level is equal to this and we'll be able to replace that and also and uh, that's it okay so your current level index is actually not going to give you what I thought it would. It's actually going to give you your previous one because that's the one you've uh, you've completed in the past. So I'll actually go back here, say your previous level XP, and we'll say current level minus one. That's the one we need. We need to know which one we have completed and which one is our current target. So we'll do current 
Worker, Global XP Now. And uh, same exact lines, we'll go ahead and copy this, but we'll remove the minus one at the end. Okay, so we have the XP that we've already reached. We have the XP uh, that we have to reach. And now all we have to do is create a ratio in between what we have and what we have to reach. Next up, we're going to create another int called difference, and that's going to be the uh, current level XP oops, minus the previous level XP. This is going to give you the amount of uh, XP you need to have into that level. You could also fetch it from the XP table under the game manager, um, but I just get it here because it's, it's right here and I know exactly what it does written this way. Now, um, the next thing we need to know is how much XP we have into this level. So to get this current XP into level, I'm going to say game manager instance experience minus the previous level XP. And with these two new values over here, we'll be able to get a ratio. So I call that float completion ratio. And we'll make sure to cast this as a float else it might actually mess up our value. So current XP in two levels, so current XP in two level divided by the difference and that is how we're going to get our ratio. At this point, all we have to do is say XP bar local scale is going to equal to a new vector three and we'll just create it here on the fly. So completion ratio one and one. We only have to change the X axis. That's the only one that scales. Okay. So, uh, are we missing something? Yes, we are missing one thing. We forgot the text. So, xp text text is going to equal to current xp into the level to string plus, let's put some kind of little dash in between, the difference. And we can now get rid of these two lines at the bottom here. So, we created a little bit of a, a bigger algorithm for the xp bar more than the, the other ones, but that is something required. Let's go ahead and try this in the game. If we open this up, we have a empty bar that says you need 5 XP and you currently have none of that. So let's go here, hit this guy. Oops. We now have 1 XP out of 5. That is pretty cool. Do we also have the text over here? Yes, we have the text. It says level is 1. We're then going to go back on the game manager, give ourselves, um, say, 40 XP, reopen the menu. And we are level 4 with this amount of XP into the level so that is actually all we needed to do if I put that on 32 I should be on 0 out of 25 yep but I'm still level 4 okay well that is all we needed to do for the XP uh, we're missing one more function that is going to tie itself to the player and that function is the level up function so what do we do when we actually level up it'd be great if we uh, restore the character's hit point and we also give him more maximum hit point Alright, so now if we want to know exactly when our player level up, we have to hook ourselves where he gets XP, and that it would be in the uh, the game manager. In the game manager, we have this um, public int over here, and this one just goes up, which is kind of good, but it's also very bad because we don't have any way to know when this goes up. It's controlled by other script. What I will be doing down here is I'll create a new public void, and I'll call this grant XP with a int called xp. And what we'll do is when we actually uh, have a enemy die and give us xp, instead of adding it manually to experience, we're gonna go through grant xp and this one will be checking whether or not we leveled up. So we'll do int current level, get the current level right now before we do anything, and then we'll do experience plus equal amount, or sorry, the xp that we get in parameter. Now if current level is still the same this is not going to be triggered so if, if current level is smaller than get current level right now after we gave XP uh, well that means we did level up so on level up a function that does not exist but at least we'll know that we leveled up um, then so fairly simple logic we get our current level before getting the experience and then we get the experience and we check again so did we level up if we did then let's go ahead and call this and that would be another function called public void on level up. And from here, you'll just do whatever you want. So I could do a debug.log level up. 
and have a look in the game if this works if this is being called actually it is not going to be called just yet uh, simply because the enemy does not go through this function yet so let's go back on the enemy where he dies at the bottom over here instead of doing a uh, experience plus equal we'll do a grant XP with the XP value so we just changed that funnel we just changed that uh, route so it goes through our new function so let's go into here I'm going to give myself a total of four experience knowing that this enemy gives me one or two um, I totally forgot XP value 1 so it's gonna give me 1 XP and then I'll level up because right now I am 4 out of 5 I'm level 1 and if I go hit this guy with the sword we have the level up call right down here in the console if we open up we're gonna see we're level 2 and we need 10 more XP to go up okay so everything in here works just fine let's go ahead and just give ourselves a little bit of reward for leveling up right now we really have uh, nothing <laughs> so what we will be doing is we could create ourselves a function under player and um, you know have that have that work for us so I'll make sure to open up the player we'll create some new function here we have plenty of empty space so <laughs> I'm going to create something like public void on level up and in here we could say something like max hit point plus plus and hit point would be equal to max hit point. So we're pushing the cap a little bit higher. Say we had a total of 10 hit point before, then we're now at 11. And if we took damage before that, we're bumping that up. So once you level up, you get your all your HP back up uh, as some kind of reward that you, know, you leveled up. That being said, since we're only gonna go up by one, let's go back on the player and just remove some HP. Um, 10 is a little bit too much. I'll go like with five. So player has five hit point now. And if he does level up, he is going to get 6. But first, we have to hook this up to our actual code. On level up is a public function. So we'll make sure to go, say, in our game manager and say on level up on the player this time. So player on level up. Now this is going to work great if we do level up uh, while the game is playing but we'll need something else because once we close the game and uh, we come back up we can't really base ourselves on this thing since we're going to have a, uh, a set of XP already loaded into the game and if we're say level 4 with that amount of XP it's going to level you up but only once which is not really cool. So what we'll do is we'll head back into the player and we'll say public void set level int level. So once we start the game, we're going to give ourselves a chance to actually set the level and uh, say if that level would be 4, then we're going to call on level up 4 times. Let's do a 4 loop in here. So 4, i is equal to 0 as long as i is smaller than level. We are going to say on level up. And we only need to call this at the very beginning once we're loading the game. So we're going to go back in the game manager where we do a load state where is the player level it is somewhere over here so we have the experience and then we're gonna say player set level with the current level so, so get current level okay this way everything should be fixed I'll just create a new section for that and we're going to give this a try in the game so I'd like my XP to be a little bit higher this time um, once we do start the game right now this is totally fine I'm going to give uh, more XP to the actual enemy so I can test this out he's gonna give myself say 10 XP okay now testing this in the game you're going to realize you already have a 6 hit point because level 1 counts as a, a real thing so um, either you actually say, well, don't upgrade it if you are only level 1. Or you could say you start up with 4 HP and it will get an extra HP when you're ready. Uh, it's really up to you. In my case, I'll just say if get current level is equal to 1. Actually, is not equal to 1. If it's not equal to 1, then go ahead and do this. And that is going to block this problem right here. So if I start the game again, I should not be seeing 6. And here I should be seeing 5. Now we're going to kill one enemy and actually get that six hit point. Uh, never mind, I just got hit. Oh, but we do get filled back up, so let's try this. We now have 
sync self. Okay, now we have to test the other settings. So once we load the game up, if we have more than uh, 10 XP, then we're gonna have to create, not create, sorry, but put a set level on our character. So let's go ahead and change the game manager, put that on say uh, 50. I'm not quite sure what level is 50, but we'll see in a moment. Then let's walk through this to have the save state called, even though it's going to crash, you're going to shut off the game, then open it up again. You still have 50 XP as you can see on the game manager. And if we open this up, we are level four, we have nine health. So this is actually working. And if we kill this guy, we should be level five. So let's try this out. We are level five and we have now 10 health. Okay. Now this should be everything we needed to do to get the experience part of this course completed. In the next section, we're going to start patching things up. We're going to make sure we don't have these error pop down here uh, once we transfer scene. We're also going to fix the little glitch, the visual glitch you see here that is really not that appealing. And a couple of other things, we could also add more UI and uh, get the other scenes ready. So I'll be seeing you guys in the next section where we're going to start just getting everything back together, just linking everything together and polishing everything one by one. I'll see you there, guys. Welcome back to the final section of this course, guys. Like we mentioned at the beginning, this is the last one. This is where everything is going to be closed. This is it where everything is going to be linked together and we'll start um, pushing some nice changes to the game that is going to make it more fun and also more playable. Now we've pretty much set all the system, all the groundwork is there. Let's go ahead and get creative a little bit and um, you know make this thing look good. Okay, first thing, we have to restore the flow. We have this one big bug uh, that actually happens when we change scene and we have to make sure we get rid of that before we go any further. Now I'll try to explain in depth exactly what's going on when you change scene over here. You have a um, missing reference exception. What's going on here is that the game manager, since it goes from one scene to the other without being destroyed, it actually loses reference to the weapon, to the player, and also to the, to the floating text. So what needs to happen is either we have a, a game manager that gets destroyed in the first scene and another one in this new scene. Or if we want to keep it that way like it is right now, if we want to keep it so every time we change scene, this one persists, it keeps all the data, we don't have to do a, a, um, a load state again even though we do it for, uh, for other purpose. If we want that to happen, we'll have to also keep the player, also keep the weapon and also keep the floating text manager. We can easily do that, and I'd rather have this second option, um, keeping everything there. We can do that by going under the player and making sure we don't destroy, unload this game object. So this very specific game object. Now this is also going to make sure we don't destroy the weapon, since we say don't destroy the player game object, by default it's not going to destroy its children, which is the weapon in this case. So that is fine if we now play this game and have a look in the inspector or the game manager. When we change scene, we don't lose reference anymore to the weapon and also to the player. We do lose reference to the floating text manager, so if we had something in here, um, that would be a problem. Now you probably realize that we have two of these guys over here and that's definitely not something we can um, allow. So what we'll be doing is we'll head back into the dungeon and get rid of the old one. We don't need the old one anymore since we already have this new guy. Now um, the camera should actually hook up to nothing at this moment so if we go under main, try to play this, you're going to realize we'll have another error where a look at has not been assigned. So we have to make sure we double click on this, go under the camera motor and make sure our look at is being assigned at the start. So private void start will say look at is going to be equal to game object dot find and we're looking for the game object called player and just like this I just realized that we we need to actually put the transform here this is gonna return you the game object not the transform so I went back and I have the transform now let's go ahead and play this okay so that's really cool but you realize that uh, we pretty much spawn on top of nothing and to address this, I am going to create another object, a empty game object that's going to be some kind of waypoint and we'll make sure to teleport the player there every time he spawns. So under dungeon 1, we'll have to do it under main scene as well, but under dungeon 1, 
I will go ahead and uh, just move this around, put it say right here at the beginning. And I'll also put a little icon on it so we can see it better. I will be calling this spawn point. Just like that. And it should now spawn exactly where this thing is. So let's try to make it centered here. Could be fine. We will grab the spawn point, put it in the main scene as well. So we have spawn point in every scene. In here, let's actually zoom in, put it in the middle, there. And every time we load a scene in the game manager, we're going to teleport the player there. So we're going to go and say, when we load the scene, let's also take the player dot transform. Its position is going to be equal to game object dot find spawn point dot transform dot position. Okay, now like this, we should be teleported every time the game starts. Let's try it out. And we've been moved, as you can tell, we have been moved on top of the spawn point. Same thing should happen when we cross the border, and we are now here, at the beginning of the dungeon. Okay. Okay, next up, we have the floating text manager. Same exact thing, we're going to make sure we are allowing this to persist in between scenes, so here it is. I have not actually put anything on top of that, so... Hmm. Let's rename this to floating text manager. I'm trying to figure out why I had another canvas on here. Maybe I don't actually need one. Well, I don't actually need one. So I'll be dragging this script, putting it back one level, and we'll get rid of this, uh, this little children here because that's kind of useless for us. We only need the canvas. I'm going to go make sure I haven't broken anything, and I have in the references. So I'm going to go back in the game manager, dragging, drag and drop this new object. And let's see, what is the other problem? So we broke some references as well, somewhere else. In the floating text manager, we have this reference we broke. It is directly under the same object. We are going to drag ourselves in it. And then, hopefully, everything is back. Okay, so everything is back. Uh, we just have one less object in here, which is making it a little bit more clean. Now, what we'll be doing is we're going to make sure that this one gets never destroyed. So I'm going to double click on it and in a start, private void start, I'm going to make sure to don't destroy this object when we load. Just like this. Now um, if you want to keep the same exact way as we had earlier, for some reason you have a two level um, floating text manager, you can always say transform parent game object. This would work if we had the same exact setup as we had a second ago. But right now, since we clean it up, game object is going to do the job. All right, so let's give this one more try. We are going to switch scene, see if the reference is still there. And it is, so all the reference are kept. Even the pool behind it is kept. And we have everything we need to proceed polishing this game. All right, guys, that will be it for this lesson. I will see you in the next one where we'll go ahead and try to fix this annoying little gap we see in between the tiles. See you there. Welcome back to another lesson. Today we're going to be fixing this annoying bug we see, this visual bug we see with the whole map trying to um, have these little blue line in between the tiles and that is something really really annoying and this should only happen if you have very very low resolution. In our case we do have an extremely low resolution. We have tiles that are 16 per 16 and our camera is literally really really close. Now if our camera was further away we'd have less problem but you see we still do get some so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be changing some of the texture setting and um, it's going to help us have a better result so we're going to go on the atlas the only piece of art we have in this whole game and we're going to go at the top here have a look at the settings. The most uh, important one that we're going to be using is the pixels per unit so this is going to let us scale down a little bit on our texture is going to actually make it bigger, make everything a little bit bigger and forget about the edges. So if we put that on 99 and hit apply, you're going to see we actually fix most of the problem already. I don't see anything um, going on there. We can play with this because we know that like that one last pixel is the one that caused problems. So with 99, 
we have a result that is pretty solid. Now I'll give you an example, if you put that on 50, it's going to make everything look so much bigger and so much more weird. So uh, it's very simple, you just have to play around with this until you find something that matches your art. In our case, 99 would be the best setting, you can also try something like 95, but there's always going to be little visual problem as you can see here on the outside. We have all these squares. And the reason is quite simple, our art is too low definition to make that look um, like pixel perfect. You could go ahead and try out any number you want, um, mine worked best with 99, but of course if you want to be the cleanest possible, you'll have to just make your art a little bit bigger, or make your camera further away. So that is all we needed to do to actually fix this little glitch. Uh, right now it looks pretty good, I don't have so much problem going around. Sometimes you're going to run into uh, visual glitches, but I haven't in a little while, so I'll be keeping 99, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We quit. I will be seeing you <clears throat> quit. What am I doing in the next lesson? In the next lesson, we are going to quit. 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 In the next lesson, quit. In the next lesson, we're going to turn this scene into something playable. Quit. In the next lesson, we are going to start creating something a little bit more uh, fun for the other scene, for the dungeon scene, so something that has a real flow, so you can go back to the main scene, you can kill the boss, and you can do um, a lot more thing. Right now, we can't really do anything in this new scene. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we are going to start creating a flow in between our main scene and then the dungeon one. Um, we are back with the, the dungeon one we've done in the section 3. Before that, I created a dungeon. For the course, I realized it was a little bit too complex at first, so I went ahead and I read it. Uh, the one I've redone is the one you saw in the section three. Now I am back with this, with this new, um, well, new but old uh, dungeon over here. So this one is quite simple. This is where we'll be placing most of the assets, and this is where we're going to be um, creating our flow. So we have the main scene right now, right here sitting. It has a couple of things we have to transfer over to the actual dungeon one. First off, all these chests. Let's get rid of them, let's clean them up. We're gonna remove also the enemy. But before we remove it, let's put it inside of a prefab so we can save the settings over here. Then I'm going to remove it. Um, the portal will need something similar for dungeon one. And what else? Is everything clean in here? I think we're pretty much good to go. Okay, so to transfer over to the dungeon one, we're gonna have to grab a couple of things. Player, it is something we don't destroy on load, so we don't grab that. Main camera already exists on the other scene, we don't grab that. Test and PC, it's just a test right now, we leave him here. We are not going to grab this grid, of course, we won't be using it. Then there is the portal, which we are going to grab. We are not going to grab the game manager, event system as well. Uh, floating text manager, we are not going to grab it, we don't need to since there is a don't destroy on load on it as well. So we'll need portal, menu, UD, and spawn point. I've been selecting those using control um, and click. So I just control, hold control and I click. Now once I have all of these four, I'll do a control C for copy, head over to the dungeon one and just paste. And here is everything we need. Now if you wanted to, what you could do is um, have the menu and have the HUD, don't destroy on load but you have to implement the same exact kind of mechanic we've implemented on the game manager. So once we go back to the main scene, those would be duplicated. So you have to make sure they, they actually they don't exist while another one of these exists. So let's go ahead and take the spawn point first, and I'll just move it where I believe the player should be spawning. And what is this little mistake over here? Okay, it's, it's back to normal. Um, I will be putting that right about here, and in terms of the menu, that's fine, HUD is fine. Now the portal is something else. The portal is something that is not fine, so I'll be um, putting it somewhere, say, around here. I want to have a gate that goes back to the main scene, and I think I'll be putting it right on top, about there. Okay, now you can also play around with the collider size. I'm going to have like two black square that go into the wall and I'll put some torch around it just to signify that that's a door later on. But until then, here they are, if I can keep on editing this thing, okay. So if the player enters this collider, he is going to be teleported to 
main, we have the option to change it down here, so that's pretty cool. Now I'm also going to create another portal, exactly the same as this one, at the end, so where the boss is, I'll put it somewhere right here. So once he's done killing the boss, the player can exit using this portal. Same exact concept. Okay, um, the script is exactly the same as well. Everything should now be good to go. And we're going to go back in the main scene, give this a try. So we're just walking around, we're going to go at the top here, we should be teleported in this scene. Now a couple of bug, uh, <laughs> a couple of things going on right here. We don't have the look at on our camera, so we forgot to transfer that over. Let's go back on the camera. There is this camera motor script, we want to grab this, so I'll just do a copy component, go on dungeon 1, find the main camera, add a camera motor, and paste my component values. Now you'll see that the look at is actually missing, but that's fine because we set it in the start. In fact, since we never actually set it anymore in the inspector, we could go ahead and uh, remove that from a public field, turn it into a private one instead. So once this thing loads up, I'm going to turn my public field into a private. You could also leave it public and add a hide in inspector if you really wanted to. But in my case, I don't need it to be public at all. So I'll just be leaving it like that. And now the field is going to disappear. Okay, let's give this a try under main. All right, so we'll be giving this a try from the main scene. And I head right into here. Uh, the camera is back in focus. We are there with our little weapon and there should be the gateway just a little bit above me right now so we'll give it a try walk right through it and as you can tell we have successfully went back into the main scene now obviously you're gonna find that there is a bug a big bug here on um, the fact that we can have two player at once which is not very very cool and those are both don't destroy on low so technically yep here it is oh also one other thing I forgot as I am doing it is that we didn't bring the event manager which means we can't click on our button and that is a big deal so I'll go back on my main copy over the event system not the event manager the event system put that in the scene anywhere anywhere you just need to drop it in the scene and this one is going to take care of uh, looking at where your mouse is and what you click on so let's go ahead and start this from the main scene if we don't, it's simply going to crash since we don't have a player. Going to go right into the dungeon one, click here, menu is still there, everything still works, and we are pretty much good to go. And now the next step is going to be to actually remove a couple of bugs, so the bug you saw earlier where we have two players, the next step is also going to have to deal with creating content for this actual scene here. Alright, so that's about it. We're going to keep on doing those fast lessons in the section 10 to make sure we polish our game as much as we can before we end this course. Thank you so much for watching. I will be seeing you in the next lesson. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we're going to fix this bug where we have duplicate amount of character and floating text manager. And we're also going to start populating our dungeon 1. So let's go ahead and uh, the first problem we have is the fact that we get duplicated amount of floating text manager and also player. Now we don't have the same problem for game manager even though it is also don't destroy on load and that is because we have this line over here so so if a game manager already exists we get rid of the new one. Well we're also going to do the exact same thing actually at the same exact place but we'll be adding um, our new player and also our new floating text manager so we'll do player.gameObject and floating text manager dot game object. This way, once we transfer back to the main scene, those are already there in the scene, but we want to keep the one we've been using um, for a long time. So as you can tell, the new one, they got deleted and we still hang out with the same exact stuff we had prior. Okay, so having this completed, we are now going to move into this scene and start creating a little bit of content around here. So the first thing I'll do is just make sure I um, I create a visual aspect to my portals. Now I know I have one at the beginning right here, so I'll just open it up so I can see it. And I'll be changing, say, uh, these two tile here to black tile. Okay, 
Now my portal is going to be in here. I'll just make sure to adjust it properly like this. And I might also want to play around with the collision of this so I can just create some kind of hole in here. But before that, I'll go ahead and I'll move on to the bus portal, which should be around here. Like I mentioned, having this completed, I'll hop on the collision layer, turn the tile map render around just so I can see and just change the collision a bit. Go like this instead and open up those two slots. And here we go. So we fix our tile map, we change the level a little bit, and we're now going to turn off our tile map renderer again. Okay. Um, for the sake of just filling in stuff, I'd like to see what's going on on the left hand side, so I'll turn off my menu for now. And it looks something like this. Okay. Now, um, I haven't done any kind of level design for this thing, but we're going to start dragging chests and we'll just put them where uh, we think they would look good. So at the moment, we could put a chest, say, right about there or here. You know, let's just put them a little bit randomly at the moment since we don't really have anything. And we'll be putting some in the back of the bus room. Now you're also going to be aware that you can actually just put one chest and modify the value so the amount of pesos you get. This one could be say 30 pesos, it's a big chest, that's the one you get from the bus. In fact, you could even modify the scale and make this one a little bit bigger. And I'll just place it here. Now uh, these two chests are small chests, um, 5 pesos each. Could be perfect. And we'll just leave that somewhere around here. Okay. Now what I'll be doing just to make everything a little bit more ordered is I will create an empty game object, put everything back on zero, and I will call this one chess with an S. And I'll just put all the chess right in here. This way we have one big object that contains all the chess, and if we need to do some kind of operation on it, we can do a mass operation on all the chess. So in this lesson, I would like to tackle the healing fountain. So this thing at the top here. I want this to be giving hit point back to the actual player um, if he is injured. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new script that's going to require a new script. Call it Ealing Fountain. Ealing Fountain is going to inherit from Collidable. And we will simply override the onCollide function as we've been doing for a bunch of our classes. Let's start with a public int ailing amount. So how much do you eel every second? Uh, you could go ahead and say one. Then private float eel cooldown. Actually, I said how much eel every second, but you can change that to 0 0.5 if you wish. Just use this value over here, and then we'll keep another float for the last time you've eeled. In a protected override void on collide, we are going to create our logic right here. So if time dot time, so if right now minus the last time you've eeled is bigger than the cooldown then go ahead and heal the player. So last heal is going to equal to now. And now we have to heal the player. We don't have any function to heal the player, but that should be quite simple. Let's actually create one on the fly. So game manager instance player, we'll call it heal, and you'll heal him by healing him out. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and um, enter the player.cs in our very empty player script. It's getting a little bit more crowd now, but we still have like a lot of space to put a lot of stuff. We're going to create a public void eel that takes in the int ealing amount. The ealing function is going to do the following. So hit point is going to be plus equal to the amount of hit point you get. So ealing amount. And then we'll check if we're above uh, the max amount. So if hit point is bigger than the max hit point, then we'll have to bump that down to max hit point. So hit point is equal to max hit point. And else, if we actually, uh, if we're not max, then it means we did get healed. And if we did get healed, we're going to do game manager instance show text. We're going to show a little bit of text in here, some green text, uh, plus sign plus the amount. So the healing amount to string plus HP for hit point. Then we can have a size 25. Color is going to be a nice little green. Do we have a light green? Uh, we could create one, but right now I'll put it on green. Add the transform dot position. And a motion. Yeah, we could use a motion vector 3 dot up, say times 30. 
and we make it stick for a full second. So now I just realized that there is a flaw in here if our healing amount is above one. If our healing amount is above one, um, we might trigger this over here without being full HP. So we're still going to get healed, but we won't trigger this deck. So what I'll do is I'll just swap that around. Maybe go for something like this instead. And we'll just check uh, right off the get-go. So if, if the hit point oops, is equal or bigger. Actually, if the hit point is equal to max hit point, we're just going to return. So we don't need to go anywhere else. So if we are max hit point, we're not going to do anything. But then you still have to do the clamping. So if hit point is bigger than max hit point, then hit point is going to be equal to max hit point. But you still have to do the show text because you did heal. And that should be it, I believe. Okay, let's go ahead and implement this in the game. I'll be dropping a small enemy in here just so I can take some damage. Uh, let's put him right in the middle. And now we're going to create the healing fountain. As far as the healing fountain goes, I'll create an empty game object. And I'll put a collider on it. So let's call that healing fountain. I'll be putting a box collider 2D. And I'll be putting the healing fountain script. I'm going to make it a, a tad smaller and also position it properly. It is going to be right around here at the top. So when the player is inside of this, he should be ill. Now I did not put that on default, I did not put that on actor or anything like that. And technically, if I remember uh, correctly, this should work. And uh, we're going to give it a try. So let's go right ahead, jump into the action, see if we get hit. Yep, we do get hit. Um, for some reason, I did get heal right there. I'm not quite sure why. Oh, all right. So it turns out that the uh, the fountain actually collides with with the wall, and then we get the hit point because we never do a check to know whether this is a player or not. So let's go back. And on the healing fountain, we're gonna say if call dot name is not equal to player then we're going to return, so we're not going to run the rest of this code. Now, let's go back and try this once more. Don't forget to turn on your menu again, else this is going to crash. We have a total of 15 HP right now, let's take some hit. And kill this guy. 11 HP is what we have, and then if we go to the healing fountain, you see, we are going to gain some hit point back until we reach 15 and then we're good to go again. Alright, so this is where we'll be ending this lesson. In the next one, we're going to be creating some objects we can destroy with our sword. See you there. Welcome back to another lesson. Today we're going to be making a destroyable object that we can simply kill with our weapon. You're going to laugh at how easy this is. Let's actually do it in a matter of less than a minute. We're going to right click on script create C sharp script. I'll call this one create because I'll be I'll be using crates as object I will destroy. Now we have to open up Visual Studio which is the longest part of this thing. And we're until it boots completely. And here is what we do. We make this inherit from fighter and we override on def to give it something like uh, a destroy game object. And that's it. That's all we need to do to make the um, the create object. Why exactly is that only it? Well, we're going to go back and dive into fighter really quickly. We have hit point, we have max hit point. Uh, so, so our crate already has some hit point values. And it is also immune for one second. We already have all of that. It has a push direction, but since it does not inherit from mover, we never really use that. Uh, worst case scenario, you have to push direction if you want to create some kind of special effect in like and send it in, in a direction. You could do that. It's really up to you. You have the hit direction, so something you might want to do in the future. And finally, you have the receive damage. So everything is already there. The only thing we didn't have is the destroy call. And to be completely honest, we could be putting it in here and uh, not even have to worry about putting anything in create.cs. 
but we've done it and we created our crate. Now, how do we go about testing this out? It's going to be fairly simple. We're going to spawn the crate. Now, there is two crates over here, the, no, actually three crates that are bound into the tile set. And that's kind of annoying because if we want crates to be destroyable in our game and we put those here that are not destroyable simply because uh, the reason they're not destroyable here is because they are a hole and they are in tile map. So it's going to be odd to put collider on those and put the crate.cs. Uh, by the way, I actually want to go back and remove those from tile map and just spawn some crate on top of it uh, later on. So we'll do that at the end of the episode. But let's actually go ahead and go under artwork, atlas, find some crate. I'll use crate zero and create one. Not sorry, not create, but create. I'll just drag these two at the same time. Whoops, not in here. So one at a time. All right, create zero, create one, and we will be moving them, say, over here. Give them the interactable layer so we can see them, and I'll make them match as best as I can. Actually, if you hold V on the keyboard while you're dragging over your object, you're going to see you can you can actually snap on those little points. So we'll snap top left drag this down here so it snaps on this one as well. Now this whole crate is one object. We're going to create one object, empty game object, and this one's going to be a single crate. Put the origin on 0, 0, 0, then take the two crates, put them here. So I have one object that contains these two together. I'm also going to make sure I just position them properly at 0, 0, 0. There we go. And then I'll just fix the mess I've done. Go back, just making sure it's clean, basically. That's what I'm trying to achieve here. So this goes there. Okay, now I can actually move the single crate using the bigger object, and it's going to move the whole thing as a whole. Right, so what I'll be doing right here is I'll use a box collider 2D again. Make sure this one fits my, uh, my need. So I'll go for something like this. And we should be holding the collider properly at this point. What I'm going to do is uh, I'll put that back on 0, 0, make a prefab out of it by drag and dropping this in the prefab folder. And um, the reason I'm doing this is simply because we'll be reusing crate in the future. In fact, this one is not completed. I forgot to put the crate.cs on it. And also, um, the layer at the top. Right now we have a, a crate that's going to do what we want it to do. So if we go here... Hit it, it should actually do something. Nope, because it does not have the fighter tag. Uh, if we want this crate to receive damage, it has to be under the fighter tag. And now that's fine, we can hit it. The only problem is that, as you can see, we can just go on top of it, which is kind of annoying. So let's go back on our crate, put the tag fighter, and also put the liar on blocking. This way, we are not going to be able to run through it, so we're stuck here. And then we're going to start doing damage to this thing until we hit Tenet Point. And here we are. We're free. Tenet Point might be a little bit overkill for crate. I'll be putting two. Uh, or even one. Like, you can only one hit this thing. That could work as well. Really depends on what you like the best. And once that is completed, make sure you hit Apply. After cleaning your object, make sure you hit Apply. So this applies to your prefab object. Okay. Now, having this completed, where is my play? Oh, it's behind the crate. Okay. <laughs> having this completed, I'm going to move these away and actually put crate that are destroyable. So I will be doing that right now, just matching this object. And then let's go ahead and find the other crates. Here they are. So two and three. Create an object for that. Call it two crates, give it the fighter tag, the blocking layer, and then we're going to drag these two guys beneath this object so it becomes a children, and let's put them on the interactable layer. And here we go, so just snap this, here we go, we have everything we need, create a CS uh, box collider 2D. And I'm not sure if we want this one to match exactly the last one. We'll see what we can do with this. 
you know what let's actually make it match there we go oops I keep clicking next to it this is really annoying alright so this one could be a little bit more tough it can have three hit point and we are then going to save this under the prefab as well so let's move this on top of these one try to be pixel perfect if you're not that's not a big deal and then what I'll do finally is I'll just turn those off for the moment and I'll go on my tile map try to get rid of uh, what we had earlier so which one contains the crate so design is the one that contains the crate I'm gonna go right ahead shift click these things oh sorry I have to be under design here then I will be shift clicking these things and since we're here might as well add a little bit of shadow right there there we go looks pretty right we're going to turn on those crates again and same result as before but this time we can actually go ahead and smack those crates and they disappear cool stuff so we have crates let's go ahead and put some in our other map so let's head over to the scene dungeon one and I'm simply going to be placing some uh, in the middle here so it blocks the way so the player knows he's gonna have to use his weapon um, and if he doesn't know well we'll have to teach him in some ways maybe by putting an NPC that say hit the crates that could work um, what happened oh I'm still I still have my uh, brush right here so I'm gonna make sure I actually close the tile palette I don't want to be making any modification um, without really meaning it so let's play some crate in here that's fine we can also put a single crate just below it and it should still be blocking we can even give it a small offset that could work two crates like this and I just want something that blocks the way basically so maybe put another one down there well the player cannot move with these in the way that's for sure now is that the best placement that looks the best I don't think so maybe something like this could be better okay now uh, let's actually give this a try so if we go in the game we head up in the dungeon we can't move we have to destroy these crates there we go those are our very first object we're starting to get a little bit of the gameplay over here we have the e-link fountain the enemy the chess um, and of course the crates in the next lesson we're gonna have a look at how to create those little animated sprites that are going to be some torches uh, we can put them around the doors over here so that's gonna let you know um, that this is a door that's like a little bit of graphical upgrade we're going to put in here okay so we'll see you guys in the next lesson Welcome to another lesson. Today we're going to create a sprite animation. There is a couple of ways we can do this, but with the new system, it is fairly simple. Let's actually go find our sprites at the bottom here, under our art atlas. Now we already cropped those um, properly, so they all add the same size, they all add the, um, the same exact width, the same height, and by having those already cropped out like this, all we have to do to create the animation around that is to go ahead, choose them in the uh, in the sprites down here, and just do a shift click on everything, and we'll be able to drop that right under the arrow key. This is actually going to create you the whole animation by itself. We can call that one torch, and it will also create a animator and also an animation. So we'll go ahead, take this drag it under our animation folder which should be at the top here and we'll have a look at what's going on because it's already done we can already drag this um, wherever we want so as you can see we have the torch one in the scene I can put that on a more visible layer such as wall and you'll see that if we play the game the animation is already live now um, I haven't started from torch zero because torch zero is no fire at all so that would have been weird in the middle of the animation okay so let's have a look what exactly happened here 
they have created a animator with a animator controller, which we can see here. I'll just rename that to torch and rename the animation to torch with a small t. And under that animation, you're going to be able to see what they do. So let me go and open up the animation window. All they do is they put all the frames we put in the, uh, the scene and they just put a different sprite every single frame. So sprite zero is, if we click on it, it would be torch one sprite, torch two, three, four, five. I'm looking at the right hand side over here. So that's exactly what they've done. You could have done it manually. I remember doing it multiple time uh, manually, but hey, um, I found this new tactic now and it's so much easier. You can just drag and drop this in the scene and they will do that for you. Um, I thought it was kind of important to show what's going on in the background in case for some reason it doesn't work for you. And also remember that this is a uh, this is under the animator. So if you think this is too fast, you can go ahead and manually change the sprite, or you can go back in the animator, click on Torch, which is your animation, and make that uh, slower. So say something like 0 0.7, and I am quite satisfied with 0 0.7. So I'll go ahead and just put the rest of the information we need on this Torch for it to work. Starting off with a collider. So a box collider 2D, and I'll open this one up. It looks like this. I think that's fine. Um, we'll also put a layer that is blocking. Actually, the collider, I'll just make that a little bit smaller so you can walk behind the flame. All right, here we go. Okay, I'll rename this to Torch, and I will be saving it under my prefab folder. So... Let's go ahead and get rid of this one. We're going to go in dungeon one and just put that next to our gates. We have one torch that's going to be right about there. And another one on this side. I'll be copying these two and moving them over to the other gate. Which is right here. Okay, now if we play in the main scene, we go directly in the game, see how this looks. I've played a bit, as you can tell, I have the, the sword. It now looks like this, so we have some moving sprite in the scene. It looks a lot better than if there's nothing, of course. And the more you add moving stuff in your scene, the more it's going to feel alive. So I do encourage you to find other kind of sprite you can move around, because those make a really huge difference. Now in terms of moving the player around, it would be the exact same thing, but you'd have to bounce in between different states. So if he's idle, you put him in a state where there's only one uh, frame of this very specific uh, pose right here. But if he's moving, every time he's moving, you could do that with a set float or a set trigger on your player state machine. You could say, well, if he's moving, you're now playing that animation where he just moves his feet slightly. And if speed reaches zero or if... Uh, the trigger idle is being activated, then you just put him back in that state. So it would be a mix of what we just done right here with the lights, and also a mix of what we've done for the menu animator. In the next one, we're going to be adding a hit point bar on the left hand side over here and fixing some HP bug. Welcome back to another lesson. Today we're going to expand our HUD. This way we can have another kind of hit point bar um, but this one is not going to be in text and it's not going to be in the menu. It's going to be live in the game. I'm thinking about putting it just above this little chest. So let's actually get started. So it's going to be quite simple. What I'll be doing is pretty much the same exact thing we've done for the XP bar. So under HUD, I will be creating a new image. And that image, I'll make sure to anchor it bottom left. Um, I'll give it exactly the same size. And the same offset as the chest. So let's go ahead and go down. Maybe 75. And as far as the width goes, we'll go on 64. And the height is really up to you. We could go up to 125. And that would be my um, my hit point bar over here. In terms of the background color, I'll be using a dark red color. Something like this. So I will be calling this health bar. And under it, there's going to be another image exactly the same so UI image this one is going to scale on both axes so I can get the size put that on zero and then back to 
the bottom axis. I'm holding shift, this way it hankers at the bottom. Okay, this one has to be a brighter red, so something like this. And all we have to do at this point is play around with the scale not in X, but the scale in Y. So it goes up like this and down. Okay, so having this completed, all we have to do now is the code beneath it. And we'll hook this up at different places, but um, the first place I'd like to hook this up actually is in the game manager. And in the game manager, there is going to be a function we'll create. If we just collapse everything, um, we could go right about here and just say hit point bar and create a function called public void on hit point change. So this happens once you uh, get hit, but also when you get healed, which is why we can't just put it at one place in the code. It has to be in the game manager because the fountain is going to be calling it, the enemies are going to be calling it, and so on. So we'll need a hit point and also int max hit point. We could also fetch those manually from um, the player, but it's really it's really up to us. We could do player dot hit point. This is you know this is public, so we could technically go here. Actually, I like that better, so let's go and remove these. And all we'll have to do in here is get the ratio. So ratio, this time it's not going to be as complicated as um, as what we had earlier for the experience. And that is because we have we already have our two values. We already have hit point and also the max hit point. So player hit point divided by float player max hit point. And we already have a ratio at this point. We'll do hit point bar, which is something we don't have at the moment. I totally forgot about that. Let's go um, in the fields, and we're going to get a reference to our hit point bar, and we'll get it as a rec transform. Like this. Let's go back down. Hit point bar dot local scale is going to equal to a new vector 3, 1, ratio, and 1. Remember, we're not modifying the X in this case. I made the bar vertical, so we're going to be modifying it um, going up and down. Now, coming to think about it, we don't need to put it inside of the healing fountain since we can hook it up in um, the heal function inside of player. So we'll have it at two places in here. We'll have it on the unreceived damage and also on the um, heal function we have right here. Right. Now, uh, unreceived damage, I don't think we have it in there. We'll have to overwrite it. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create two new function. Actually, only one. Um, that one's going to be a override. So I'll put it with the override at the top there. Protected, override, receive damage. And we still do the base. We don't want to mess around with anything else. We do the base and then we do game manager instance on hit point change. And we'll copy this line over. We'll also need it when we get yield. So down here, if we do show the text, then we're going to go ahead and say uh, update my UI as well. Having this done, we're going to go in the game manager and find our reference. It is right here. Let's go ahead and drag and drop this hit point bar, the last one, the one that is bright, under there. All right, so we're going to actually take this and copy it over to the other scene because we don't have any enemy in here. I'll go under the HUD, take my um, health bar, and my health bar is going to be transferred over to Dungeon 1. Make sure it is under the HUD, else it is not going to be rendered. Simply because it needs to be under a canvas to be rendered. Okay. Let's go ahead and see what's going on in that scene. Now, um, I've already leveled up, already played the game a little bit, so I have 21 health right now, which is another problem. But let's see if we do hit, get hit. So, okay, apparently the object has been destroyed and we can't access it anymore, which means our reference was not a good one, uh, simply because those are being deleted when we swap scene. Okay, now because we put that under the game manager, we are going to run into a problem, simply because once we change scene, this reference is going to be lost. Uh, we have to make sure that this one stays throughout the scenes. And the way we're going to do this, well, first, we can either do that through the scene, like I just mentioned, with a don't destroy and load, or we could also say um, this is going to be equal to whatever the name of our game object is. 
there is two way well, actually there is more than two ways in programming there is always a couple of different ways you can work on these things if we want to be really lazy we could go up in the update and say don't destroy unload and just take that hit point bar dot game object and this would technically work so now we could be lazy and just do that but what I'd like to do instead is to create a whole new script and get rid of all my destroy all node. They're a little bit hard to track at the moment so what I'll do is I'll just get rid of them all. I'll hit control shift and F, find any more don't destroy uh, which are going to pop up down there. So we have one under the floating text manager, we have one under the game manager and we have one under player. So I'll be getting rid of all of these. I'll create myself a new C sharp script and this one will be called don't destroy. Simple as that. All it's going to do is at the start or at the awake, let's do that in the awake actually, private void awake, we're going to say don't destroy game object and uh, sorry don't destroy on load game object. Now I'll go back on every single one of these objects that I've deleted from and I'll just add this component. And just having this component is going to tell me that this object now persists. So that's going to be quite useful. Right, next up we have the game manager, don't destroy. We have the floating text manager, which is a don't destroy. And let's also don't destroy this HUD, like the whole button and this hit point bar. This way I won't need to have it over here, so I'll remove it. That's from dungeon 1. Now since we're here, let's also get rid of the menu. Let's also make sure this one is not being uh, reinitialized every time. So I'll put a don't destroy on that one as well. And we're going to realize that most of our work is uh, pretty much being duplicated once we go back in here. So now we have two HUD, we have two menu, kind of a mess. We don't want that to happen, of course. So, but um, we're going to have some more reference at the moment. That one's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a game object actually. That's going to be the HUD. And then a public game object that's going to be the menu. And I don't know why I put those in cap, I usually don't. So let's go ahead and turn that back into small letters. At the top here, we'll be destroying those two things, those two new things. So HUD and the menu. Okay, so we're basically destroying five things now as soon as the game starts. Not that optimal, but like I mentioned, we're going to have a, a small lesson on how to make this more clean and uh, more optimal of course. So back on my game manager, let's go and drag this. So that's my HUD and that's my menu. I just needed the reference only so I could destroy them later on. Let's play this, see if it works. We are in the new scene. The menu still works, looks accurate. We go back here and we don't have any duplicate, I don't think so. So everything that actually persists through both scenes are thing that just stays there all the time. So that's pretty cool. That's a good way to do things. And now um, you can barely see it, but I did take some damage, which means our hit point went down. But our hit point, if you have noticed, every time we change scene, our hit point actually glitches a little bit. We were at 36, now we're at 45. Now we're at 53. So, you know, it just goes up uh, when we change scene, which is definitely not something we want. And it's something quite annoying. The beauty of what we just did right now is the fact that we don't have to do the load state anymore. Since we're already like moving everything we we know uh, from one scene to another, including the game manager, the XP, the pesos, all that kind of stuff is being moved over. We don't need to do the load state anymore. So we only have to save like a real game. So you would only save, save, save. And at the beginning, you load once. So we don't have to do the load state anymore. Let's double click on it. Head over to the load state. I'll be removing those debug.log since I'm here. And we'll make sure that uh, we actually remove that from the events. So just like we did in the awake over here where every time we load a new scene, we're going to do a load state. We're going to remove it right about there. So actually at the beginning, we're going to remove it. We're going to say scene manager, scene loader, minus equal this function. So the load state. Now with this in the way, we should not be able to uh, have this glitch anymore. So we're currently at 13 HP. If we, oh, <laughs> if we head back here, of course, there's going to be something to be done uh, because we're being teleported somewhere 
quite weird, but at least our hit point is fine and we can now try and fix this problem. Now what's going on here is since we removed the load scene, we also removed this call um, at the top there, which is something we want to keep on doing. So you want to be uh, splitting those in two. And let's create another function for on scene loaded. We'll make it public void. Actually, we'll copy the same exact thing we had here. Public void on scene loaded. And inside of here, we will simply do what we need to do every time in use scene load. In that case, that's going to be our call, which I unfortunately deleted, so I'll just rewrite it. Um, it's going to be something like player dot transform position is equal to game object dot find spawn point dot transform dot position. Make sure we add this at the very top, so in the events. So when we load a scene, scene manager, scene loaded plus equal and on scene loaded. Here we go. So now this one's going to be called every time we load a new scene and this one is going to be called only the first time we load the scene. So that's also um, when the game loads. Technically you could put the load state instead of some kind of start or update and that would have worked as well. Okay, so we should be good to go at this point. We have fixed this problem. Um, we don't have anything else to do with the HP. Let's go ahead and get hit, see if our hit point bar goes down. So it does, as you can tell, and the only thing left we're gonna have to do with hit point is whenever we die, we're gonna have to show some kind of menu, um, you know, so the player knows he's dead. Something I quickly forgot while I was playing the game was testing this out is um, the fact that we don't call on hit point was changed uh, when we level up. Like right here, I just kill this guy, I leveled up, but we did not change the hit point, but we know that um, whenever we do get a level up, we're supposed to be max on hit point, as you can see on the top right side over here. So we have 14 hit point out of 14, which means if I go on the fountain, uh, well, this happens. So we don't know that we're full hit point because the bar is not topped. If we click though, we can see it, but uh, you know, but this is not really what we want. So let's go ahead and put that as well on the on level up, which should be under the game manager. And we're going to go on on level up, make sure we call on hit point change. Okay, so that's the little addition I had to do before we close this lesson. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we'll be adding a free-to-use font and a free-to-use commercially font, which is also very important if you plan on monetizing your game. We are on a website called 8001funds.com, and in here we'll be looking for something that is actually um, our style. So I'll go maybe with something blocky, which is definitely not our style. Something more pixelated would be good. But this website has a ton of different fonts you can have. Um, and as you can see, they also have like sections. So pixel is what I'm looking for. This could be good for our game. We have to make sure that this little icon over here is green. So it's free for commercial use. Sometimes it's red, which means uh, it's free for personal use, but you can't use that on a monetized project. Something really important to do as well when you're looking for a font is to make sure they do have the character uh, you need. So in our case, uh, we don't really have any special characters. We have the plus sign and that's pretty much it. So let's do plus five here. See what it looks like when they print it. Oh, and um, I think I'm going to be rolling with this one. PXL by Levy. So oh, actually this one is not free for not, not free for commercial use. So let's go ahead and move up to maybe another page. And uh, see, this one's pretty similar. It looks good. It is free for personal use and commercial use. So I'll be downloading that. And all we have to do in Unity is once we have the font, extract this. Make sure you copy the fonts. So there is two fonts in here. Make sure you copy them. So just take these two fonts, copy or cut. And you're going to go right inside of your game. Right click in your artwork folder, show in Explorer, and just paste them in here. They're going to be loaded up. And um, it's, it's quite cool because that's all you need. You don't need anything else. They, you just need to put the font in there and Unity is going to recognize it. So, okay. Now, if we want to use it inside of the game, 
for all these menu we have to go back on these and actually set the font to something else so I'll go under menu uh, we have the container the equipment equipment has only one text it is the upgrade button text and we're going to change the font from Arial to this and here we go we have the hundred being written in such a weird way but uh, you know 75 is not so bad <laughs> alright so uh, from here you now have your new font size so it's really up to you to decide whether or not this is too big or too small I don't dislike this so I'll just be putting that in different color maybe maybe a little bit more gray like this that could work and you're just going to go with the feeling of what you like the most now these one I unfortunately don't have any icons I can put so what I'll do is I just put a text in here and that text is simply gonna be an arrow something like this that's all I have unfortunately I don't have any uh, UI pieces done so kind of annoying but at the same time that's gonna do the job for now okay let's go ahead and scale this up that's our arrow might want to remove the dash and let's look at what it looks like in a different font. So in a different font, in this new font, it actually doesn't look that bad. Now I think about it. We'll be duplicating that, putting it under the right arrow as well. Then put that on the left hand side. Or right hand side. And here we go. So we have this. Moving on. Character information. This one is pretty much only text. So what I'll do is I'll just grab the six text label. And change them in one go. Okay, so that's fairly cool. I'm um, going to need to up the size of these. Maybe like that. And then up the size of these as well. Maybe give them a bigger margin. And here we go. We have something like this now. Looks a lot better. And to be consistent, we also have to do it on this. Okay. So our font is definitely a lot different than what it was before. But it's still there, it's still readable, it still looks good, that's max. And where else are we using font? We're using font in the floating text as well. So if we go here, as you can see those seven, they don't look too great. Those one don't look too great. The cool thing about this is we only have to change it at one single place and that single place would be under the prefab so for floating text prefab click on it put that on the new font and we should now be good to go now speaking about floating text i was thinking about doing it a long time ago but we're going to do it uh in this lesson we're going to give some some text to the npc so the npc never speak he never does anything right now he's just sitting there and calling the really annoying um default on collide so let's go ahead and give him some text and to do this I will be creating a new .cs class so I'll go under script call that intro npc or even better we could just create a whole new class for uh, those kind of little dialogue guy we could call them npc text person whatever you feel like really and what we'll do is we'll create a public string that's going to be the text and this is how we'll be changing it from different NPCs make sure we override on collide so on sorry not on collide collidable and then we're going to override on collide so protected override on collide public string message and when we do collide all we have to do is the following so Game Manager, Instance, Show Text, let's show our message, the font size, let's make that like 25, um, color, color.white, it's going to be very, very neutral. We could also make it like change at the top here, so you can have a public color and change it directly in the inspector as well. Uh, position is going to be transform, dot position, no motion on this one, so vector 3, dot 0, and it goes up for a duration of about three or four seconds something very very long so they can read okay now having this completed let's head back on our little guy so where is the test NPCs over here let's call him intro NPC now he deserves to have a new name and instead of having a collidable script we're gonna have the 
NPC text person. As far as the text goes, we're going to say something like, uh, welcome to the course. Hit the boxes with the sword. For no reason. Okay. Right. And if we do welcome him now, he should be shouting this. Oh, it is quite annoying. And the reason it is quite annoying is because, um, as you can tell, is being repeated like there's no there's no downtime at all so let's put a cooldown on this thing cooldown could simply be the same exact way as we do all cooldowns so private float cooldown uh, we'll put that on four private float last shout and we're gonna do a if time dot time minus last shout is bigger than cooldown then go ahead and say what you have to say. Let's make sure the last shot is also equal to time.time. .time, and I'll replace this by the cooldown. Here we go. Should not stack the same way it was stacked before. So he goes like, welcome to the course, hit the boxes. Now, um, this is a little bit annoying because the text is on top of the guy, so we don't really want that. What I'll be doing is I'll go back on the code and I will actually change the transform the position to have transform the position plus uh, the best case scenario like to have it perfect is we would go ahead and get the box collider uh, 2D then do something like dot size or dot bounds. Do we have bounds? They do have bounds. Nice. Dot center, actually bound extent dot y and that way that would be above the actual collider of this thing. So we could either do that um, or we could just set it a manual value of say vector three dot up. This way it does it one above where it should be. Now something you probably notice as well is that he doesn't start speaking at first. We have to wait four seconds, which is not what we want. And also vector three dot one is a lot <laughs> is a lot too high. Um, so we're going to reduce that. But to fix the problem where he does not speak for the four, first four seconds, that should be quite simple. We have to make sure that last shout is equal to minus cooldown at the beginning. Now we can't do that. We can't, we can't really assign that to another uh, field at the top here in C-sharp. So we can either do minus four menu like this, or we could go ahead and make it clean. So say public void. Uh, start last shout is going to equal to minus cooldown this way when the game starts actually this one is being overridden so you might want to do a protected override at this point it's getting a lot of overhead for almost nothing but i would suggest you just go with last shout is equal to minus four in this case um but in my case i just did the whole thing okay so this should appear instantly though it's going to appear very very up Fire up. So we're gonna go back and turn that into vector three dot up times zero dot sixteen, or even better, new vector three zero point sixteen actually zero, then zero point sixteen, and then zero again. So it's gonna be sixteen pixel above the player, which should leave a little bit of space in between the ed and the text. There we go. Welcome to the course, hit the boxes for no reason. Amazing, so we just change our text pretty much everywhere. I don't think we have any more text um, laying around that uses the old font. So we are pretty much good to go. And that will be the end of this lesson. In the next lesson, we'll be adding a really big boss at the end here. Welcome back to another lesson. In this one, we're going to create a boss that has a special ability uh, a little bit different from this small enemy we have over here. And uh, since we're here, I just killed a small enemy. I just want to show what happens when you are max level, currently level 10, uh, have 15 health. Should I have 15 health? I kind of took a damage real quick. Let me go heal. There we go. So 15 health. I have this amount of pesos. And this is what happens with the XP bar. So it says your amount of total XP right now. Okay. Now, today we'd like to be placing a boss in here. And we'll be adding a little bit of different abilities because uh, the small enemy just rushed towards you. Then... The boss, I want him to rush towards you as well, maybe not as fast. And I also want him to have stuff rotating around it that could hit you, uh, potentially. So, 
Let's go ahead and crop one of the monster out of the atlas. So which one could be good? Let's actually use this one. It looks funky, so I'll be using that. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's see. We can make it 32 by 32. That would be perfect. And we're only one. We're only missing one pixel in height, so I'll be taking it higher like this. So I'll call this bus underscore zero. And that is gonna be it, I believe. Let's click apply. And uh, since we're here, let's also grab some of these little guy because we'll need something that orbits around this. Now this is kind of ugly, so we're gonna take a something that is also ugly. Maybe this little piece of fire here, this little uh, droplet of fire. Let's make that 16 per 16. And I will be calling this enemy underscore one. Okay, let's hit apply. We're gonna go right into the dungeon. So let's open up this new scene. And let's go right at the end here. So at the end of this dungeon, I'll drag and drop my boss underscore zero. Put it in here, make sure it is on the actor sorting layer. And uh, should we make it bigger? Is that big enough? We could go ahead and try to duplicate its size. That would be a lot. Uh, way too big actually, so let's put that 1.5 and here we go. Now um, this one is going to require a new boss.cs, so let's just call that boss. It's a new C-sharp script. We're going to create it, put it in the script folder so we don't leave it hanging there for too long. And let's open it up and actually code a little bit of that. So what I'm going to be doing with this one is I will be creating a fireball that orbits around the boss. And this is very, very simple to do. In fact, I kind of inspired myself from a uh, old video I've made in the past, the third person camera I've made in the past, and I will be doing pretty much the same exact thing here. So what's going on is we're going to need a speed for that fire. Actually, before anything, uh, we're going to have to inherit from not even fighter. I still want to have the same behavior as enemy. So we'll inherit from enemy. This way we can grab the, the moving behavior and... Um, on top of that, there's going to be the little fireball. So boss is going to have this public float called fireball speed. I'll put that on something like 3 or 2.5. We'll see it's public, so we'll be able to adjust it while the game is playing. And in a private void update, every single frame, what I will be doing over here, and I don't know if I'm actually allowed to use the update, um, the enemy seems to be using a fixed update, so I guess we're, we're going to be fine here. What I feel like doing in here is the following. So we're going to have maybe uh, one enemy or two enemy that we will be uh, assigning with a transform component. So public transform, you can call that fireball. And um, that fireball is going to move like this. So fireball dot position is going to be equal to my position as the boss. So transform dot position. And then we'll do a new vector tree. And this one's going to be a little bit funky. We're going to have to come out with the uh, the mats if you haven't done mat in a long time. So we'll do a minus mat f using a cost operation on time dot time, And we'll multiply that by the fireball speed. Oh, and on top of that, we also need a distance. So I'll do time distance. And that's going to be our x value. Distance is not uh, declared. So let's go ahead and do that. Put that equal to say 0 0.25. Of course, these are public. We'll be able to modify them directly in the inspector. So that would be our X. Now for the Y, it's going to be the same operation, but instead of being a cost, it's going to be a sin. And this one's going to be positive. Time dot time, time speed, and time distance. And finally for the Z, we'll just put a zero in here. Let's give this a try. See what happens in the game. See if we have the behavior we want. So I'll be putting that on boss.cs, it's already here. Wait until it compiles and we are going to first give it a decent amount of HP. 10 is 10 is fine. And um, the rest is what we need down here. So the fireball speed, the distance, and also the fireball. So we'll have to create another object in here. I will go ahead and find my enemy underscore one, that is my little fireball. I'll put it beneath my boss. Reset the position. And it should be here as soon as I put it on my proper sorting layer, which is um, actor in this case. That might be a little bit too big, so maybe you want to put that on 0 0.6 like it was a second ago. 
and yeah that could do the job right so having this done I will go ahead and I'm going to put the enemy underscore one under fireball and give this a try now this is going to crash because I'm not in the player scene but we'll see the mechanic happening right here on the right hand side so as you can see it does rotate around it um, we're gonna need to do a little bit more though maybe increment the distance so it's something like this the fireball speed could also be increased so it goes really really fast it's really up to you at that point I'll leave mine on something like this we can have one that rotates uh, positive and also have another one that rotates negative so we could do that without any problem now I'm going to move the boss see what happens if I move this guy the fireball moves with me which is a behavior I wanted to have in the first place now if we wanted to we could actually turn these into lists so we could say public float um, here and fireball speed would be equal to say 2.5 for the first one and if we have a second fireball this one could be equal to minus 2.5 so we'd have one going clockwise in a one another one going um, anti-clockwise and same thing here we'll need an array of fireballs with an s and we'll just do a for each transform t in fireballs and go ahead and run this into a for each statement so it would be t dot position is equal to transform dot position and then we would go here fireball speed would be um the index okay how do we get the index we are in a for each statement so we're not going to get the index let me actually get rid of that really quickly turn my for each statement into a for statement a normal for statement as long as fireball dot length as long as i is smaller than fireball dot length we'll take this put it back up and instead of calling it t we will be calling it fireball at the index i and we'll be using i here as well in fireball speed and just like this we're going to be able to have multiple fireball as many as you want in fact as long as you make sure that you have enough fireball speed to um, to fit all the fireballs in here so if we have three make sure you also have three speeds and in terms of speed um, I'll actually reset my values what did we have earlier we had 2.5 and minus 2.5 so that will do the job let's go ahead put two fireballs in here is everything else fine um, the XP value could be something like 10 in here and we'll add another enemy and we'll put these in the two fields down here click on play we're gonna see the behavior as you can see they do rotate around the enemy uh, actually they rotate around the boss and they just do their thing now there is one problem with this they don't do any damage so we're gonna make sure to fix that and also increment the distance here because that's not enough let's do 0 0.35 that could be perfect so I modify that 0 0.35 and I will go under enemy both of them and I'll add the enemy hitbox and just like this this boss and these enemy became a lot more dangerous the only problem we have at this moment is that yeah of course they have their enemy hitbox but they don't have the actual collider behind it so every single one of these are going to be using a collider let's go ahead and add a box collider 2d to this thing and the collider on these one might be a little bit too uh, stretch so let me put that down like that that would be fine I believe that's with the fireball now the boss is also gonna require a enemy hitbox and what we did with the enemy earlier is that we can have like an end box that's gonna serve as um, what the player needs to it and another hitbox that is just the boss hitbox so we'll do the same exact thing I'll be copying it over from the small enemy so I'll just take this thing put it as a children of the boss and just reset the position of it now this is a collider I will be working with this is a collider that is going to hit the player so we're gonna have to make this one quite big maybe something like this could be big enough so if the player hits a tentacle at the top here he's not gonna get hurt he's just gonna get hurt if he enters that square we're currently building okay in terms of damage it's a boss so we want him to do a little bit more damage let's do like two the fireball they can do one damage we're fine with that but the boss we want him to do three even three damage maybe with a bigger push force of six okay 
Now the bus itself is going to require another box collider and this is the one we'll be hitting with our sword. So let's go ahead and modify that. We're going to have to hit a little bit inside of the boss hitbox, like the one that does damage. And there we go, we just created a new boss. Let's go ahead and try this out. We should be killing him in two hits because we have the best sword at the moment. Let's go back under the main scene and run this game. So we can see him on the uh, on the scene view right here. He's already... Oh, he's way too fast. <laughs> but if I get hit by one of these, let's see what happens. Oh, they actually pass over me. Let's try. Let's try getting hit. It's actually quite hard to get hit by this thing. Now that I realize that. Oh, there we go. As you can see, we did get pushed by these little fireballs. So there's going to be some adjusting to be done. Now there's also going to need some... Um, a proper tag on this boss so if we go back on the boss real quick he needs to have the fighter tag and he needs to be on the actor layer I forgot about that um, the fireball they don't need to be on the fighter layer because we can't kill them we don't want to kill them anyway so let's leave them like that and let's also make sure we bring them a little bit closer to the boss so we can go over here distance let's make that 0.3 Okay, I'm going to give this one more try, and everything should be good to go after that. Alright, so here we are. going to go and attack this boss. I did get hit. I killed him, got the 10 XP, and we are good. Right, so um, there is one more thing I'd like to adjust. It's something I should have done before, but on the mover script, we inherit from mover most of the time. Um, this one has protected float for the speed. I'd like to make those public because the boss I thought was running at me quite fast and that was kind of annoying. So we'll go ahead and modify that directly on him now that our speed floats are public. So where are the speed? Um, he moves at 1. Let's make him move at 0 0.5 and we'll also divide that by 2 for the Y. And just like this, the boss should have an harder time catching up to us. Okay, so this is actually a lot better. It gives me some room to actually hit him and uh, run away if I need to. So I'll be ending this lesson right here. In the next lesson, we are going to do something about the whole player death. Right now, it's quite easy. We can just one-shot everything. Uh, but if our player dies, we need something to happen. We need to have some kind of menu pop down and some kind of restart or you know, wipe your save. All right, guys, I will see you in the next lesson. Welcome back to what should be one of the final lesson for this course guys. We are going to create a death menu for a little character. So when he dies, we're going to have a menu pop in my screen and just say, well, you're dead. Start over again at the main scene. So there's a couple of things I'd like to do with this. First off is we could actually delete the save of our player if he dies and make this game kind of hardcore, which I think would be fun. Well, not really fun. It would be like a dick move to do, but hey. That sounds like an interesting thing to do. And also we gotta fit we actually gotta fix the size of this thing. Um on the boss we're going to swap the actual sprite. So let's go and do that really quickly. Make sure we go on the sprite render and flip it on the x-axis. So when it looks at us now and it runs towards us, it's gonna be fixed. Okay. That out of the way, we are going to create a dev menu. And I'll be putting that under um I think I'll be putting it under HUD. This way we don't destroy it, just like we don't destroy anything beneath that. Right, so we're going to go ahead and create a new... Oops. Right click on the HUD, we're going to create a new panel. And in that panel, we can call that Def Menu. Center it. Uh, say the size could be 300 by 75, something really small. Actually, a little bit bigger than that, so we can actually read and put text on there. So 400 by 150 would be great. And on here, I'll be making full alpha background like this. And we will be typing in, you are dead. Change the font. Put that in a red, really aggressive color. And make that bigger. So I'll just make sure to stretch this container in all axis. And here we go. So some kind of uh, menu like this that says you are dead. And we are going to put a button 
that moves on back to the main scene. So new UI, button, and we'll just put that right below. I'll call this button to main scene. And on the text on top of it, it's going to be something like wristbound. Change the font. Maybe make it white. And we're going to change the button color as well. So of course you just put that on whatever you feel like putting it. Like It's all a matter of uh, making your UI look good in the end. I'm just being really, really fast because I know you'll be having a different type of UI. Mine's going to look something like this. I will also scale down from my original size I put. So maybe 300 is fine by 125. Okay, so we have everything we need at this point. We're just going to need to scroll this thing in when it does happen. Oh, and also something really quickly we'd have to do is to make sure we don't really see the background so much, or at least we have something that covers the background, even though it has no alpha, it has no color, uh, just so we can't click on the menu and we don't have this kind of setting going on right now. So my def menu is actually going to become a def window kind of deal. And I'll create something else on top of that. So a UI panel again. That's going to take the whole screen and that's going to be the dev menu. And I'll put the dev window beneath it. This way we can have some kind of background. Maybe put that one black as well. With more alpha. So maybe 200 in alpha. Something really, really dark. Okay. So we have something like this for the dev menu. And we will be creating a animator on top of that. So animator. Let's go ahead and right click on our artwork, animation, create a new animator controller, def menu. Can't seem to type menu properly for some reason. Uh, let's go ahead and drag and drop this thing on our def menu. We're going to open it up and start creating some new animations. So pull down your animation window as well. I'll put it here. And we'll have to animate this thing. So click on Def Menu. We are going to create our very first animation, which is going to be hidden. So Def Menu. Or actually, let's do Shown because it's already here. So Showing. And what we're going to be doing in here is we're going to first, before we do anything else, add a canvas group to our Def Menu. This is going to allow us to control the interactable and also the block raycast. When it's showing, we want the interactable to be on. So notice that I just click on the record button. I'm going to make sure this is 100% alpha, it is interactable, and it blocks raycast. What else could be done? So uh, do we want to do the exact same thing as we did for the menu? We could do that. So we could say the def window starts say right about here so 400 in y and when we do the showing actually the showing would be zero and when we do the hidden it would be at 400 in y um i think that's actually all we have to do in showing so let's turn that off create a new animation call it def menu hiding and this one is totally the opposite, so we'll want to go in here, make sure the canvas group is on 0 and alpha, interactable is false, block raycast is also false, and we're going to go on the def window, put that at 400. We don't see it right now, but the window is going to scroll down to the center while the alpha is going up. Alright, so that would be pretty much done for the animation, now we'll have to do the animator. We have it open right here, then we are going to create some new parameter. Two triggers, one called show and one called hide. By default, we want it to be hiding, so I'll right click, set as default layer, and then I'll like create a transition just to showing. We don't even have to create one back because if the menu shows, then you're dead and you have to click on that button. The condition to go there is going to be, of course, shown. And uh, by saying that, I just realized that we don't actually need the hide parameter, but we'll just keep it in case we want to do something fancy in the future. Something like instead of respawning there, we could do, well, watch this ad and we're going to give you 5 HP. So you can go back in the game and hopefully don't die again. That is one way that people use to monetize their mobile game, uh, but it also can happen on PC as well. Okay, so hiding, 
goes there, the transition is show, and then it's going to show. Okay. So we're going to try this in the game. We're going to need some triggers though first. So when once we die, we need a reference to death menu and then do death menu dot animator and uh, set trigger show. So we're going to go ahead and um, under game manager, we're going to create a reference to the death menu. Actually, a reference to the animator could be worthwhile as well. So def menu animator. And all we'll have to do is when the player dies, so if we go under player.cs, we're going to have the override for def somewhere. Oh, actually, we don't. So let's go ahead and override it. Protected override def. And once we die, we're going to say game manager instance def menu dot set trigger and we're going to set the trigger called show now there's one more thing we want to do in here and it's the fact that we don't want the player to move if he's dead so we're actually going to block the update motor if he is dead which means we're going to require a boolean saying is live and that's going to be true at the beginning and if we do die is live is going to be equal to false and we can go in the fix update and say if we are alive then you can update the motor else you can't okay now um, this should technically work by itself right now soon as we put the reference of the dev menu so let's go ahead and grab the dev menu put it in here and give this a try game starts we didn't see it that's pretty good now it's going to take a little while before I die because I have a lot of HP, 15 HP. So let's go here, get hit by the boss a couple of times, try to get hit by these. Yep, that was the one, so I got hit by the small one. And I'm pretty much dead. Now the only problem is that I also get those, these amount of text uh, popping on my screen, so we'll also do something about that. The menu is here. We can't click anywhere else, which is what we wanted, other than respawn, which of course does nothing at the moment. Okay. Well, let's actually fix that very, very small bug. Uh, we're going to override, actually it's already overridden, but we're going to do something here on receive damage. We're going to say, if is not alive, simply do a return. This way we won't have the text pop up on our screen. Next up is going to be the respawn. That is going to be under the game manager and we'll call the function respawn. So, Def menu and respawn. Public void respawn. Oh, and now something I realized in the respawn function, since we're never deleting our menu, it's still going to be showing you're dead. So we're going to have to go in the def menu and make sure uh, we do have that transition in between hiding and um, hiding and showing. So make sure you have a transition from showing to hiding that has the condition hide. This is only because we're now deleting the menu and we need it to mo move away uh, once we respawn. So when we respawn, start by setting the trigger for the death menu to hide. And then we will load up the scene. So Unity Engine, Scene Management, Scene Manager, Load Scene, and we're going to be loading the main scene. Okay. Now, um, let's actually give this a try. There should be like a couple of bugs still. We're going to find them out as we test this out. And what I just realized right now is that the local scale of this thing gets reset, uh, which is quite annoying. And there's also like a floating weapon. Okay, uh, we'll fix all of these really, really soon, maybe in the next lesson. But let's give this a try. If we respawn, we are back up here. And we're still unable to move, so very important that we tell the player that he, he needs to be able to move again. So under here on respawn, let's create something for the player. Let's say player.respawn. And we'll go under player.cs, make a public function again. So public void respawn. We're starting to get a little bit of stuff in here that's fairly cool. And we will do a heal by max hit points. So we're going to heal our player completely. And then we'll also do... Um, what could we do next? We could do, oh right, we have to set is alive to true. So is alive has to be set to true, else we can't move anymore. So that's going to be something else. 
And one more thing I'd like to do is also set the immune time, uh, last immune, to now. This way, in case you're dying and you press on respawn, um, you're not going to be pushed away as soon as you start the game. Maybe give it an example. I'll give it an example first because I think that bug could have occurred before. I think I saw it briefly, but let's have a look at what happens if we don't put the immune time and we don't end up killing our target. So let's go see the boss. And he kills us like this. And if we press on respawn, yeah, we start and we get pushed. So we have to make sure that uh, we also put the immune time on time that time. This way our player is going to be immune when he presses on the button. He's going to be immune for the same amount of time, so maybe one second which is definitely going to give us enough time to load the new scene. So we're going to try this again with the new code. And like I said, there's a couple of bugs still, uh, especially ordering of the chest, ordering of a couple of things. And okay, so we've been we've been healed fully, we didn't hit damage this time, but we also been pushed, so we have to reset the move vector as well, the push vector. So after the last immune, we're going to say push direction is going to be equal to vector 3.0. And that should be pretty much it for the death menu. It was quite a little, a little bit painful. I'm not gonna lie. Um, this was, this was gonna cause a lot of bug. And that should pretty much be it for the death menu. So let's walk in this fight. Try to die. We are stick to the, to the boss right now. So if he does manage to push us uh, after hitting respawn, we're gonna feel it. Press and respawn. We see the plus seven HP. That's our HP. We get healed. Uh, we could also hide that by simply not. Um, calling the eel function, we can just say, well, your max hit point is equal to, well, your hit point is equal to your max amount of hit point, and then just fill in that bar. But I like to see it, the plus seven means you got revived. I, I kind of like that feeling. So let's go ahead and walk into this. As you could tell, the box size of this thing, not the box size, but the local scale got changed, and that is not cool. There's also another cool little bug that I'd never thought would have happened, but. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have to look into it and that bug is the following so if I just press on pause I go and I open up my player object look at the weapon right now and look at the collider so I'll just put the collider there and as we move away the collider is still here on the right hand side and I kill I can actually kill the boss going back in there um, let's try this again here he's gonna walk right into it and he just ate the damage so it's something we also have to fix here Welcome back to another lesson guys, so we're going to be fixing those little bugs that make our game kind of weird when we play it, such as this weapon we see over here in the, on the right hand side in the scene view. As soon as we're done hitting it, we turn off the box collider, but the box collider still exists, which is, uh, you know, quite, <laughs> quite a problem. So I was thinking about turning it into something else, uh, maybe putting the size down to zero and making it unable to be to being touched instead of putting it down. Um, so I really wonder if that's going to work or not. I don't think it is because we might run into these errors as I just did down there. So there's a couple of solutions. Some of them are quite weird and I don't really want to take those. Um, but what we could do is we could actually take this collider and just put it somewhere else in the map. Like completely give it a weird offset. Um, this is a bug that I did not think would actually happen simply because while well, your collider is off, technically it should not be there anymore as you can see. It's supposed to be toggled off, so why is it following us? Um, so that's something I did not really want to have to deal with, but I guess we are going to create some kind of way that instead of putting it, um, instead of putting the collider offline like we do right now, we are going to take it and actually hide it somewhere really, really far. Like here, we hide it over there on, on this side. So we will be doing that in the animation under the weapon swing. So I'm going to go ahead, open up the animation window and we are going to go here and instead of doing the, con uh, the collider enabled we're going to turn that off completely so delete that completely and we'll just play with the offset of that collider so let's actually anchor this somewhere go under the player see his weapon right now he's at the proper place we're gonna go ahead and start recording put the offset on zero make sure this is recorded also I'll play around with the Y offset as well and here it is now we're going to keep that all the way till the end and just before just before the actual end we're going to be setting a keyframe um, again by clicking on this button at the top add a keyframe and this is going to add a keyframe for everything so the offset x and y as well that's fine um actually if you want to be clean we can delete the one for position 
And then just after, on the last frame, I'll be taking these and just putting somewhere crazy. So maybe 300 in Y. And that's a lot. 300 in our scaling system is actually quite a lot. Actually, I don't even, I don't even know if I can see it. But it is quite far away because if you just put it up by 1, you see that it goes up that much. So let's go ahead and do 300. We should not have a level that is bigger than that. And then once we replay this animation, it's going to go back to 0. Because the beginning frame is 0, so technically you're never going to see that again. Okay, so let's play this, give it a look. And I think that's going to work out just fine. Um, let's go ahead and do that in idle as well. In idle, we're going to make sure we disabled this last one, this last uh, property in our timeline. And that one was just to turn off the collider. So we're going to remove that and instead we're going to say, well, let's put the Y axis of this offset on 300. I actually don't want to mess around with X. X is fine the way it is. We can leave it on zero. And just like this, we should have fixed our very first bug. Now I know this is not the best way to do it, but I really was not expecting to have such bug um, happen to us. So let's go ahead and see where is our collider. If you have a look down here, you can see it. I have a look right now in the, in the scene view. You're gonna be able to see the collider and it just disappear after and it doesn't stick where we were. So that's fairly cool. So as you can see, the collider does not stick here after. If we just move around, you're going to see collider moves away completely off screen. We don't see it anymore. Okay, so that should be fixing our very first bug. The, uh, the second bug is going to be the fact that this boss over here, we're going to have a look at the boss from the scene view. And when he starts chasing us, he's going to shrink down in size. And that is because we modify his local size. So we don't want that to happen. I'm going to try and reproduce the bug. There we go, that's fixed. Um, but yeah, we have to do something about this little guy that actually changed size. And that's something that could have happened to everybody. Because the way our code is made, if we go over to the mover.cs, you're going to be seeing that no matter what happens, you're going to be put back on this vector. And that's not something we'd like. So what we'll do instead is we're going to create a private, um, private vector 3. We can make it protected if you wish. This one doesn't need to go anywhere, so I'll just do a private vector 3 call it original size and in the start I'll say original size is equal to transform local scale. Now what I'll be doing is the following so on the swap sprite direction I'll be saying if we go towards the right hand side we'll say original size and if we go towards the left we'll say new vector and we'll do original size dot x times minus one and then original size dot y and original size dot z. So we can keep that for every single axis. This way that bug should also be fixed. Again, let's give it a try. I missed my old weapon and this one should not shrink. As you can see, it keeps the full size and it just walks to us really menacing. And I actually have a hard time winning this thing. Actually, I've been I've been pushed back into the main scene. Okay, so we have to defeat this little boy first. Let's go ahead and kill him. Also very tough. Good thing we leveled up. We have more. Do we have more damage now? Um, no, we don't have more damage. We just have more health. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do a little bit of a trick. We're going to go down, grab this, level our weapon. Then we're going to have more damage to defeat this boss. Oh. I am being murdered right now. There we go. Grand victory. We're going to go heal ourselves. And is there any more bug? Yeah, there is one more bug that is really annoying. It's the fact that you actually are behind the chest when you try to loot. Uh, so that's definitely just an order problem. So those chests, we can just put them on a higher layer. Um, so let's go ahead and have a look at what kind of layer we can put them on. So we're going to put a chest into the main scene, put that over our player, um, and actually just change that, like change the, the uh, sorting layer. We know that actor goes over most of these things, so let's go ahead and just add a sorting layer, change the actor, put it down there so it goes above the wall, and the interactable stuff, I think the actor has to be on top of that as well. Um, making our interactable object beneath the player. 
So just by doing this, I think we'll be good to go. Other than that, we should be pretty much ready to go to create a build and actually try this as a standalone. There is one more thing though I'd like to do. Uh, go back on the dev menu real quick and turn off the has exit time. I forgot to do that. I realized that last time I died, it took like 0.1 second to get me my menu, which is a very, very small thing, but it kind of annoyed me. So I changed that. And let's go ahead, go under file, build settings, uh, build for a PC in my case. We'll be adding the dungeon scene. I don't know why it's not there anymore. Let's put that in here. And go ahead, build and run this thing on my computer as a real.exe. Hopefully everything should be the same exact thing as we've been experimenting through the engine. And here it is, it asks us for screen resolution. We know that our game is made for 800 by 600. Uh, I'm not going to put it in full screen because it's just going to look awful. <laughs> but we can put the graphic top, hit play. We have our game, our standalone game. And we can just move around. This guy tells us, hey, welcome to the course, hit the boxes. I'm not going to hit the boxes. And we just play our game the same exact way as we were playing it in the editor all that time. A couple of tweaks could be done. We can add some multiple enemies. Uh, we can tweak the speed of that one. That one's really, really aggressive. And change the XP. It gives out 10 XP right now, which is too much. But you get the point. This is the same exact game. We play it inside of a real.exe, so if you ever want to send this over to your friend, it is quite simple. All you have to do is go over to where you built it. In my case, I built it directly in, in this, in my um, project folder. Go ahead and take these two files, send that over to your friend, and he should be able to play your game. And guys, that is how we created this whole top-down game. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot of things. And I hope to see your game in the community chat. You're also free to ask us questions at any time of the day. Thank you so much for following this course, guys. I will be seeing you on Udemy, on Discord, or really anywhere where we pretty much um, play around. We make games all day. I'll be seeing you guys there. Make sure you ask some questions. Make sure you interact. Show us your game. We'd really like to see what you've made. And if you've made a custom atlas, that'd be even better. And uh, we're eager to see that. So... Thank you very much for watching this again and I will be catching you in the next course.